Here's Tobo. Can you all remain standing for a moment of silent prayer and meditation? Thank you. We may all be seated. Good morning, colleagues. Um, can I take this opportunity to welcome um, our Honorable Premier, members of the Executive Council, leaders of political parties, ladies and gentlemen, the people of Gauteng, thank you very much. We have received the following apologies Honorable Maile, who is joining the Deputy President um, to Sidibeng. Uh, Honorable Shitangano, who can't make it for this meeting as he is attending, as he is attending um, the party workshop. Those are the only two apologies that have been received. Thank you very much. Honorable colleagues, I wish to remind you that uh, today is the deadline for the submission of the Declaration of Interest. I hope all members have either submitted or they will submit before the end of business today. But I also want to remind members that uh, in terms of the rules of the Gauteng Provincial Legislature, we do have a code of conduct but also the dress code. I want to remind you, it doesn't necessarily mean that if we're on virtual platforms, we must dress source on well. We should ensure that you don't wear takis, especially those that come in the house, because uh, if I see you wearing long, wrong um, uh, clothing, I will take you to task. Thank you very much. That's, that's the reminder because I know that members were used to virtual meetings sitting at home and at times we will not even see them, what they are wearing. But it's important that you must actually stress on that particular matter. Thank you very much. Is there a member who wants to do an announcement?
there's no, there's none. If you mention wrong things, I will eject you from the house. <laughs> In terms of Rule 79, subsection 1, emissary statements, there is none. In terms of Rule 81, subsection 1, in terms of member statements, Honorable Shiman. Uh, Madam Speaker, Sunday, the 21st of March, 2021, marks exactly 61 years since the Sharpeville massacre, an injustice that claimed the lives of 69 people and left 180 injured. Human Rights Day is a reminder that our freedom didn't come cheaply. Ours is a freedom that was paid for dearly with lives, the blood and sweat of the heroes and heroines of our liberation struggle. We today enjoy human rights because many before us sacrificed their lives. We as a country have made significant strides in ensuring that all South Africans have access to basic human rights as enshrined in our constitution. However, we cannot deny that despite our strides, more still needs to be done. Our people are currently ravaged by social ills and the triple crisis of unemployment, poverty and inequality. We equally cannot deny that the wounds of the past have not healed and we acknowledge that they cannot and will not heal until all the people of this country share equally in the country's wealth as envisaged by the Freedom Charter. Madam Speaker, it is not yet Uhuru. We are still ravaged, ravaged by the systems of colonialism. A paper published by the Southern Center for Equality, Inequality Studies in April 2020 painted a sad picture of our reality. The paper indicated that the wealthiest 3,500 people own more than the most impoverished 32 million people of this country. The ANC government has made economic reconstruction and recovery one of its priorities for 2021. We believe that the rebuilding of the economy will go a long way in addressing many of our challenges. I thank you. Thank you. That concludes member statement. Motion without notice in terms of Rule 121, read together with Rule 122. Honorable Kumalo. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, the country was fixed on Sunday. There's the uh, love and peace in our country. I, member M. Kumalo, Chief Whip, have I tabled the following motion in terms of Rule 121 read together with Rule 117 as follows. Noting that Petitions Committee's third quarterly report for 2020-2021 financial year and Infrastructure Development Committee's focus intervention studies report on provincial infrastructure and municipal services for enhanced project management 2018-2019 was not programmed for today's sitting of Tuesday 23rd March 2021. And further noting that the consideration of the Houting Third Adjustment Appropriation Bill, G002-2021, was not programmed for the sitting of Friday, 26 March 2021. Therefore, request the House resolve to add the Petitions Committee's Third Quarterly Report for 2021 financial year to the sitting of Tuesday, 23rd of March 2021. The Infrastructure Development Committee Focus Intervention Study Report on Provincial Infrastructure Development and Municipal Services for Enhanced Project 2028-2029 is not programmed for today's sitting of Tuesday. It's not, uh, it's not programmed for today's sitting of Tuesday, 23rd March, 2021, and the consideration of Houting 23rd Adjustment Appropriation Bill G20, G002-2021 to the sitting of Friday, 26 March, 2021. Uh, I hereby move. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Any second to the motion? I second the motion, yeah, Madam Speaker. Speaker. Thank yeah, you. I, second. I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those not in favor say no. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Of it. Uh, the motion is adopted by the House. In terms of Rule 134, we're going to deal with questions for oral reply to the executive, starting with um, 
Honorable Shackleton to MSC for Community Safety. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to the Honourable MEC for Community Safety. Eight out of the ten police stations in South Africa experiencing the highest cases of truck hijackings are in Gauteng. The third quarter crime stats released by the police minister on 19 February 2021 shows that truck hijackings have increased by 31.8% in Gauteng. Considering this, will the MEC please indicate one, at what stage are the negotiations to make the Gauteng Traffic Police a 24-hour service? Two, what accounts for delays in this matter? Three, by when, and can she please provide a date, will the Gauteng Traffic Police become a 24-hour service? Four, if it will not become a 24-hour service, why not? And further to number four, what will be done? to ensure that a similar service is instituted. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable MEC. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, in response to question from Honourable Member uh, Shackleton, uh, the the question, in actual fact, has to do with all the law enforcement officers, uh, Madam Speaker. It has got nothing to do with Houghton traffic solely. So I requ request the member to rewrite the question so that they are able to answer to him holistically on the work that is being done to deal with truck hijacking. Thank you very much. Honorable Shackleton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I know that we can't instruct the Honourable MEC as to how to respond to the question, but I think everyone in the House can clearly see we're asking about the Gauteng Traffic Police specifically. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Are you fine, Honourable Mazbuga? Thank you. Next question, Honourable Mukwebo to MEC for Health. Madam Speaker, I will take the question on behalf of Honorable Mukwebo, who is not here today with us. But Honorable Mukwebo is the whip, is the one that's, that is supposed to tell me who is supposed to answer the question, to ask the question. Well, but I was continue. under the impression that uh, as a party leader, he has sent you an email because he has instructed me. Yeah, but you must check also if that has been sent. Continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable <coughs> Speaker. To the MEC of, for Health, uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on human resources in health since the first positive case in the Republic has been enormous. As on, uh, as on 31st October 2020, there were 35 confirmed cases of health, health care work, 35,145 confirmed cases of health workers in the public sector, of which 24% were accounted for in Gauteng. During this time, 39 public sector health workers died in hospital. Of this, 15 of this, 15 percent were, were from Gauteng. As the EFF, we have noted that the department's strategy to protect the health and safety of health workers in the face of the pandemic is dismally lacking. With this in mind, will the MEC respond to the following? With regards to human resources for health being a critical pillar of the Presidential Health Compact, number one. What impact has the COVID-19 pandemic had on the human resources in health since the first positive case was reported in the province in March 2020? Number two, please give us a total number of doctors, nurses, community healthcare workers, and other healthcare professionals, and foreign national healthcare professionals that have been employed since then. Number three, what number of the specified healthcare personnel will be retained post the COVID-19 pandemic? Honorable MC. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Speaker, and thank you, Honorable Marbala, on behalf of uh, uh, Honorable Mukwebo for the questions. Response to question one, there are 1,000 
173. Continue. Okay. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. There are 1,100. Um, no, 11,873 Gauteng Department of Health employees that were infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. There are 101 employees who succumbed to COVID-19 as at 11th of March 2021. Those who were admitted to hospitals, uh, to different hospitals were 1,702. Of those, 1,537 discharged and 19 were transferred to other hospitals or other facilities for special, specialized treatment. Employees who were infected were originally given 14 days uh, leave for isolation. This was later reduced to 10 days, 10-day um, de-isolation after the policy change uh, determined by National Department of Health. Response to question two, the total number of healthcare workers are listed below, um, Honorable Mabala, after you've received the question, the, the response you'll see. Uh, there are 4,219, and the foreign nationals are 45, and then no community healthcare workers were appointed for this period. And then there's also a breakdown, Honorable Speaker, on the, on, on the nationality description. Uh, Cameroon, we have one. Cuba, we have 25. Eritrea, we have one. Lesotho, we have two. Malawi, we have one. Namibia, we have two. Nigeria, we have two. Pakistan, we have one. Uh, Republic of Congo, seven. Uh, South Africans, 4,174. Tunisia, one. Zimbabwe, two. Uh, Honorable Speaker, there's a whole list of categories of um, uh, these health care professionals that are listed. I will not be able to go through them. It's 4,219. Uh, 4, a uh, response to question three, um, staff are currently temporarily employed, appointed on fixed term contract, which has been extended until March 2022. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Uh, Honorable Mabala. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable MC. I didn't hear you uh, answering the first question. What impact has the COVID-19 had on the HR in health? Healthcare since the pandemic started, didn't respond to that. And also, I would like, I would appreciate if you can uh, give me copies of the responses because I would like to have a look at the breakdown. Thank you. Honorable Missy. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I think I did indicate that the impact is the number of employees that were that were infected uh, during the period from last year March uh, to. Uh, uh, February 2021. Thank you very much. Next question, uh, Honorable Bloom to MEC for Health. Honorable Bloom. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. Regarding the Bronco Strait Hospital, will the MEC please indicate, one, what was the assessed need for extra beds at this hospital? Two, what intervention was made by the provincial government to stop the disruption that, that, that delayed this project, including the alleged involvement of a local councillor? Three, how many new beds have been completed and are fully equipped for patients in this hospital? Four, how many new staff have been recruited to ensure these beds can be fully used? And five, why was BMW not directed to build extra beds at a more central hospital in Chwani to assist with COVID-19 cases? Thank you. Honourable MEC. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, and thank you very much, Honourable Bloom, for the question. Response to question one on the assessed needs. The 50-bedded Bronco Spray District Hospital serves the community in the broader Bronco Spray than Kalinen as well as the surrounding farming community and villages. This is a catchment population of 229,000. This population is expected to grow with increased coal mining activities in the area, the nature of mining activities and related possible accidents, as well as the Bronco Spray is on the major route linking Pumalanga and Gauteng, namely 
R25, N4, and N12 warrants that availability of appropriate number of accident and emergency services are in the area. The alternative could be Mamilodi Hospital, which is about 50 kilometers away. Uh, the increase in the number of beds with the additional 150 donated by BMW in the area will provide relief for Mamilodi Regional Hospital uh, services by reducing their workload as the demand for services may be decreased and limit the need for community in the area to travel long distances at high cost to access hospital services and for families and relatives to visit their loved ones admitted in hospital. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, the need for additional beds within the Swani district became more apparent to accommodate both people under investigation and quarantine. Respond to question two, engagement with, this, with all the stakeholders involved in the dispute was successful, where more stringent safety and security measures were enforced through the involvement of the Office of the Premier, the legal department there, subs, public order, Response to question three, the proposed date of completion of the new structure is around the 27th of March 2021. That is the 150 bedded fully finished additional structure. Response to question four, 68 additional staff members have been appointed, 53 clinical staff and 15 support staff. Response to question five, the, bed, the, the needs at Broncos Bridge as outlined in the first question, are meant to address health services for COVID-19 and beyond. There is currently no need um, for additional hospital beds in the city of Swan Center. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Bloom. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I think the problem with this is that these beds were actually supposed to be completed in the middle of December. And, and then they could have been used uh, for the, the, what, uh, the, the infection surge that hit the city of Chwani in uh, December and January. And uh, I think they're also quite frankly in the wrong place. So I really think the greater need is at uh, Namalodi Hospital. And we saw this problem with Steve Biko Hospital. Steve Biko had to have tents in the parking lot. Uh, and, and meanwhile, they, they're still building beds at, uh, at Broncos Sprite Hospital, uh, at uh, Jubilee Hospital, I, I think that uh, it wasn't a rational assessment of, of where these beds would be, but still this is welcome uh, that finally this is going to be built. I will note that in, Ma in January they were saying that it was going to be built at the end of, Mar at end of January, so it's really uh, four months overdue, uh, but uh, I hope it opens fully staffed and can see staff in that area, but it's another example of a, of a delayed project that should have been available for when it was really needed with the epidemic. Thank you. Thank you. Honourable MC. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. I think um, as a department, we are still standing on our assessment, uh, Honourable Blue. We still feel that uh, it was important for us to have uh, that um, 150 bedded at Broncos Street. Uh, thank you very much. The other issues that he raised, uh, the honorable member have raised were noted. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, Honorable Bloom to MEC for Health. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Regarding acting positions in the department, will the MEC please indicate, one, how many acting positions are there currently, two, what are the current acting positions at the head office? Three, what steps have been taken to appoint a new head of department? Four, what steps have been taken to appoint a new chief financial officer? And five, what accounts for any delay in filling these posts? Thank you. Honorable Lemusi. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. And thank you very much, Honorable Bloom, for the questions. Response to question one, according to the PERSA, as at 28 February 2021, there are 29 acting positions in the department. Response to question two, based on the personal information as at 28 uh, February 2021, the following posi positions are filled uh, in an acting position. Uh, the HOD, Chief Financial Officer, Deputy Director General, HRM and OD, Director Leadership Management and Skills Development, Director Employee Wellness Program, Director Labor Relations Management, Director Health Information Management and Technology, 
middle manager finance, chief environmental health practitioner grade two, environmental health practitioner grade two, middle manager human resources, human resource clerk, director human uh, resource administration. Response to question two, a draft advertisement for the position of the HOD has been submitted to the office of the premier for advertisement of the position. The office of the premier did advertise the position and the closing date is the 5th of April uh, 2021. With regard to the steps that have been taken with regard to the new uh, appointment of the, the chief financial officer, the position has been advertised and interviews were conducted on the 15th of April 2021. An appointment recommendation has been submitted for approval. Response to question four, the delay in the filling of these polls have been addressed. The department has a defined plan to fill all SMS posts. Progress against the said plan is being monitored at the accounting and executive authority level. Focus will be placed in the upcoming financial year on the filling of the other post uh, levels. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Bloom, supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. Yeah, uh, I think we all know the problem with, with acting uh, posts. Uh, if I heard correctly, there are 29, and they're absolutely key posts. There's the head of department, the CFO, and various other positions. I, I hope that this is used as an opportunity to put really, really competent people there, ethical people, because this department really needs to be turned around. But clearly, you can't do much if so many senior positions are in an acting position. Um, I'm disappointed it's taken so long to fill the head of department and the CFO position. That's really critical, but I see that there's progress. And, and once again, can we really this time put honest, ethical, competent people, not the sort of people who have to be fired later because there's a scandal? Thank you. Honorable Mabala. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm raising on 134 subsection 7. Um, I don't know whether the NEC would like to take a question. Honourable NEC, there's a question. It's a supplementary question. Okay. Sure. Uh, NEC, I, I, I think this thing of 18 positions, senior positions, we've raised it a, whole, a lot of times in the Health Portfolio Committee, and we also raised our concerns in the OCPOL Committee, because I also sit in the OCPOL Committee, and the Premier promised that these po senior positions will be filled. And I'm so disappointed to hear that, uh, to hear the NEC saying that these are acting, you know, people are acting, acting. It cannot, it's, it's, it's actually unacceptable. But my question would be, with regards to uh, the senior positions, because uh, we have to learn from the past, if I will remember correctly, that the CFO position, apparently the previous C CFO was appointed uh, and the proper procedures were not followed. So what, will, what is the, the MEC going to, to do to make sure that we, we don't, we're not going to have same problems again where people are going to be appointed and they are not qualified enough for these senior positions? Honorable MEC. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Uh, Honorable Bloom, um, your concerns are noted, and uh, we, we are committing that we'll be filling all these positions because I said we have a plan, and we are monitoring that plan. And we know that uh, starting from uh, April, we'll be seeing all those vacant uh, positions being advertised. And with regard to Honorable Member Mabala, I'm not too sure because we are following the recruitment uh, uh, policy of the department. The position was advertised, interviews were done, and we are currently, that is why it took so long, because we're currently verifying the, the incumbent uh, uh, qualifications and also going through the process of um, screening by SAPS and uh, vetting process. So I, I'm not too sure uh, uh, whether uh, that is not sufficient to, to can get a, a qualified candidate. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. 
Next question, Honorable Shackleton to MSC for Community Safety. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to the Honorable MEC for Community Safety. Regarding the backlog of DNA and ballistic reports, could the MEC please indicate, one, what is the current backlog of DNA and ballistic reports? Please give separately. Two, what accounts for the backlogs in number one? Three, how many cases are held up because of the backlog in one? Four, how many cases have fell off court rolls in the past five years due to number one, and five, by when will the backlog in number one be cleared? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable MSC. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question. In response to question number one on a backlog on DNA and ballistic reports, on DNA, the backlog is 113,285, on ballistic is 9,757. What accounts for the backlog on DNA is the shortage of consumables, as well as lack of service maintenance and repair of equipment on ballistics. The COVID-19 actually led to reduction in staffing by 50%. Six provinces are being serviced by one laboratory. As a result, so that is why there was a backlog. On question number three, uh, the backlog is the very same number as I mentioned in number one. On question number four, how many cases fell off the court roll? I will request the member to kindly redirect the question to the National Prosecuting Authority. On question number five, uh, on, uh, by when will the backlog be cleared? On DNA, the action plan is in place. On ballistic, the Forensic Science Laboratory is preparing a document to allow personnel to perform duties on a shift basis in order to clear the backlog. By Rangi. Uh, Honorable Shackleton. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Speaker, and through you to the MEC for Community Safety. It's not clear to anyone on this side by when will the backlog be cleared. If we can get that information, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable MEC. <laughs> Next question, uh, Honourable Shirota to MEC for COCTA and Human Settlement. The question will be responded to by Honourable Mutara. Thank you, Speaker. The question is as follows. Regarding the city being municipality, will the MEC please indicate one, is it the intention to appoint Lerato Makola as the new mayor of Sedibeng Municipality? Two, is the intention to ignore the recommendation that the Sedibeng Municipality be placed under administration? Three, is Lerato Makola under investigation for maladministration and tender irregularities? If yes, please indicate what charges she is facing and if there are other matters she is to be investigated for. Four, what progress has been made into the investigations of alleged maladministration in the Lesedi and Sedibeng municipalities. Please answer separately for each. And five, what steps have been taken to restore the breakdown of service delivery in both municipalities? Thank you, Speaker. Honourable Mutara. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker and Honourable Member. Um, the response on behalf of MEC Maile is as follows. On question one, um, the response is that executive mayors are not appointed. They are elected by the Municipal Council, not the MEC responsible for local government. By virtue of the provisions of Section 59 of the Local Government Municipal Structures Act Number 117 of 1998 as amended. Um, the response to question two, is as follows, no, not at all. Um, the Provincial Executive Council, or ESCO, has resolved that the Municipal Council of Sedi Bang District Municipality must provide substantive, substantive representations as to why it should not be placed under administration in terms of Section 139.1b of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, Act Number 108 of 1996, as amended. The Municipal Council has been duly notified of this resolution and were reminded to submit its representations. This approach is in line with the OD Alterum Patum principle, and that's rules of national justice. Once the representations are received, the EXCO will apply its mind properly and make a pronouncement on its decision in due course. 
Um, the response to question three is as follows. Um, there is currently no investigation authorized in terms of section 106, subsection 1B of the Local Government Municipal Systems Act number 32 of 2000 as amended. If, however, allegations of impropriety is leveled against Mayor Maloka and same is brought to my attention, I will, as the MEC responsible for local government in the prov province, deal with the same, in the same manner as I have dealt with all allegations in the past, such as Citibank. Question four's response is as follows. Um, in the question was, what progress has been made into investigations of alleged administration, ad maladministration in the Lesedi and Citibank municipalities? Um, the response is, as I have indicated in the previous um, question, on um, on, on no investigations authorized. Uh, the department has received informal reports that the recommendations are being implemented and that some had already been implemented. I have, however, requested both the speaker and the acting municipal manager to provide me with formal reports on the progress of the implementation of the recommendations. Um, question five responses as follows. Um, uh, speaker, Deputy Speaker, I think um, or the response is as follows. We should be careful in classifying challenges in the provision of service delivery as a breakdown of service delivery. To do so is misleading and certainly not in the interest of the community served by the municipalities. Yes, we appreciate that for various reasons, municipalities are experiencing several challenges in the provision of efficient and effective basic services. As the provincial government, we are attending to these issues in collaboration with the municipalities in question, and more importantly, in accordance with the provision of Section 154 of the Constitution, which amongst others enjoins the provincial government to support municipalities. We will not abdicate this constitutional responsibility. I thank you. Any supplementary questions or short remark? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaker, it's, co it's common cause and very clear that the irregularities both in the city and city Bend. This is clearly a whitewash and is consistent with the failure to carry out the undertakings by this administration. Corruption is continuing, maladministration is continuing, and this administration looks the other way. These, are to these answers are totally inappropriate and do not answer the questions. It's merely a deflection and it's very sad because it's the residents that suffer. Thank you. Any comments, Honourable MEC? Thank you, Speaker. I note the comments. Okay. Can we therefore request the Secretary to read the first order? Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The first order of the day is Cooperative Governance, Traditional Affairs and Human Settlement Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the third quarterly report of the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs for 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you. Honorable Diale. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. On behalf of the Portfolio Committee on Cooperative Governance, Traditional Affairs and Human Settlement uh, members, namely Member Greg Schneeman, Member Paul Malema, Member Busisiwe Mwube, Member Solim Simang, Member M. Sirota, Member Boginko Sidlamini, Member Komoto Tong, Member Lidwaba, Member Amanda Dilange, Member Dalton Adams, I, Honorable Kidiboni Diale, here by table to this House, the third quarterly report of the Gauteng Department of Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs for the financial year 2020-2021. Madam Speaker, I hereby request the House to allow me not to read some parts of the report and consider them as read. The, the Portfolio Committee has, uh, in its assessment of the third quarterly report of the Gauteng Department of Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs, for the year 2020-2021, for the year um, acknowledge that uh, the following. On budget expenditure, the department indicated that the, the expenditure is at 58%, which is 110 plus million against the allocated budget of 144 plus million during the third quarter. 
The department managed to pay 100% of invoices received within the stipulated 15 days for the third quarter. Some of the companies were paid in 10 days for the services provided um, to the department. The department also highlighted to the portfolio committee that Lesedi municipality is still struggling to ensure functionality according to back to basics pillars due to failure of CAPEX expenditure and huge vacancy rate for senior management positions, which um, we've deliberated on it in our concerns. It was also reported that the department has a vacancy rate of 60 positions and on GOD, the department indicated that it recruited 15 women and nine males on expanded public works. A total of 22 were considered amongst the youth um, and this is as same as the previous quarter. In terms of risk assessment, the department only managed to do disaster risk assessment in one municipality and that is city of Swan. Our committee concerns are the following. On stakeholder license sub-program sub implemented by the department, the department could not carry out the two outstanding voter education that were planned uh, on the basis that the service level agreement uh, got delayed. On municipal finance support sub-program, the department only achieved to deploy revenue expert to develop an integrated revenue enhancement and data management strategy in Mfuleni and Mirafo municipality. On IDP coordination sub-program, the, de the department did not achieve their planned targets to conduct five municipal visits to give ID compliance feedback as contained in the I IDP MEC commenting letters for the quarter under review. On energy sub-program, the department reported that a total number of 2,985 indigent households were provided with access to basic electric services against the target of 2,000. However, the department did not mention the names of the municipalities and the wards they serviced. On payments, the portfolio committee noted with serious concern the underspending incurred under three programs, that is local governance, um, only 73% was spent against the allocated budget. Develop, development and planning, 62% was spent against the budget. And traditional institutional development budget, an amount of 6 million, 1.6 uh, was spent and against the, the, the total allocated amount. On payments per program, the department's vacancy rate that co caused a huge underspending, especially in appointing of um, SMS positions. Um, our recommendation as a committee, uh, we recommend that the department should respond to this recommendation by the 31st of April 2021. The portfolio committee advises the department to ensure the fast tracking of voter education campaigns in order to complete the planned 30 of those initiatives noting that local government elections are approaching. The portfolio committee also urges the department to employ revenue experts to develop an integrated revenue enhancement and data management strategy in Lisedi. The, the deployment of revenue expert is good for municipalities in terms of revenue collection, cash flow, good accounting practices and financial management. The department should ensure that the MEC's letters are finalized on time in order for the department to conduct the visit to municipalities to give ID compliance feedback. In order to strengthen the oversight responsibility of the portfolio committee, the department should provide the names of the municipalities as well as wards where a total number of the indigent households were provided with access to basic uh, electricity services. The department should provide the portfolio committee with a detailed report outlining stringent measures that will be put in place to cap the recurrence of underspending of the allocated funds. The department should fill up the vacancy positions in the department, especially on S SMS, and ensure uh, implementation of Employment Equity Act. Madam Speaker, I hereby would like to acknowledge and wish to thank Honorable Maile, the MEC of COCTA, 
as well as the HOG, uh, Mr. Tilesha, together with their team from the Houghton Corporate of Governance and Traditional Affairs for their cooperation and participation in the portfolio a committee activities. I further wish to acknowledge members, as mentioned earlier, and the committee support team. In accordance with Rule 117, subsection 2C, read together with Rule 164 of the Standing Rules of the GPL, the Portfolio Committee on Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs hereby tables its oversight report for 2020-2021 financial year on the third quarterly report of the Department of Culture <coughs> for, adopt, for adoption by the House considering the concerns and proposed recommendations made in this report. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Any seconder to the report? Member Adams, second. 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 Honorable Adams, uh, seconded. I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those not in favor say no. Yes. yes. The yes have it. The report is adopted by the House. Can we have the next order? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The second order of the day is Cooperative Governance, Traditional Affairs and Human Settlement Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the third quarterly report of the Department of Human Settlement for 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you. Honorable Diale. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, like I mentioned earlier and have named the members of the Portfolio Committee that I'm presenting this report on behalf of, I, Honorable Kitiboni Diale, here by tables the third quarterly performance report for financial year 2020-2021 of the Human Settlement Department in Gauteng. Member, Madam Speaker, I also request the House to allow me not to read some parts of the report and consider them as read. The, for, for the Portfolio Committee assessed the Department's progress for 2020-2021 financial year as reported in this um, third quarterly report on the utilization of vote eight allocation. Through this report, there was a determination and assessment of the department's performance against the priorities identified in both the state of the nation address and the state of the province. Okay. The state of the nation address and the state of the province address as it relates to the provision of human settlement. In this regard, the report focused on the department's response to the newly adopted 10-pillar program of radical transformation, modernization, the committee's oversight accountability framework provided the guideline for this report, especially in relation to the format. The department received five plus billion and spent 3.490 billion of its allocation in the quarter under review. As per, as per the pu Public Finance Management Act guidelines, the department was supposed to have spent 75% of its annual allocation in the third quarter. This shows an underspending of 10%. A total number of 1.420 million was allocated to the third quarter, and at the end of the quarter under review, the department managed to spend only 1.8, which translates to an overall expenditure of 128%, and the department was supposed to spend 100% by the end of the court. This shows overspending by 28%. The portfolio committee noted the department partially achieved its target on percentage of invoices paid within 30 days of receipt. It is reported that 63% of the invoices received were paid within 30 days of receipt. Out of 18, 893 invoices paid, 561 was paid within 30 days. It is reported that due to the delays in creation of purchase orders, invoices were uploaded before the actual claim received. In addition, the department partially achieved its target on procurement budget that targets local suppliers as 77.79% of the target was achieved out of a budget of uh, three, 354 million plus paid um, as compared to 275 was spent on local suppliers. In terms of percentage of procurement budget that targets businesses owned by women, the department partially achieved its target of 30% and managed to achieve only 
17.6 percent and and yeah with regards to 20 percent of procurement budget that targets businesses owned by youth only 1.49 percent 1.5 percent was paid to businesses owned by youth um, on the percentage of procurement budget that targets businesses owned by people with disabilities only 2.2 percent was achieved against a planned target of five percent Furthermore, the number of approver, approved beneficiaries allocated available housing, the plan target was 2,000 and only 1.324 approved beneficiaries were allocated. The following are the portfolio committee's concerns. The portfolio committee noted that during the quarter under review, the department was allocated 1.4 billion and managed to spend 1.8, which translates to an overall expenditure of 128%. This shows overspending by 28%. In relation to percentage of procurement budget that targets businesses owned by women, youth, and people with disability, this target was not achieved even in the first court. The portfolio committee noted with concern the non-reporting with regards to the following project, Dr. Sutularo, Dr. Matana, Green Hills, and Elijah Bahai, uh, Bulk and Water and Sewer Link and uh, Bulk Electricity. The portfolio committee remained concerned with no clear communication strategy regarding, regarding the rapid land release program. We also are concerned with the slow pace of handing over of title deeds to beneficiaries, and we remain concerned with the money spent on chemical toilets in some of the projects as implemented by the department. In our recommendation, we recommend that the department should provide responses to the portfolio committee by the 30th of April 2021. The department should provide reasons for over expenditure of 28% during the quarter under review. They should put measures in place to prioritize businesses that are owned by women, youth, and people with disability. The department should provide a progress report on the following project, uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, Madam Speaker. The department should submit a communication strategy on rapid land release program, and they should also submit a report indicating how many title deeds were handed over from 2014 to 2020. The department should provide future plans on phasing out chemical toilets as they become very expensive to the pocket of government, Madam Speaker. Um, we also wish to thank the MEC for Human Settlement, Honorable Maile and the head of the department, Ms. Pindile Mbanjwa and their team. I also wish to express my gratitude to the men and women that I served with in the portfolio committee. I also furthermore would like to thank the team from the legislature that is supporting us as, as a portfolio committee. Madam Speaker, in terms of Rule 117, subsection 2C, read with Rule 164, the Portfolio Committee of Human Settlement Portfolio Committee presents the oversight report on the third quarter performance report of the Department of Human Settlement for the financial year 2020-2021 for adoption, taking into the account the recommendations made in this report. I thank you. Any seconder to the report? Madam Seconded. Madam Speaker. Seconded. I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those not in favor say no. Yes. The yes serve it. The report is adopted by the House. Can we have the next order? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The third order of the day is Health Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the third quarterly report of the Department of Health for the year 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you. Honorable De Camilla. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I, the chairperson of the Health Portfolio Committee, Dr. Rebecca Paladi De Camilla, tables the committee oversight report on the Houghton Department of Health third quarter report for 2020 to 2021 financial year as follows. The objective of the third quarter report is to monitor progress in terms of budget appropriation, 
and to identify areas of concern. The total appropriation adjusted budget for the department for the financial year 2020-2021 was 58 billion. By the end of the third quarter, the department spent 43 billion, amounted to 74% of its appropriation budget. The department shows elements of underspending and overspending across its programs in the quarter under review. The committee is concerned with the excessive spending in the current financial year under administration program. The committee is further noting the target performance in the current quarter that has declined from the previous quarter, which was 58.3% to 55%. The, pro the department has eight programs uh, that they are running. Uh, underspending was observed on the following. District health services by 69%, central hospital services by 74%, health sciences and training by 58%, health facility management by 62%. And the uh, overspending was observed on administration at 135 percent, emergency medical services by 82 percent, and provincial hospital services by 76 percent, and health care support services by also by 76 percent. Let me request that um, the House, uh, the parts of the report that will not be read in this House be considered as read. So there are some few challenges, some of the challenges highlighted by the department uh, were considered by the committee, uh, which was the percentage of budget spent on township enterprises against the identified commodities. The primary health care facilities with functional clinic committee was also a concern noted by the department. Maternal mortality in district health facilities TB treatment success rate also. Requests for the intervention were as follows. On ideal hospital status, the department reported that there was no district hospital scheduled for an assessment in the quarter under review. Hence, there was no reporting. The percentage of budget spent on township enterprises against identified commodities, the department attributes the underperformance to the bulk of the budget being allocated to services that most township companies are not rendering, which is medical equipment and consumables. And the immunization coverage for under one year was not achieved. This is due to a low PHC utilization due to COVID-19 pandemic, where there was a lot of lockdown. Otherwise, processes were followed and time frames were adhered to uh, in terms of uh, the report. Achievement of APPs was also uh, noted. The core functions included primary health care services rendered through the district health systems, provision of EMS and planned patient transport, provide training for future health care professions in health sciences faculties, also in nursing colleges. Mm. On program six, the purpose of this program was to develop the department's human resource management of employees, wellness program and address the education, training and developmental needs and priorities of the department. This program is monitored annually and there was no reporting in the quarter under review. However, the committee is of the view that the quarterly reporting should be conducted as spending still occurs within this program. This is in order to monitor if the budget is being uh, utilized optimally. And on program eight, health facilities management, the program was allocated, um, spent at least 62% of the budget. And on the findings, the committee is concerned with non-reporting to some of the targets that were due to, for reporting in the current quarter. 
the percentage of budget spent on township enterprises against identified commodities is also a concern for the committee. The TP treatment success rate was also a finding by the committee and remained a concern. Uh, the committee recommends that the department should provide detailed strategies in addressing all the concerns raised by the 30th of April 2021. A detailed report on the omitted targets that were due to be reported in the quarter under review, detailed plans to workshop and educate township enterprises on more opportunities that are available to them, and a detailed report on plans to address the high rate of death rates due to TB, uh, further impacting on the performance uh, should also be addressed by that period that is mentioned. The chairperson wishes to thank the following. The MEC for Health, Dr. Noma Kemba Mocheti, and her team for the preparation of the third quarter report for 2020-2021 financial year, and the efforts made in taking the committee through the details of the report and responding to questions raised by honorable members of the Committee of Health. It is also highly appreciated the selfless role of the committee members who take time to engage with the report by all the time, and the following are the members, Honorable Lasindwa, Honorable Mabunda, Honorable Bloom, Honorable Fuchs, Honorable Albert, Honorable Ghana, and Honorable Mabala. Uh, I would like also to acknowledge the support staff, the group committee coordinator, Ms. Z. Panchwambalo, Senior researcher, Ms. S. Minueli, researcher, Dr. M. Mukonoto, Senior Committee Coordinator, Nogwa Zingidi, Committee Coordinator, N. August, Committee Administrator, Ms. Dibie, Service Officer, Ms. Isaac Ngobo, Hansard Staff, M. Makwela, Information Officer, M. Sibante, Communication Officer, A. Mukoka, and Public Outreach Officer and Retailers. On adoption, in line with Rule 117, subsection, two sec, subsection C, read together with Rule 164, the Health Portfolio Committee hereby recommends that the report of the Gauteng Department of Health third quarter report for the financial year 2020-21 be adopted by this House, taking into account the Committee's concerns as proposed and recommendation made in this report. I thank you, Honourable Speaker. Any seconder to the report? I rise to second, Madam Speaker. Seconded. I now put a question. All those in favour say yes. 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 All those not in favour say no. The yes of it. The report is adopted by the House. Can we have the next order? Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The fourth order of the day is Social Development Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the third quarterly report of the Department of Social Development for 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you. Honourable Kekana. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And Honourable Speaker and members, I would request that the House uh, should take other parts contained in the report uh, as read. Um, I, Rufilo Kekana, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Social Development, hereby tables the Committee Oversight Report on the Third Quarter Performance Report of the Department of Social Development for the year 2020-21 financial year as follows. On the executive summary, the Department's priorities are guided by a number of strategic imperatives, and that is to embrace the Growing Gauteng Together, Vision 2030, Gauteng City Region, the 10 pillar program of transformation, modernization, and reindustrialization, and the accelerated social transformation strategy, aimed to ultimately cul culminate into the realization of the NDP priorities. In pursuit of realizing its vision of building a caring society, the department continues to provide comprehensive, integrated, sustainable, and quality social development services. The department focuses on strengthening intervention programs, 
strengthening the implementation of varied initiatives that respond to the psychosocial needs of various targeted vulnerable groups and the improvement of governance issues. Most of the services are rendered in partnership with nonprofit organizations and non-governmental organizations funded by the department. The department has five main programs, which are administration, social welfare services, children and families, restorative services and development and research. The department has been allocated an amount of 5,887,349,000 and have spent 1,299,941,000, which represents 65% of the allocated by budget by the end of the quarter under review. On program one, which is administration, the department spent 66% of the allocated budget. Program two, social welfare services, they spent 70%. On program three, children and families, they spent 61%. On program, program four, restorative services, they spent 71%. And on program five, which is development and research, they spend 66% uh, of the allocated budget by the end of the quarter under review. The committee noted that during the period under review, the department has recorded an underspending of 353,113,000 with the bulk of it located within the goods and services as well as the high vacancy rate. The committee acknowledged that 396 cooperatives were awarded with school uniform as well as short-term contracts to render services such as cleaning, laundry services, gardening, and the supply of toilet paper. The committee will continue engaging the department in making sure that these contracts are provided for a longer term and that cooperatives are able to sustain themselves and not depend on the department. The committee further acknowledged that during the period under review, 36% of the budget for goods and services was spent on township suppliers, while 98.2% of uh, suppliers uh, were with, paid within 30 days due to effective processing to ensure that SMME's cash flow and financial sustainability is improved. The committee noted with concern the inadequate monitoring and evaluation of NPOs that are rendering services to the department. This has uh, contributed uh, negatively on the performance of the department during the period under review. On oversight, on over, uh, performance verification, the view of the committee is that the department has provided detailed information on the third quarter report for the 2021 financial year and the committee further received uh, additional information on matters that needed to be clarified. On portfolio committee concerns, the committee is concerned with the continuous underspending, especially on the programs that are service delivery oriented. The view of the committee is that the underspending compromises the poorest of the poor who are depending on the support provided by the department for their survival. Uh, on the proposed portfolio committee recommendations, the committee recommends as follows, that the department should put a plan in place which will make sure that the underspending does not recur, especially under those programs that are service delivery orientated. The report should be submitted by the 30th of April, 2021. On acknowledgements, the committee would like to thank the MEC for Social Development, Honorable Murakane Musupi, the HOD and the officials of the department for their cooperation during our deliberations. <coughs> I would also like to express my appreciation to members of the committee, Member Makagula, Member Aaron Seke, Member Ndovana, Member D. Adams, Member D. Lidwaba, Member B. Engelbrecht, Member Mufama, Member B. Badenhorst, for their commitment to the oversight process. I commend them for their diligence during uh, deliberations on the third quarter report. The committee would also like to thank officials that support the committee, uh, and they are as follows, Mr. S. Nwala, Ms. Z. Pansuambalo, 
Ms. S. N. Nweli, Ms. N. Jikolo, Mr. John Moloy, Ms. Tin Zuke, Dean Gwenya, N. Nkledi, L. Mantata, K. Kulu, and M. Makwela for their dedication in assisting the committee to achieve its mandate. On adoption, Madam Speaker, after extensive deliberation, the Social Development Committee adopted the third quarter performance report on the Department of Social Development for the 2020-21 financial year. And in accordance with Rule 117, subsection 2C, read together with Rule 164, the Social Development Portfolio Committee tables the report to the House for consideration and adoption, considering the concerns and the proposed recommendations made in the report. I thank you. Any second to the report? Thank you, Mr. I, to second. I raise to second. Seconding, Honorable uh, Kanyane. Uh, I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those not in favor say no. The yes of it, the report is adopted by the House. Can you have the next order? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The fifth order of the day is Community Safety Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the third quarterly report of the Department of Community Safety for the year 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you. Honorable Ndlovana. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'll request the House to consider the, the sections which the, in the report which are not read be considered as read. I, the chairperson of the Community of Safety Portfolio Committee, Honorable Alfina Ndovana table the committee oversight report on the third quarterly performance report on the third quarter report of 2021 financial year. The report is as follows. On the summary, the committee noted concerted effort were made by the department in response to its strategic objectives. The department continued to monitor policy, police performance through announced and unannounced oversight visit to all the 142 police stations in the province. In terms of its crime prevention initiative, the department reported that to have undertake various crime prevention operations with other laws, law enforcement agencies. The results to the arrest of several suspects of various offenses and con confiscation of counterfeit goods to the value of 131.2 million and it was also reported that a total of 151 stolen and hijacked goods were recovered. The committee further noted the overachievement of target in the safe and security community, community intervention as well on, on, as on the school safety intervention. The committee also noted that 1,200 patrollers were deployed at various crime hotspots during the festive season to enhance police service and visibility. The committee noted that the department provides psychosocial support to 7,534 victims on gender-based violence. The department also analyzed 201 gender-based violence dockets while is 713 dockets were tracked and monitored through criminal justice system. Moreover, the department reported that it had received successful conviction of 10 on cases which were at court during the period of under review. The department further reported that it had recruited and empowered volunteers as gender-based violence and femicide brigades. The brigades were part of the department intervention to enhance awareness in community on issues of gender-based violence. The committee noted that the department underachieved on the following targets, social crime prevention intervention, the rollout on the green door houses, monitoring of the victim empowerment centers, and assessment of community safety forum. The department had reported that a recovery plan was developed to ensure that these targets are achieved by the end of the financial year. The committee will monitor the progress of these targets in the next reporting period. The department complies with the budgetary requirement. The committee was, however, concerned with the department's level of compliance with the PFMA. The department program 
expenditure was either significantly above or below the acceptable spending percentage. The committee had observed a history of underspending in program two, provincial secretariat, and continuous over expenditure in program three, traffic management. The committee also considered the Gauteng Substat Quota Crime Statistics Report for 2021 financial year. The province recorded a total of 111, 278 cases on the 17 community report serial crime categories. That this demonstrated a, de a decrease of by 9.6% in comparison with the same quarter of the 2019-20 financial year. The committee welcomed the achievement on the following subcategories. Sub the decrease of 9.1% on house robbery, 13.4% on business robbery, and there were no cases of recorded under the bank robbery. The committee was concerned with the 6% increase on the total sexual offenses and also noted with concern the 5.9 increase in carjacking, 31.8% on the track hijacking and 106.7% in cash in transit. On committee findings and concern, the committee is concerned that the traffic management program was highly likely to overspend by the end of the financial year. The committee is concerned that the department was unable to meet its target in the payment of the suppliers within the prescribed time frame. The committee is concerned about the increasing number of gender-based violence cases. The committee is concerned that the department was unable to roll out a green door and the committee is concerned about the late payment of statement to the patrollers. Committee recommendations. Recommendation number one, that the department develop and implement measures to minimize the possibility of an over-expenditure in the traffic management program and provide a report to the committee by the 31st of May 2021. That the department depends its internal control measures to ensure time as payments of suppliers to avoid accumulative accrual by the end of the financial year and report progress to the committee by the end of the date for, by the date 1st of May 2021. That the department intensify its prevention measures aim at addressing the gender-based violence to cap the sketch of gender-based violence and report progress to the committee by the 31st of May 2021. That the department develop and implement a solid recovery plan achieved to roll out the greenhouse, the green door house to strengthen support to victim gender-based violence and provide a progress report to the committee by the 31st of May 2021. That the department be consistent in the payment of the statement of to patrollers and payment must be aff affected, uh, payment must be effected at the date that was agreed upon by both the department and the patrollers. The department must report progress to the committee by the 31st of May 2021. On acknowledgement, I, the chairperson of the Community Safety Portfolio Committee, Honorable Alvina Zavana, wish to thank the Honorable MEC Community Safety, Honorable, Honorable Faith, Faith Mazibugo, Acting HOD, Mr. Sipot Tenjagwayo, and their team for their cooperation during the committee assessment of the third quarter report of the 2020-21 financial year. I further wish to thank members of the committee, Honorable M. Shagaza Manamela, Honorable S. Ngosi Malobani, Honorable S. Kanyile, Honorable C. Bosch, Honorable M. Shackleton, Honorable M. Khadebe, Honor and Honor Honorable J. Hoffman for the due diligence in assessment of the 2020-21 third quarterly report of the Department of Community Safety. Moreover, thank you to the following support staff of the legislature, Group Community Coordinator, Zoziwe Pantwa Mbalo, Senior Researcher, Sekina Nenuile, Community Coordinator, Tabile Mulumani, Community Researcher, Baba Lomalibe Banda, Researcher, Sizwe Nene, Community Administrator, Tabise Mufuken, Community Communication Officer, Tebe Kumalo, Hansat Recorder, Sylvester Baloi, Service 
Officer Ms. Pezega Royo, Information Officer Ms. Azundeni Nichivuyo, and all support staff for the assistance given in the consideration of this report. On adoption, Madam Speaker, in terms of Rule 117, subsection, uh, subsection 2C, read together with Rule 164 of the Standing Rules of the Houghton Provincial Legislature, the committee hereby present the report to the House for adoption. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Any second to the report? Honorable request, Madam Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I stand to second the report. Second it. Uh, I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those not in favor say no. The yes of it. The report is adopted by the House. Can we have the next order? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The next order of the day is debate on the annual report of the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs for the year 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Honorable Tong. Thank you, Speaker. It has become apparent to us and the people of Gauteng that the Department of Cocta is dismally failed to govern at local government as well enough to positively transform lives. This is the only logical conclusion available to us to be better explain the clear collapse of society as seen when protest and service delivery challenges them from failures at local government level. The department has failed to strengthen our section 154 support towards our municipalities uh, so that they can turn fulfill their section 152 obligations in line with our collective constitutional responsibilities. Even when the department sets time frames and deadline in order to resolve issues pertaining to waste collection, electricity issues, water shortages, infrastructure maintenance, they can only make more promises of change for the future while people are suffer now in the present. Considering that the local government is a powerful distributive tool, the department is failing to ensure that through the resources allocated to it and itself, an entrenched culture of disciplined execution of key priorities is undertaken without compromise so that the lives of Houghton citizens can be materially improved. The financial health of our municipalities remain a major critical concern for us. The inability of municipalities to collect money owed for services rendered is ongoing challenges that the department has failed to find the required robust and, and targeted approach in terms of municipal finance support to resolve. An example of this can be seen from the Mfuleni local municipality received a negative audit outcome in the area of property, plant and equipment as a direct result for the uh, insufficient financial support given by the department to this date, up, update and maintain infrastructure assets registers in line with GREP 17 requirements. Moreover, the city municipality failed to successfully collect revenue owed to the municipality after allegedly received capacity support from Houghton Cocta. The MEC seems to be disengaged from realities of how people live on a daily basis. We say this because just like most parts of Houghton, most, um, like most parts in, in the country, Houghton is also vulnerable to the various natural and unnatural hazards. This is evident by the fact that in the past year, disastrous, disastrous events such as 
check fires, severe thunderstorm and heavy rains experienced in Aran Gauteng has become key indicator that province disaster management center is never in a state of readiness to be proactive or engaged yet to handle the incidents that arises. Key management personnel vacancies remain open and unfilled in addition to losing the services of directors. These programs are operating without a proper leadership and it shows to the detriment of our people. The department underspent its allocated budget by 66 million 501, which will be returned to the Provincial Revenue Fund. Uh, program one, which deals with administrator, utilized 89%, which is of its total allocated budget. The program two, which deals with local governance, only spent uh, 232 million out of the allocated budget, which is uh, 236 million. This resulted in an under, under expenditure amounting to 400, uh, 4,151,000, an average of 2% that could have been used to further cap uh, capacitate the community development workers to employ additional severe needed uh, CTW workers to the move of number from the dismally 350 to the required number of 570. The program which deals with the development planning has planned to spend 120 million 978,000 rents out of 164 million 202 thousand rents allocated budget. The 26% was underspent, could have been used to the Mfuleni sewer issues that has endangered the lives of municipalities regi uh, residents. The environment and the environment and unshame, shamefully dis displaying the how ANC led government department has abandoned their constitutional responsibility to ensure that all South Africans have access to adequate sanitation. Um, program for which deals with traditional institution management, which allocated at least a budget of total allocation of 17 million rents, of which was only 14 million translate, translating to the 83% of their budget was spent. Even traditional councils that this fund were supposed to go to did not submit their outstanding financial report, creating under expenditure in their program, displaying the lack of coordination and anchor accountability to this department perpetrates in and for itself. In Tuani, uh, the overall vacancy rate of 26% largely affects the ANC-led municipality political instability. In Tuani's back, the vacancy rate for the rest of categories of employees was over 6% during the 2019-2020 financial year. Time up, time up. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Dilange. Madam, Madam Speaker. Chief, thank, uh, thank you very much. Um, our time is short. I just want to say, um, comment on the reports um, and just say that however we gift wrap this, especially the MEC, he is still responsible for this whole department and the underperforming of municipalities is completely unacceptable. We see it, you just have to drive through municipalities to see how municipalities um, are being fixed now, the problems. 
by the community. You have to go to social media and you can see how the, the communities have to step in where municipalities are failing. So no means by watered water down comments and replies by the MEC or his departmental heads will ever change it. And I think we need to take cognizance of that. And that is the core problem that we need to address, Madam mm -hmm. Speaker. Um, and yes, th we need some serious attendance to that. Thank you very much. Honourable Nsumanga. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I was to say that uh, the Department Holding of Corporate Governance and uh, or Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs is consistently performing very badly, but I think this is something that is very much known. And we now need to then get away from the rhetoric of every day and then get to then say what needs to be done. Madam Speaker, the Department received an annual allocation of 562.2 million rand in the 2019-2020 financial year and have underspent across all its programs by 66.5%. That's more than 10% of, um, of its budget, Madam Speaker. The department has spent, and I need to highlight this because I think this is where we now need to get to the crux of where the problem is. Um, in program one, it underspent by 16 million rand, and this is the program that is responsible for administration. Um, it also underspent by 4.1 in program two, which is um, responsible for local governance, and also 43.2 million rand, which is a program that is responsible for develop, uh, develop, development planning, and 3.1 million rand for a program that is responsible for traditional institutional management. Now, Madam Speaker, if you were to then start looking at the programs that are failing, you realize that these are programs that are aimed at addressing serious challenges of uh, where municipalities are concerned. For instance, you have development, uh, you develop, development planning uh, where we continue to have you know, projects that are started off and not uh, finalized. You have municipalities that are supposed to be assisted in terms of planning, but are not being assisted accordingly, and this is why municipalities end up failing. Now, these are things that we now need to be talking about instead of calling, coming to the house and calling people Dom Cop and not knowing <laughs> what is it that is, uh, what is happening in the municipalities. It is shocking, Madam Speaker, that uh, we get to a situation where you also have municipalities that are on the brink of collapse. And when you look, in certain instances, we have spent millions of rents in intervention, but you never ask what is then the intervention that we get out of uh, the money that has been spent. Infulen is a typical example. The MEC himself has uh, actually highlighted the fact that we have spent not less than 50 million rent um, in intervention in Infulen. But if you were to then start analyzing and asking the right questions in terms of have we really made some serious progress there? No, we haven't. The South African Human Rights Commission has come out and say what is happening in Mfulen right now, what is happening in Val is gross human rights abuse. And we're just coming out of, um, you know, um, commemorating a day where we're talking about uh, um, human rights. People are not able to then get water. People are not able to get proper sanitation. People are living on in, 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 in fear. Municipalities are not able to provide the basic of services. But instead of addressing that, we have an MEC that rather call people Dom Cops, instead of addressing what is the real challenge that people are sitting with. That is a shame. We move on, Madam Speaker. You're having um, right now this, um, the, the National Treasury that is also now um, asking, what are you doing? What are you doing? We're giving you more money. We're giving you more money to assist municipalities in order to improve services. But we're not getting there, Brasol. We're not getting there. What we do is we keep on employing people, but we're not asking what is then the output that we get at the end of the day. That, for me, is a problem. Go look at the annual report. It's still talking about people that are employed, um, even in the department, that don't even have contracts, by the way. So you have people that are employed in the department that don't have contracts, but getting paid every, every month. After that, after they're getting paid, nobody's even assessing what is the performance in the department. And we wonder why government is not able to get some of the things right. We need to move away from the rhetoric and get into really dealing with the substance of what is making our municipalities fail. And how do we, from a provincial government, assist our municipalities to move from the dire situation that they find themselves in? Last week, I was in Brick Valley, in a place called uh, Brick, uh, Brick, uh, Brick Valley in, in, in Mirafo. 
6,000 units of, of houses have been built. No sewer system has been built. No um, water have been made provision for. More than, less than 500 meters from there, you have people that are still living in plastics. Now, that is a shame. And that talks about the lack of planning from a government perspective and a local government perspective. So where we come from a provincial perspective, we build top structures, but we're not assisting the local municipalities to ensure that the right infrastructure is put in place. That is something that we have to be, you know, dis really discussing and say how we then address these issues going forward, Madam Speaker. The people of South Africa, the people of Houghton deserve government that is really responsive. But for us to be responsive, it means that we have to own up to some of the mistakes that have taken place time and time again and say, how do we then address them? It cannot be that we come here each and every time and look at the annual report and listen to the Auditor General's report and then repeat the same things again. I can tell you uh, right now, Mediali, um, if you go and look at the Auditor General's report, same thing, same issues has been raised, and we've talked about this in the committee, but I think that the House at some point will now need to be discussing these issues. To say we cannot raise issues time and time and time again, but yet at the same time, the very next year, the same issues keep cramming, uh, uh, creeping up, the same issues keep, uh, you, know, uh, it, you know, really failing um, the, the shining reports that the department should be getting. We now need to then say, how do we then permanently address some of these challenges? How do we then permanently ensure that the people that are being put in positions are able to then deliver? I like what the uh, uh, media says. He says that we as politicians sometimes get blamed for what the officials are doing. Because the officials are there. We say we want to see this happening. The officials are there as implementers. Yet at the same time, when they fail, we, are the, we ourselves are protecting them because they, we need to protect you know, the political parties that certain people belong to. And this is one of the things that is going to be coming up as a bill that we now need to be dealing with at some point. But I'm saying that we cannot deal with protecting politicians in administration. We have to deal with the issues of ensuring that de uh, services are delivered to the people um, you know, at a local level. And we hold mayors, we hold uh, uh, municipal managers and directors, whether it be uh, Section 56 or whatever um, level that the, man uh, the management find themselves in, in different municipalities. That is the only way that we'll be able to then deliver to the people um, of Gauteng and indeed the different municipalities. Madam Speaker, I can talk about um, quite a number of examples, but here's one thing that I want to leave um, this house with. So, we have MECs that decided that they were going to put Swan under administration. First of all, there was an, uh, an unfunded uh, two billion rand budget that had been passed in the city of Swan by the administration. Now that is, that is going to be a problem, that needs to be cleaned up. Now you're going to have a municipality that not only does it have to clear the two billion rand underfunded or unfunded mandate, they have to now begin to roll back and go and make sure that they're able to recover money that was uh, not recovered or that was not collected. That, in addition to a number of contracts that had been signed, yet we have administrators that are left there and nobody has ever asked the question, what improvements did you leave behind? These are things that we have to be talking about when we talk about holding people to account. When we come here, it should not be that we are here to just read and represent reports. It should be that we are asking ourselves, what are we doing to correct uh, the mistakes that the report are talking to? It cannot be business as usual as we Thank come you. here. We Thank are you. saying, yes, Thank you can you. ask me what I did in Swami. Time up, time I have up. A, time a municipality up, time that up. had a surplus. Time up. That is a fact. Time up, time up, time up. A municipality time. that had Honorable every resident able Honorable to get Simang, a gig every order. day of data. No. The next. Ah, Honorable, Honorable Simang. Honorable Nube. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Members of the Executive, Honorable Chief Whip of the Majority Party, Honorable Members of the Provincial Legislature, Sanbonai. We meet here today in this August House, two days after we have commemorated and celebrated the Human Rights Day. Our gathering comes a few days after interment of the mortal remains of Isilo Samabanda, His Majesty King Gudil Zwelitini Kapeuzel. May his soul rest in eternal peace. We meet in this fashion well into the new hybrid system of the new normal conditions brought about by the invisible enemy, 
the COVID-19 pandemic and its mutations. That has ravaged the world in a vicious way. Honor speaker, it's just over a year since South Africa announced its first case of the patient who tested positive for COVID-19. This virus has ravaged communities and removed support structures that kept them standing. It has left families broken with no one to take care of those who are dependent at instances. It has left children without parents. In essence, it has robbed many people of their loved ones. The economy did not survive the rapacious virus. Many people lost jobs, in particular women and youth. In the COVID-19 induced new normal, Asawa Zongalaban Tubum Deli, Oma Kilwane, Nesereza Asawa Zokhaulan, Gotage, Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, Isizul City, Abula Shambele, Ungagufelo. Our gratitude goes to all the frontline workers who braved the storm and kept to their oath of practice. Madam Speaker, not a secondary effect, but almost as a twin to the pandemic, we experienced a high number of gender-based violence and femicide with the lockdown that followed the declaration of the national state of disaster. The extent, of if the, the extent and effect of the GPV sketch prompted the president to call it another pandemic. This sketch revived the spirit of Ubuntu Mutu in the nation. Reading the 2021 African National Congress General Aid Statement, President Ramaphosa, who is also the president of the country, declared 2021 as the year of Charlotte Matlaike, as part of our celebration of her 150 years anniversary as a struggle icon and a human rights campaigner. Mama Charlotte Matlaike is, is known as the mother of the black freedom in South Africa. She's also known as the black first South African woman to graduate with a university degree, a Bachelor of Science from Wilberforce University. She was an activist and a founding president of Bantu Women's League. I'll therefore dedicate my speech to this multi-talented trailblazer of women in academics, an activist for women's rights, a teacher, a clergy, and an invaluable heritage campaigner. I feel privileged then to be uh, one of the speakers to debate the 2019-2020 annual report within the constitutional mandate of the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs under the ANC led government during the Human Rights Month. Firstly, I want to indicate that our constitution created a government structure with three distinct yet inter interdependent spheres, the national, provincial, and the municipalities. The Carter Department is therefore mandated by Section 154 of our Constitution to support and strengthen the capacity of the municipalities to manage their own affairs, to exercise their powers and perform their functions, but not to micromanage them. Section 151, subsection 4 of the Constitution says, the national or provincial government may not compromise or impede a municipality's ability or right to exercise its powers or perform its functions. However, this is not an unfettered right as Section 139, its authority providing for direct provincial intervention. This provision of 139 empowers a provincial executive to intervene in the affairs of a municipality that cannot or does not fulfill an executive or legislative fun function in terms of the prescripts of the Constitution. Of the three tiers of government, local government is closest to the citizens with respect to service delivery, providing basic services. Uh, we, re we rely on the YXF1 uh, one outcomes of the municipalities indicated that the province has the second best track record of audit outcome and had maintained its outcomes on the same level as the previous years, 2017, 18, 2019, 2020, Gauteng audit outcomes showed that Gauteng has had steady with all municipalities again and maintained their good audit outcomes. The Auditor General further said, Gauteng was the only province in whom all the municipalities had unqualified audit opinions. 
Th that's it. it. This in itself suggests that we have a good story to tell, and therefore, the efforts by the provincial department in supporting the municipalities are yielding good results as we did not decline in terms of performance. Madam Speaker, it will be a misrepresentation of facts to suggest or even imply that there are no challenges. But the department is alive to the existing challenges and is striving to improve so as to uplift the performance of the few municipal municipalities in an endeavor to achieve clean audits. Worth noting, amongst others, are the challenges noted by the Auditor General, which include the political instability in the metros, in the city of Tuane, and the city of Joburg. We all know negative impact of coalition governments. They are unstable in nature, owing to the divergent philosophies and political mandates of the parties in coalition, in particular, and in government in general. Our fellow members on the other side of the house can bear tes testimony to what the Aud Auditor General is saying here. Or and above that, the ANC-led government is fully aware of the challenges in, Mir in Mirafong, the West Rand, and Mfuleni and Visedi in City Bay. MSC Mayinge present presented a detailed support and intervention plan developed by the department. The plan includes personnel seconded to the identified municipalities in order to give support and improve service delivery. These different teams deployed in the said municipalities have a responsibility of addressing all the issues that are impacting on the service delivery. Madam Speaker, that shows the commitment of the department to the strengthening of its own fiduciary obligation and supporting role to ensure that the citizens of these areas receive the better services that they deserve. We're equally aware that the challenges of revenue collection, water, sewer, and portals, and et cetera, which impact negatively on the lives of the people we serve. And for these, we have a turnaround plan which is being implemented. The Honorable Premier Makura gave us a current call in building a capable and developmental state in his State of the Province address in 2019. He said, and I quote, we must, act, we must take urgent steps to drastically reduce water demand and water losses. We also need to urgently ensure that we secure a sufficient supply of water in, for our city region. He went further and said, we will increase investment in bulk water infrastructure in order to diversify the water source mix. We'll deploy new smart technologies to capture groundwater, reuse of wastewater for other purposes, treatment of acid mine drainage, and rainwater har harvesting, close quote. Madam Speaker, although COVID-19 has caused some delays, the housing and select government remains focused on its growing housing together plan of action. We are on course working with all our municipalities in the province to improve their financial viability, which was impacted by the national lockdown. As I conclude, Honorable Speaker, please allow me to quote our revolutionary, the anti-apartheid politician, a freedom fighter, a teacher, a lawyer, our hero, our formidable organizer, our struggle stalwart, our global icon, Isi Tualande, the late President Oliver Reginald Tambo, who said in 1977, and quote, Comrades, you might think that it is very difficult to wage a liberation struggle. Wait until you are in power. I might be dead by then. At that stage, you will realize that it is actually more difficult to keep power than to wage a liberation war. People will be expecting a lot of services from you. You will have to satisfy the various demands of the masses of our people, close, close quote. By so saying, Honorable Speaker, by so saying, Honorable Speaker and members, lessons have also been learned by those who are throwing stones before they tested power and before they know how is it to govern in 2016. Maybe they can also share 
the challenge is that they, uh, they encountered. Uh, under the Simangoya reformer mayor, you may also share with us in terms of uh, how is it to, to fix all these challenges. I thank you. Honorable Mutara. Thank you very much, Speaker. On behalf of um, Ms. Maile, I'd like to deliver the following remarks. Um, honorable Premier, honorable colleagues in the executive, honorable members, members of the media, and ladies and gentlemen. Beyond the unprecedented challenges brought about by COVID-19 to the municipalities, the year 2020 saw a couple of interesting court judgments that should be of great interest to all of us who are involved with the local government space and have a vested interest in resolving its manifold issues in order to bring about improvements in service delivery. In Makanda in the Eastern Cape, we saw citizens successfully calling for and campaigning for the municipality to be dissolved and placed under administration. And most astonishingly of all, in December 2020, the Northwest High Court found that the Ghetleng Refir local municipality was in breach of its constitutional obligations for failing to provide water and sanitation and for not preventing pollution. Madam Speaker, the court also gave the Residents Association the authority to take over sewage, sewage works, something which the residents did with great success. The court also ordered that the municipal manager be jailed for 90 days unless water supply was restored urgently and the flow of sewage into local rivers was stopped. Residents took over the delivery of water and fixing sewage works with the municipality objecting and taking them to court when this happened. The court sided with the residents who successfully took over these functions. These are all very interesting judgments and of course a higher court may take a different view of especially the Northwest matter but what should be of interest to us is the fact that from these and other actions that we have seen, even in our own province, citizens are tired of municipalities not working and service delivery being in a state of shambles as a result. Honorable members, this should give us a sense of urgency about fixing the problems within our municipalities in a non-partisan manner that puts the interests of citizens first above any party or intra-party factional loyalties. Community trust in all spheres of governance but most specifically local government, is at an all-time low, and it is important that we restore that trust by fixing things and ensuring that things work. The era of impunity and a lackadaisical attitude to governance is well and truly over. We must find ways of fixing broken municipalities within the ambit of the constitutional framework of cooperative governance. Hence, one of the critical focuses of the sixth administration in Gauteng has been on strengthening and enhancing Section 154 support to municipalities. Madam Speaker, this is one of the things we immediately worked at setting in place in the year under review, which was our first year in office within this portfolio. Our focus from the onset has been on providing hands-on support to municipalities without going beyond our constitutional responsibilities and encroaching on theirs as a different sphere of government. This entails the provision of direct support to municipalities through the deployment of highly specialized capacity to assist with core technical skills in the areas of finance, human resource development and management, and other technical skills in engineering as well as planning. This is an intergovernmental, interdepartmental support mechanism in the true spirit of cooperative governance, which entails various government departments and state entities providing the capacity needed to strengthen municipalities. COCTA, as a provincial department, simply coordinates and facilitates this type of work. Honorable members, we provided a multidisciplinary team of revenue experts to strengthen revenue enhancement and debt management with a focus on having a positive impact on the liquidity of the municipalities. We supported the municipalities to ensure that all the activities within the municipal revenue value chain functioned optimally and are coordinated through the establishment and coordination of the Integrated Revenue Management Forum. Together with the Gauteng Provincial Treasury, we established the Debt Management Committee aimed at facilitating government debt repayment processes within government departments and entities. Through the support of Government Debt Committee, payments to Gauteng amounting to 2.8 billion rand for the 2018-19 and 2019-20 financial years consolidated were realized. We enhanced the work of the recently established COCTA-led capital expenditure war room 
The CAPEX War Room is comprised of relevant sector departments and SOEs as a problem solving and intervention mechanism. Its scope includes identifying municipal infrastructure problems ranging from planning, budgeting, skill shortages to implementation. Its main aim is to fac facilitate the implementation of municipal infrastructure projects within planned timelines. Specifically, the CAPEX War Room, we conducted an audit and correction of large power and water users billing data and facilitated the collection of the large power and water users in six Gauteng local municipalities, namely Empuleni, Lesedi, Merafong, Mudval, Mughali City, and, the Rand and Rand West. Honorable members, we set up regional support teams for municipalities full of experts led by COCTA, but able to draw elsewhere if needed to support municipalities and ensure that they have capacity for, to fulfill their Section 152 obligations constantly and continuously. We coordinated and facilitated bilateral engagements between the province and all its departments and municipalities looking to address pertinent service delivery issues such as water and sanitation, sewage, roads, and transport infrastructure, and also facilitated and coordinated engagements between municipalities and Rand Water, as well as ESCOM, in order to address electricity and water supply issues. Madam Speaker, in the year under review, COCTA repositioned itself and played a more prominent and significant role than it had ever before in ensuring that it coordinated and facilitated intergovernmental, interdepartmental efforts to address and deal with service delivery issues within communities. That led to a trust deficit between elected leadership and citizens. The incremental progress made by COCTA is being felt in the real life changes that are happening within communities as we intensify our efforts to turn the performance of all municipalities around. I thank you. Thank you. Can we get the next order? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Consideration of the Cooperative Governance, Traditional Affairs and Human Settlement Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the Annual Report of the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs for the 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Honorable Diale. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Like I said earlier, I'm standing here on behalf of men and women who served who served in the Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs Portfolio Committee, namely Member Paul Malema, Member Greg Schneeman, Member Pusisiwe Ngube, Member Solim Sima, Member Sirota, Member Ledwaba, Member To, Member Amanda Dilange, Member Dalton Adams, and Member Bonkinkosi Plamini. I Honorable Diboni Diali here by tables, the Committee Oversight Report on the Annual Report of the Gauteng Department of Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs for the year 2019-2020. Madam Speaker, in terms of the financial performance of the department, they managed to spend 495 million, which is 88% of the 2019-2020 financial year budget against the allocated budget of 562 million. The department in the last financial year has materially underspent on various programs, on all the four programs um, as outlined in the report. I request that members in this house accept the, uh, that parts of the report that I'm not going to read they consider them as red. The department could also manage in the last financial year to ensure 100% of invoices, payment of 100% payment of invoices within 30 days as prescribed by the Public Finance Management Act over the last four quarters in the said financial year. The department also developed a provincial-wide indigenous policy framework incorporating indigent burials and homelessness. The department did not, in the last financial year, achieve its target to develop the capable expenditure framework in line with the integrated urban development framework levels in Mirafo municipality 
I think honorable members will note in all our reports that Miraform and Enfilin continues to be Tubaburoko to the portfolio committee and the department. So the department also did not support Enfilin municipality with repairs and maintenance on sewer pump stations because of the late transfer of funds to the implementing agent, which is ERVAT, and on house and traditional leaders in Gauteng, it is highlighted that the respective council, which is the two tribal authority councils in Tuani, did not submit the financial reports for 2019-2020 financial year. In terms of risk identified, one strategic risk assessment was conducted as planned in the year under review. On our concerns, Honorable Speaker, uh, on program one, sub-program on human capital management, the department only reached 33% in implementing Employment Equity Act. So they're still struggling to employ women in senior management positions as compared to their target of 40% in that financial year. On human capital management, the department only recruited 1.6% out of the 2% target of employing people with disability in the last financial year. On program three, which is infrastructure technical support, the department did not achieve the target of supporting Mirafo uh, on, develop, on CRC, capital expenditure framework, together with Integrated Urban Development Framework delivers due to challenges of appointing a service provider to Baburok. Infrastructure technical support, the department did not support Mfileni municipality with repairs and maintenance of sewer pump stations because of the late transfer of funds to the implementing agent. The portfolio committee is seriously concerned with the dysfunctionality of Mfilweni municipality, despite the numerous interventions uh, implemented by the Department of Cocta, and I think uh, we'll see later, there's, there's a visit by government uh, from national to, to including our provincial government to Mfilweni. Um, on program four, noting the pr pr proliferation of initiation schools in Gauteng, the portfolio committee is concerned whether the department is enforcing the national initiation schools guidelines effectively. The leadership dispute that is taking place in Aman Debele Balibilo in Hamanscraft, oversight on budget expenditure on program one, since the fifth administration to date, date is last financial year, the department seem not to have commitment in showing the seriousness of procuring a building in ensuring the seriousness of pro procuring a building to accommodate staff, this has caused the department to incur high operational costs on data and voice um, expenditures as well as traveling expenses. The department recorded underspending in all four quarters of the financial year of 2019-2020. Our recommendation as a portfolio committee and we request that the department respond by the 31st April 2021 on program one. The department should ensure that it appoints uh, according to the Employment Equity Act, especially they should make sure that women are appointed in senior management uh, services. Um, the department should also ensure that in the next financial year, which is the one that is ending, uh, it employs the 2% uh, of people with disability as the target. The portfolio committee will monitor this target on a quarterly basis, which we continue to do uh, to ensure that the marginalized are also considered. On program three, the department should provide the portfolio committee with reasons for not appointing a service provider to support Miraform to develop capital expenditure framework together with the integrated urban development framework levers. The department should provide a portfolio committee with reasons why Mfilen was not supported with repairs and maintenance on sewer pump stations because of the late transfer of funds to be implemented to the implementing agent, Ervart. The department should provide the portfolio committee with a progress report 
on the current status of Mpulwene municipality and the impact derived from the implementation of section 139 of the constitution in ensuring that Mpulwene municipality is in its rightful state of servicing communities in that locality. On traditional affairs, the department should provide a co portfolio committee with an accurate report outlining the effective use of the national initiation schools guidelines in preventing the spread of bogus initiation schools in Gauteng. The department should put measures in place to address the leadership dispute in Aman Debele Balebelo in Hamanskral and report to the portfolio committee on a quarterly basis on the progress made thereof. The department should provide the portfolio committee with a detailed report to date on the status of procuring a building to accommodate staff and cap the higher operational cost on data, voice, as well as traveling. The department should ensure that in future, strict measures are put in place to avoid the continuous recurrence of underspending in the department. Underspending in by the department hampers service delivery in the province. Madam Speaker, I wish to thank the Honorable MEC Maile, the HOD in Tate Bongani Tileshe, together with their team from the Gauteng Cocta for their cooperation and participation in our activities as a portfolio committee. I also want to thank uh, honorable members who always are available to do oversight work proactively. The, we also express our appreciation to the team as led by Ms. Uzuem Banjo Mbalo uh, and coordinators Jeki Nyembe and Jabulile, Jabulile Nyembe and Jeki Mutek, as well as our researchers and everybody who supports the, the portfolio committee. In terms of Rule 117, subsection 2C, read with Rule 164, the Portfolio Committee on COCTA hereby recommends that the report on COCTA annual oversight report for the year 2019-2020 be adopted, considering the committee comments and proposed recommendations made in this report. I thank you. Any seconder to the report? Member Malema second the report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Seconded, thank you. I now put a question. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those yeah. not in favor say no. The yes of it, the report is adopted by the House. Can we have the next order? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Debate on the annual report of the Department of Human Settlement for the 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Honorable Litwaba. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The Department of Human Settlement is in a serious state of disarray. The Department has grossly underspent this budget by more than 10%. It has materially underspent on all its programs for the year under review. Many just again failed to meet its targets under various programs, further delaying the process of providing adequate housing for the poor people of the province. In his SOPA address, Premier Makura made a pronouncement in 2019 regarding the rapid land release program that around 10,000 of number of service stands would be made available to the residents of Gauteng, a target that was never reached and is not likely to be achieved in the near future. In the same address, the EFF caucus asked as to where those pieces of land would come from, and the answer was that they could not disclose the locations at that point in time. It has now resurfaced that there were no piece of land available for this program. Despite the program, despite the pronouncement on commitments made in the House sitting and the people of Kauti, we were lied to we, we were lied to many times, but this cannot be countenanced and go unchallenged. Let me take this opportunity to challenge the Premier and MEC Maile to provide progress report made in expropriating land without compensation for public usage as enshrined in the in Republic's Constitution. Constitution. The provincial government needed to secure land for rapid land release program and why they did not expect it without compensation as they cite delays and impediments in securing piece of land. Where and how many pieces of land did they expropriate? They should be able to explain to us. 
With regard to the allocation of potential beneficiaries, why was the rapid land release program approved late last year when around 10,000 service stands were promised in 2019-2020? Why is there no uniformity in terms of identification and sourcing of beneficiaries across the province, each municipality is employing its own communication strategy which are different from each other? Corruption in the allocation and sourcing of beneficiaries from the National Housing Needs Register has exacerbated. Municipalities not adhering to the approved provincial allocation policy, just for instance, accurately, they use their own informal settlement as a priority to back residents living under services. Allegations of corruption activities reported against officials not attended to, and in-state whistleblowers are killed by the syndicate. Case in point are killings of people in Accession 45 Clay Villa Kurulene Ward 1, flee off at Johannesburg Ward 70, and Glen Marikana Ward 16 in Kurulene. The so called anti land invasion unit or strategy used to amass resources from the provincial government is a futile and re reactionary exercise. It must be stated that the provincial government, no matter how aggrieved and irritated they could be regarding land land occupation of vacant and occupied land. The unfortunate part is that all oh, at this level, they cannot disregard pie and extra pieces of legislation that remain intact and in use. Of great concern is placing the policy under the pretext that something tangible will come out of it. As to why is the unit residing with human settlement when DID is the custodian of all, this, of all the provincial properties remaining an item? Why was the 270 million paid to the Red Ends by human settlement, but not by DID? We call, upon the, we call upon the province to establish a committee of inquiry to investigate corruption associated with Red Ends and services they claim they provided, while we all know they never provided those services. All officials who were implicated be temporarily suspended pending result of the inquiry. The inquiry should extend to hostile management program wherein maintenance budgets were issued out year in and year out, but no maintenance has ever happened in those hostels. With regard to the incomplete projects and abandoned buildings and units, we call upon the province to undertake an audit of these projects. We further call upon the provincial government to assist those who have occupied those buildings or units and qualify to be assisted in completing necessary beneficiary documents, and they be handed over to those they, they be handed over those RDP units, taking leave from the North Houghton High Court order, directing Houghton government and occupants of Varanani project in the Madras to find an amicable solution to the matter. The, the EFF continues to guarantee the people of this province integrated humanity statements that will, in the real sense, be definitive of all settlements led by the state, and that will be equipped with guaranteed bulk services such as water provision, electricity, sewer system, parks and recreation facilities. As the EFF government, we will ensure Time that up. government built houses meet the standards requirements to ensure <laughs> if, to ensure ease of access Time to people. Up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Government. Thank you very much, honorable member. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Member. The next speaker is Honourable Zamini of the IFP. Honourable Zamini. Thank you very much, Honourable Chair of Chairs, Honourable Members, and Honourable uh, MECs. Madam Speaker, the Inkatra Freedom Party has always been cognizant of the fact that the Department of Human Settlement does not have all the necessary resources to fund the ever-growing need for housing and infrastructure in the province. But when this department underspends its budget by over 280 million and scores a series of own goals like we have seen in the dismal underachievement of its targets for the 2019-2020 financial, financial year, we must call a spade a spade. During the period under review, the Department of Human Settlement not only failed to meet its service delivery targets, as it did in the previous years, but it has also failed to realize value for money on its spending. As much as the, as, as much as the Department spent 95% of its allocated budget, that did not translate to the same level of impact and performance on the ground. 
Madam Speaker, if there was at least one critical area where the IFP was hoping for the department to improve its performance upon, it was on the case of fixing hostels. After all, during the 2019 uh, SOPA, the Honorable Premier committed to ending the marginalization of hostel communities in Gauteng and said the following words, and I quote, we will ensure that hostel residents are not left behind by including them, uh, by including them as beneficiaries of the new mega human settlements while upgrading the, the existing hostel. They must also enjoy a better life like millions of our residents who have decent shelter and, 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 and are enjoying close quote. Following the Premier's promise last year, on the 5th of March 2020, to be exact, the Finance Minister, uh, Honorable Nkomo Ralekoku, announced that this government has earmarked approximately 65 million rand for the emergency intervention and maintenance of hostels. Despite all the promises and commitments made in recent years, nothing has moved. The department has now progressed to the 2020-2021 financial year. We have been tabled with, the, with its third quarter report for 2021-2021, and no account of those funds which were committed to being set aside for hostel intervention. The optimism we once had that things will improve when the incumbent, Honorable MEC Maile, took over this portfolio in 2019, is now vanishing and being replaced by outright exaggeration over the delays caused by the department's insufficiency, lack of leadership. The delays and inefficiencies of implementation uh, deny the citizens the opportunity of enjoying progressive higher quality of life. Just over a week ago, we were part of a human settlement portfolio committee oversight to some of the hostels owned by the department at Denver and Josh Koch, wherein residents relay their issues ranging from cancelled maintenance contracts, inadequate housing, and general neglect by the Department of Human Settlement. The committee and the department just does not care. Suffice to say, the word disappointment does not even begin to describe the way hostel residents feel let down by the number of continuous unfulfilled promises made by this, uh, by this government. Whereas the Premier promised that hostel residents would not be left behind in development, the department has managed to do exactly that. This proves once again that the politics of occlusion traceable to apartheid policies and practice continue unabated. While some might be imbued with a sense of frustration, many other citizens are still waiting, hopefully that one day this government might remember them as citizens deserving of the equal right to decent shelter and dignity enjoyed by others in our province. They still hope for change even though their lives have been stripped of legal political, and political status and can ascribe the status of, <coughs> of being slaves in their own country. Thus, the IFP stands to remind this government of its constitutional mandate to deliver decent housing and empower people with secure, security of tenure, and that the resolution of therefore needs to be quick and efficient. Madam Chair of Chairs, I wish to reflect on the all-important issue of corruption that continues unabated within this department. Coupled, coupled with that is the issue of more than one billion rand irregular expenditure incurred by the department during the 2019-2020 financial year. In this regard, we echo the sentiments of the Auditor General's report, which are that the department needs to strengthen its internal risk control measures and consequence management. The tough talk on corruption must be backed by actions. The department says that it managed to allocate 2,570, just 11% from a planned target of 21,718 housing units in the 2019-2020 financial year. It also aimed at transferring 7,575 target deeds to qualifying beneficiaries, but reported that only 898, just 12% title deeds were transferred to qualifying beneficiaries during year under review. This, simply, this is simply not good enough. The people of Gauteng demand and rightfully deserve better. What is most concerning and drew most of our attention is the under achievements in Program 3, Housing Development. This program is the core of the department's work and takes the lion's share of the overall budget. Yet the department has only managed to achieve a mega two targets that makes only 9% out of the 23 targets they've set for itself to achieve under this program. It is unattainable that the department can justify having spent 
approximately 4.9 billion, which is 95% of the allocated budget of this program, only to achieve less than 10% of the actual targets, EAP Mali. This trend of ineptitude is also evident in all other programs where the department met less than half of its set targets. It is concerning that the expenditure is not consuming with the expected performance target. Whether it is in the issuing of title deeds, issuing of service tents and houses, or implementation of the land rapid release program, the department's performance has not improved. Instead, it has slowed. Unfortunately, this occurs at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has increased the vulnerability of our citizens. In conclusion, Madam Chair of Chairs, despite the pace and rate of housing delivery and the failure in the program, none of us want to see this department fail. We therefore call upon MEC to effect strong and decisive leadership. Stop the own goal, stop own goal, uh, the, the own goal scoring incompetence and corruption, which undermines the department's ability to build a better life for all residents of Gauteng. The right to decent shelter, which also affords us the dignity and freedom to fend for ourselves, is at the core of democracy. And we, are, and we all have a responsibility in preserving it. Therefore, the IP remains committed to lending its support uh, to the MEC uh, department. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable very Member. Much. We now have um, Honorable Schema. Uh, Madam Speaker, members of the Executive Council and honourable members, it's an honour and a privilege to participate in this Human Settlements Annual Report debate as an MPL of the African National Congress. This debate takes place just two days after Human Rights Day, which we observed on 21 March, a day on which we remember the men and women who protested at Sharpeville on the 21st of March 1960, and where ultimately 69 people were brutally killed which included eight women and 10 children. In his address on Sunday, President Ramaphosa said, and I quote, the heroes who protested at Sharpeville on the 21st of March, 1960, took up the cause of liberty, freedom, and human rights. They did so not for themselves alone, but for us all. That's why there are heroes and heroines, close quote. It is because of the bravery and sacrifices of so many that we sit here today in this legislature. Had it not been for their bravery and sacrifice, we might not be sitting here today. Let us never forget the countless thousands who were at the forefront of opposing apartheid, those who went to jail, and those who ultimately lost their lives. Madam Speaker, this debate also takes place in the year that marks the 150th anniversary of the birth of one of South Africa's most remarkable and pioneering leaders, Charlotte Manya Matreke. The ANC has, de sorry, she was the first black South African woman to ob obtain a science degree and was a delegate to the ANC's founding conference in 1912. She made an exceptional contribution to the struggle for the liberation of women in South Africa and challenged contemporary attitudes about the place of women in politics, society, and the economy. She organized farm workers and domestic workers and dedicated her life to improving the conditions under which African women lived. A heroine who paved the way for freedom in South Africa and for us to sit here in this legislature today. Madam Speaker, in 1955, the Congress of the People adopted the Freedom Charter in Cliptown, which contained the following clauses, and I quote, there shall be houses, security, and comfort. All people shall have the right to live where they choose be decently housed and to bring up their families in comfort and security. Unused housing space to be made available to the people. Slums shall be demolished and new suburbs built. We all have road transport, roads, lighting, playing fields, creches and social centres. The ANC's election manifesto of 2019 contained the following commitments amongst others and I quote, build at least one South African new one, build at least one new South African city of the future. Transform the property market to promote access to urban opportunity and social integration through access to well-located, affordable housing, decent shelter, thereby reversing urban fragmentation and highly inefficient sprawl. Release land at the disposal of the state 
for site and service to afford households the opportunity to build and own their own homes, improve the alignment of housing provision with other public investments and service provision, including schools and health facilities and transport networks, complementing more integrated residential, industrial and commercial development, address the title deeds backlog along with associated institutional and capacity gaps to ensure that the transfer of title deeds moves with higher speed. The Freedom Charter became a great beacon of hope for millions of South Africans who were united in a common struggle for dignity, equality and social justice. Since the dawn of democracy in 1994, our mission as the African National Congress has consistently, consistently been the creation of a better life for all South Africans with a greater focus on those who cannot afford to provide themselves for themselves. The ANC's 29 election manifesto, which outlines the ANC's plans for the sixth administration, continues to transform the Freedom Charter into a living reality for the peoples of our land. The Human Settlement Annual Report of 2019-20 provides details on the various achievements which the Department of Human Settlements in Gauteng achieved in the period under review, which started on 1 April 2019. The six national and provincial elections took place on 8 May 2019, and as is, and as is common knowledge, the ANC emerged victorious in Gauteng. Premier David Makura, in announcing the members of the Executive Council in the sixth administration, Aptly, aptly appointed the Honourable Lebohang Maile as the new MEC for COCTA, Urban Planning and Human Settlements. One of the challenges which has faced the Department of Human Settlements in Gauteng has been the lack of stability due to frequent changes of political principles and accounting offices. We hope that the stability that we have started to see in the year under your review, together with the appointment of an HOD and CFO, will continue through the sixth administration. The Department received a qualified audit opinion from the Auditor General. The appointment of the HOD and CFO during the financial year will start to, re will start to yield results in the coming financial year, and the committee, committee will closely monitor progress being made in addressing the audit findings of the Auditor General. The Department spent 95 per cent of its funds, with underspending standing at 5 per cent for the financial year 2019-2020. Of course for concern is that whilst the department set targets, it was not able to fully meet many of, it, or many of these. During engagements with the department, reasons for the non-attainment of targets were provided together with steps um, to be taken to, set these, to, to attain set targets. It is clear that a lot of hard work is needed to improve the performance of the department. The appointment of the HOD and CFO will play an important role but equally important is the need for the entire team of officials in the department to put their shoulders to the wheel and put in an extra effort to help turn the department around to a point where it becomes the shining star in the Gauteng provincial government. During the financial year under review, some of the following were achieved by the department amongst others. 7,821 jobs were created through the EPWP incentive grant. 2000 371 work opportunities were created through the Human Settlements Development Grant. 10,104 sites were serviced. 12,153 housing units were delivered. 7,696 title deeds were registered through the Deeds Office. 2,102 rental housing disputes were resolved by the Rental Housing Tribunal. 10 blocks of flats were maintained. 748 property units were devolved to municipalities. 96% of invoices received were fully paid within 30 days. These are just but a few of uh, some of the targets, uh, the achievements of the department. Um, and whilst we as the ANC welcome the above achievements, we are concerned that targets set are not being fully met. We would prefer a situation where targets set translate into targets met. Further, more needs to be done to ensure that the department is able to meet its targets in terms of procurement budget spent uh, on businesses owned by women, the youth and people with disabilities. During the year under review, considerable efforts have been placed on planning and the reorganising of processes that would enable the Department of Human Settlements to deliver quality housing to the peoples of Gauteng in an efficient and effective manner. As the ANC, we welcome the tough stance 
taken by MEC Maile in dealing with corruption and the emphasis being placed, um, being placed on consequence management, which has seen officials charged and in ins instances fired from their positions. We look forward to seeing progress on the upgrading of informal settlements, particularly with the appointment of the Gauteng Partnership Fund to, dis to focus on the upgrading of informal settlements in the Sedibeng and West Rand districts. The COVID-19 pandemic brought to the fore the conditions in informal settlements, particularly during the five-week lockdown, which started on 27 March 2020. Given that informal settlements are often very congested, with little space between dwellings, between dwellings, it was almost impossible for residents to remain constantly in their homes. It highlighted the need to urgently consider measures to improve the quality of life for residents in informal settlements. Whilst there were some interventions led by the National Minister of Human Settlements, we must not lose sight of the need to consider measures that could help improve the life of residents. More progress needs to be seen in the hostel redevelopment program and the maintenance of hostels. Recently, the Portfolio Committee visited the Denver and George Gough hostels, which require urgent attention and maintenance. The Department of Human Settle Settlements has not performed as it should in recent years, but we remain confident that the work undertaken in the 2019-2020 financial year and the development of a turnaround strategy will yield positive results going forward. We are not naive to think that poor performance will simply disappear by the waving of a magic wand. We know that with hard work and unrelenting effort and focus, the aspirations of the people of Gauteng will be met by this ANC government here in Gauteng. We have full confidence in the leadership of MEC Maile, together with the HOD, HOD Mbandra, and her team. Despite the challenges being faced by human settlements in Gauteng, we have many success stories to celebrate, such as, and I'll mention a few, the eradication of the Zevenfontein informal settlement, the development of Cosmo City, the, brick steel, the Brickfields development, just a few blocks here from the legislature, the electrification of the transit camp in Zanzreit, the Elijah Bahai mega city project in Mirafong, the Palm Ridge human settlements project in Ikuduleni, the Savannah city project in Sidibeng, the Chief Mahali Phase II housing project in Mahali City. Over one million housing opportunities, which includes over 771,000 housing units, have been delivered in Gauteng since the, the dawn of democracy. These are just a few to name, and there are many more. So much more remains to be done to bring us closer to the achievement of the Freedom Charter. Together with the ANC, we will achieve the changes as set out in the Freedom Charter. Whilst we have seen housing developments in Cliptown, areas around Cliptown, such as Blamini, are still in urgent need of housing. The Freedom Charter remains our inspiration and our strategic guide to realizing a better life and a South Africa that truly longs to all who live in it. On the 27th of March, 2020, just 40 days before the end of the financial year and five days before the start of the new financial year, South Africa went into lockdown due to COVID-19. We wish to pay tribute to the many officials who continue to work to ensure that human settlements delivery takes place despite placing themselves at risk. We also extend our sincere condolences to the families of those officials who succumbed to the COVID-19 virus. May their souls rest in peace. May God protect, bless and heal our country, South Africa. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Schumann. Now, Honorable Strat has opportunities to speak. Thank you, Chair of Chairs. The Department of Human Settlements in Gauteng is in perpetual decline. Systemic lack of capacitation, underperformance, and most notably, insignificant political or operational accountability have left I'm the department rudderless and floundering. This scenario has manifested itself in institutionalised underspending, underreporting, and the failure to complete projects. Regular changes in middle and senior management prevents the department from making any sustainable progress in delivering its core mandate as directed in sections 10 and 26 of the Constitution. The introduction of the promised turnaround strategy has little chance of succeeding whilst the MEC fails to adequately 
identify the issues and hold officials accountable. The health of the department has steadily weakened since 2014, its greatest ill being its inability to spend its grants and budget allocations, resulting in the return of nearly two billion rand to the National Treasury in the last three years. Ever since 2014, I've had the opportunity to test the performance of the Gauteng Human Settlements Department under the leadership of successive MECs. This by measuring such performance against the constitutional obligations which the department needs to comply with and to utilize previous performance as a yardstick for improvement and success. I regret to inform this House that the department has been in accelerated decline for the last seven years, with little indication that positive change is imminent. One of the Gauteng Department's primary goals is promote and facilitate the provision of adequate housing in the province. It is very apparent from the annual report that the Gauteng Department has no effective and workable plan to ascertain what the problems are that exist, to measure the extent of the intervention necessary to put in place rectification and under the necessary measures to deal with the challenges, to effectively prioritize and utilize the funds available in a responsible manner, or to implement and monitor the intended rectification programs. Although more than 1.5 million homes have been provided since 1994, two million are still required, and the number of informal settlements have more than doubled since 1996, with a number now in excess of 1,000 in Gauteng. On an overall assessment, the following challenges preventing service delivery are, are evident. A very unsatisfactory practice has gained momentum in the last few years where projects are left vacant, abandoned, and unfinished by contractors, resulting in massive plundering and theft, not only of windows and doors, but brick and mortar and foundations, resulting in huge financial losses the department and the taxpayer. The department has indicated that there are more than 300 unfinished projects in Gauteng. No implemental solution has been received by the department to present a reliable and sustainable plan to solve this problem. The condition of most hostels in the province, including the Medala and Women's Hostel in Alexandra, the Watfall Hostel in Ekuleni, and the Dip Flute Hostel in Soweto are examples of complete neglect and an uncaring government. The department continues to fail to carry out any upgrading or maintenance with no accountability for non-performance. Despite promises being made from year to year, these hostels continue to deteriorate to the point where living conditions are inhumane and degrading. The state of disrepair continues to perpetuate a human crisis where conditions are appalling and sanitation is almost non-existent. The need for level three accreditation to our municipalities in Gauteng remains a priority. For as long as the powers that wield funding in the province remain with the provincial government, our metros in Gauteng remain undercapacitated and subject to arbitrary restrictions being imposed on them by the provincial government. This is preventing the rollout of much needed new developments. The failure to find a solution to the continual strain placed on those living on informal settlements due to the undercapacitated infrastructure caused by massive in-migration and the shortage of funds is indicative of administration with no plans or ideas to provide a solution to this problem. Although the MEC has indicated on more than one occasion the department's in intention to introduce the process of formalization of informal settlements, no tangible progress has been made with in situ upgrading, which is a precursor to formalization. The failure to find a solution to this challenge will perpetuate the increase of informal settlements. With COVID-19 forced upon us, it was hoped that the intended de-densification program would introduce a period of relaxation of overcrowding and better living conditions. Regrettably, very little has transpired with the relocation programs or any sustainable relocation of home dwellers. In 2014, the introduction of mega projects by the Premier was foreseen as a panacea towards the reduction of huge backlog in housing delivery by the department. None of the intended targets have been achieved. There's further inability of the department to deliver, deliver its target handing over service stands to beneficiaries due to failures in planning and alleged operational reasons. Despite war being cleared by the Premier and MEC against land invasions, no effective plan has been found to deal with and prevent the invasions or the provision of housing for home seekers themselves. The inability to deal with this issue will perpetuate civil unrest and accelerated land grabs. The systemic underspending by the department in almost all projects is a stark indication of how dysfunctional the department is. 
The fact that there's no operational accountability for, for this betrayal to our citizens is most telling. There's also further uncertainty regarding the late allocation of 100 million rand to the human settlements to budget without the necessary explanation being given. We await more particulars in this regard. But the inability of the provincial government to accelerate the delivery of long-awaited title deeds continues to fuel dissatisfaction and frustration in areas where security of tenure was promised. Very little progress has been made in accelerating this progress process. Progress with the delivery of improved living conditions in the urban renewal projects for the residents of Beckerdahl, Winterfeld, and Alexandra remains slow and erratic. Regarding Alexandra, I've on three occasions in this House appealed to the Premier to find a solution to resolve the impasse created by the court interdict in place since 2005 and the failure to implement the statement of intent due to the inability to procure the required funding. This project, once the intended example of, of how we as a nation would uplift the living conditions of our poorest citizens has become a huge disappointment and embarrassment. On your Premier and MEC, surely you can do better. In a recent Human Settlements Committee workshop, the MEC was challenged to indicate how the turnaround strategy with regard to the completion of projects would be implemented. The MEC accepted the challenge and we wait is to plan together with the timelines. Madam Speaker, further point of concern of more than 1.25 million households in Kalkten who live in backyard or secondary dwelling units. It must be an urgent imperative that alternative accommodation be found to relieve the pressure on the crowded living conditions caused by immigration and the difficulties caused by informality of shack and secondary dwellers. The lack of commitment, discipline, accountability and diligence within the department, particularly with regard to the failure to reach targets, will cause the rapid decline of service delivery and accelerate the future ability and uh, credibility of the department. As with previous annual reports, it is lacking in imagination, failing in policy implementation, its priorities confused and contains little vision or planning. Thank you. The MEC to respond to the debate. Uh, MEC Mutara. Thank you very much. On behalf of MEC Maile, uh, allow me to present the following remarks. Madam Speaker, Deputy Speaker, Honorable Premier, Honorable Colleagues in the Executive, Honorable Members, Members of the Media, Ladies and Gentlemen. In his critically acclaimed poem, Ngobas Sewuti, Just Because, well-known South African poet, author and intellectual, B.W. Bulakazi, the first black South African to receive a PhD and after whom Bulakazi Street in Soweto is named, describes the harsh living conditions black laborers live in under a migrant labor, labor system that puts them in labor dormitories, otherwise known as townships, in rapidly urbanizing cities that are designed to serve the interests of the capitalist class without in any way taking into account the humanity and dignity of its labor force. And I quote, just because I seem to you a simpleton, knocked over by plain ignorance and the laws beyond my understanding, except maybe that they rob me and the house I built for myself under the hang of the rock, a hut of grass for my home, my clothing, an empty sack. You think I'm just an ant heap and not one tear have I in me to drip out from my own heart and run over the pure hands of the souls who see all." Close quote. On whom members, Belakazi's words are a poignant reminder to us of the spatial inequality and injustice that pervades our rapidly urbanizing cities and of the importance of spatial transformation in the pursuit of socio-economic transformation and equality. Belakazi, an, Im an eminent South African luminary in the world of literature and education, who was a co-editor of the first Zulu English Dictionary and contributed so much to the development of the Zulu language and culture, as part of his overall contribution to the quest to build a united, democratic, prosperous South Africa, which celebrates its rich, diverse cultural and ethnic heritage as one nation, is also germane to us in this week, following the burial last week of the late Zulu King, His, Manage his Majesty Goodwill Zwelitini, and may his soul rest in peace. As we extend our condolences and support to our fellow South Africans, many of whom are found in this province, who are still in mourning. 
Finally, Madam Speaker, Vilakazi is relevant to us within our context of human settlements because he critiques and challenges the industrialization and urbanization which causes the black majority who make up most of the labor force to be reduced to living conditions that are subhuman as a faceless, soulless, anonymous class of beings that are on the periphery of mainstream life and activity in society. Having just celebrated Human Rights Day over the weekend, Velakazi's haunting words remind us of the need to restore human dignity and significance to the majority of the populace through a spatial transformation program that will grant them decent, affordable shelter that they can call their own, access to opportunities and amenities that will restore soulfulness to their daily existence. This is why what we do at Human Settlements is of great significance to our broader socioeconomic transformation agenda as a society. It is why the rate of delivery and performance of the Gauteng Department of Human Settlements over the years is highly unsatisfactory and unacceptable. The department has for years now been marred by a series of systemic, chronic challenges that have negatively impacted on the delivery of housing in the province. Honorable members, it is for this reason that during the year under review, the first year in office of the sixth administration and our first year within this critical portfolio, we developed a turnaround strategy for the department within six strategic pillars. The first governance, focusing on dealing with AG matters, fraud and corruption cases, and putting in place the necessary governance structures. Two, financial management, which includes supply chain management, contract management, and invoice payments. Three, integrated planning, human settlements, master plan, and aligning USDG and HSDG to deal with insufficient bulk infrastructure. Fourth was the program delivery, enhancing capacity to deliver and review the current model of delivery. Fifth, organizational realignment, the review of the current organizational structure and aligning it to the IDMS framework and change management. And lastly, technology and systems, which was refreshing ICT infrastructure and automation of processes. We started work on the development of the Gauteng, Gauteng Spatial Master Plan to produce a comprehensive provincial human settlements development plan, mainstreaming economic development and social cohesion. This plan was being developed in conjunction with municipalities and all relevant stakeholders who play a crit critical role in the development of human settlements in the province. Madam Speaker, through bilateral engagements, we look to strengthen integrated planning and implementation with sector departments for the rollout of socioeconomic amenities in our mega projects. Bulk infrastructure investment remains critical to support mega projects to deliver at scale and contribute towards spatial transformation. And in order to address this bottleneck, we looked at unlocking private sector investment through bulk infrastructure investment. We convened a developer sub summit where we made it clear that we would be reviewing the performance of each developer on a contract by contract basis, canceling the contracts of underperforming developers and giving more work to those who are indeed delivering in order to accelerate housing delivery. We also made it clear that we would be blacklisting all companies that do not deliver on contracts. Honorable members, we revived, reviewed, and upgraded the Urban Renewal Program blueprints with a view to upscaling our work in the five urban renewal nodes, and we set up intergovernmental, interdepartmental urban renewal program steering committees to ensure that all departments and tiers of government that have commitments within the urban renewal nodes can work in a coordinated, system systematic, and integrated manner in order to revitalize those urban renewal areas. We realigned our rapid land release program after doing some internal research and began a process of unlocking fully serviced stands to give out to qualifying beneficiaries under rapid land release. We developed a proactive intergovernmental counter land invasion strategy with various spheres and tiers of government as well as provincial departments involved in our efforts to prevent and counter land invasions. We explored legal options such as a blanket court order on all government-owned land earmarked for development in the province, and also granting power of attorney to municipalities where the land is located so that they can help us with evictions. Madam Speaker, we finalized our hospital, uh, sorry, our hostel redevelopment strategy and set aside funds and resources in order to help us not only redevelop our hostels and turn them into family units with novel sectional title ownership, but also to work on maintenance for hostels owned by the province within the Johannesburg CBD. We made plans and set things in motion to turn around the department's ethos and performance with the understanding that was so aptly captured by Albert Einstein when he said, and I quote, you can never solve a problem on the level on which it was created, close quote. 
Of course, in resolving problems and looking to turn things around in the department, we have experienced the same phenomenon as described by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, all progress is precarious and the solution of one problem brings us face to face with another problem. Precarious as the progress that we have made may seem with the resolution of a certain set of problems leading to new ones emerging. emerging. We are confident that we are on the right path and the department will be turned around to the point of becoming a center of housing delivery excellence, not just within the province, but the country as a whole. And I thank you. Um, thank you very much, Honorable uh, MEC. Well, now, uh, that will be the end of the debate. Secretary, please call the, the ninth order. Thank you, Honorable Chair of Chairs. Consideration of cooperative governance, traditional affairs and human settlement portfolio committee oversight report on the annual report of the Department of Human Settlement for the 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Chairperson, Diade, please present the committee report now. Thank you very much, Chair of Chairs. Like I initially introduced the team that I work with in the Portfolio Committee, honorable members in this house. On, on behalf of the Portfolio Committee on Human Settlements, I hereby table the Committee Oversight Report on the Gauteng Department of Human Settlement, annual report for the 2019-2020 financial year as follows. I also would like to request uh, honorable chair of chairs that members in this august house consider the parts that I'm not going to read in the report as read. The 2019-2020 fin financial year appropriation was 6 billion for the 2019-2020 across the department's four key programs and will also highlight how each contributed to the under expenditure in CAT. The department's total expenditure for the period ending on the 31st of March 2020 was 5.763 billion, which represent approximately 95% of the allocated funds. The underspending of 284 million translates into 5% of the total allocation. The department made an application of 106 million on the Human Settlement Development Grant, 82 million on the Title D Restoration Grant, and 14.8 million on Equitable Share. The Portfolio Committee noted that the Department of Human Settlement has shifted a total amount of 12.6 million through via means of funds across its programs to cover overspending and a compensation of employees, goods and services, transfers and subsidies, as well as it shifted a total amount of 45.7 million to cover overspending within the programs. The department expenditure per, pro per program was as follows in 2019-2020. On administration, which is program one, the final allocation was 620. 7 million. The total expenditure remains 589 million, which is 93% by the end of the financial year under review. This reflects an under expenditure amounting to 38,000. The department reported the under expenditure is as a result of vacant posts that were not filled as at the end of the financial year as well as the late receipt and dispute of invoices relating to rates and taxes on provincial assets. On program two, the allocation was 37 million. It is reported that the actual expenditure in CAT was 15 million, which is 39.9% reflecting an under expenditure amount to 22 million. The under, the under expenditure is as a result of vacant posts that were not filled at the end of the financial year. Program three on housing development, the voted allocation was 5.121 billion. It is reported that the actual expenditure in CAD was 4.9 billion, which is 
reflecting an under expenditure amount to, amounting to 1.138 million. The under expenditure on the Human Settlement Development Grant is as a result of claims being received after payment cutoff date. On program four, which is housing assets management and property management, the voted allocation was 260 million. It is reported that the actual expenditure incurred was 176 million, which is 67.6%, reflecting an under expenditure amounting to 84 million. The under expenditure on the target deeds restoration grant is as a result of the current process that involved too many role players. The department is currently reviewing its process to address, to address the delays in the issuance of the title deeds. The department's eight strategic goals and objectives are outlined and aligned at the program level. And these were achieved within the four key programs as, as outlined above. I'll not go through that shelf chest. During the year under review, which is the past financial year, the portfolio committee noted the department non financial and financial performances as follows. In terms of the payment of service providers, a total of 96% against 100% of fully compliant invoices received were paid within 30 days of receipt. Almost 80% of procurement budget targeted businesses are owned by local suppliers. 11% against 30% of procurement budget was paid to businesses owned by women. 2.4 against 20% of procurement budget was paid to businesses owned by youth. I think we need to zoom our eyes there. Our, while 1.5 against 5% of procurement budget was paid to businesses owned by people with disability, 96% against 100% of annual budget was spent, a total of 106 against 30,000 potential release opportunities investigated on state-owned land, thereby accounting for the annual target, a total of 2.5 thousand against 21,718 approved beneficiaries were allocated to available housing units, a total of 185 against a target of 220 youth were trained in bricklaying, clustering, and construction management, thereafter placed on site for experiential learning through the National Youth Service Brigade program. On a number of new, new properties transferred to qualifying beneficiaries throughout the past financial year, the annual target was to issue 7.5 title deeds. The department has reported sadly that they could only transfer eight, 898 new properties to qualifying beneficiaries during the financial year under review. A number of housing disputes adjudicated over by the housing tribunal, the ANAM. The annual target was 300 housing disputes to be adjudicated. It, it's certainly being reported that only 26 housing disputes were adjudicated by the tribunal. In terms of the number of rental housing disputes resolved by the rental housing tribunal by the end of the current, uh, current financial year, this target was partially achieved as 2.1, 2,102 rental housing disputes were resolved by the Rental Housing Tribunal against a plan target of 2,300. Our concerns as per this 2019-2020 uh, financial year report, in relation to the Housing Partnership Fund, the Portfolio Committee noted the irregular expenditure that was caused by an employee who committed fraud in the supply chain management unit. However, the department did not provide a report on action taken against the employee. Mem members will note that this is an old report, so there's progress in this regard. The portfolio committee noted that the Housing Partnership Fund Agency does not submit monthly or quarterly reports to the legislature. In relation to the fraud and corruption unit, the Portfolio Committee noted that the Department did not indicate the nature of cases resolved during the financial year 2019-2020. Portfolio Committee 
is also concerned with the level of capacity in the fraud and corruption unit of the department. The portfolio committee noted that the annual target on devolving 200 property units to municipalities, the actual output was 748, and the department did not report names of municipalities for oversight purposes. In relation to the number of housing disputes adjudicated over by the housing tribunal per annum, the annual target was 300. However, the department only um, resolved 26 housing disputes with no reason provided. The portfolio committee also noted the irregularities on housing allocation, Madam Chair of Chess. We therefore recommend the following that uh, the department should provide us with responses by the, by the 30th of April that the department and the agencies should provide disciplinary action that will be taken to correct the irregular expenditure caused by an employee who committed fraud in the supply chain management unit and the status of the criminal case. The department and the agency should submit quarterly reports to the committee to monitor progress made by the agency on a quarterly basis. In relation to fraud and corruption unit, the department should submit a report indicating the nature of cases resolved during the year 2019-2020. Where the investigations were not completed, the department should provide estimated period the investigations are anticipated to be completed. The department should fully capacitate the fraud and corruption unit um, in order to resolve all investigations. Move towards wrapping, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, I would therefore, um, Madam Chair of Chairs, uh, in terms of Rule 1172C, re read with Rule 164, the Portfolio Committee on Cost and Human Settlement present to this House the Committee Oversight Report of Human Settlement Annual Report for 2019-2020 for adoption, taking into account the concerns and proposed recommendations. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, <coughs> Honorable Chairperson. Is there a second? I rise to second. Thank you very much, Honorable Papa. And now put the question, all those in favor say yes. yes. All those not in favor yes. say no. The yes have it. The report is adopted. Uh, Secretary, please read the, the tenth order. Thank you, Honorable Chair of Chess. Debate on the annual report of the Department of Health for the 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable. Um, I'll now call, thank you very much, Secretary. I'll now call Honorable Masuku to please open the debate. Thank you, um, Honorable Speaker. Chair of Chairs. Oh, Honorable Chairs of Chairs. <laughs> Thanks for the good orientation. Um, and uh, Honorable Premier in his absentia, Honorable Chief Whip, members of the Executive Council, Honorable members of the Legislature, the citizens of Gauteng, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The Gauteng Department annual report debate for the financial year 2019-2020 takes place just two days after the country has commemorated Human Rights Day under the theme, the year of Charlotte McGregor promoting human rights in the age of COVID-19. It is important that we acknowledge the significance of this, what it means for the access to health care as a human right enshrined in the South African Constitution under Section 27, stating that, I quote, everyone has a right to have access to health care service, including reproductive health care, and that the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of each of these rights, close quote. As we debate the performance of the department in the past financial year, a year which was disrupted by a global pandemic, we need to remember that we have a long-term public health care reform agenda, the national health insurance. In fact, if anything, the pandemic has presented us with a perfect crisis, 
we need to accelerate and realize our goal to achieve the universal health coverage in our lifetime. After all, it is COVID-19 that ironically became an equalizer in terms of access and equality. The hospitalization purpose, it does not matter whether you are rich or poor, urban or rural, white or black, young or old, sick or healthy, whether you have a medical aid or not. When that time comes when you need health care, what really matters most is whether there is a bed for you anywhere in the system. That is the reality and that is a fact. That is the basis of solidarity under which the national health insurance will be based upon. Honorable chairs of chairs, more than ever before we are convinced that universal health coverage must happen in our lifetime. We have a perfect crisis in our hands and we must use it to improve healthcare services and ensure that every South African has a cover. We must not let this crisis go to waste. We should choose progress and reform rather than paralysis and despair. Considering that this is an election year, it is important that we also reflect on the reality that the people of Gauteng have still shown their support for the ANC. This support being inspired by the ANC manifesto, which captures the most real aspirations of South Africans. The, re the ANC remains committed to improve the quality of life of Gauteng citizens. To this end, the Gauteng Department of Health remains committed to the task to improve healthcare outcomes, much as this is a commitment for the current term. We also appreciate that we'll pursue our goals in changing in the, this difficult environment due to COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has affected all facets of life, not at least the economy, governance, lifestyles, and values. For this um, reason, we continue to believe in and implement our risk-adjustable strategy, the six-pillar COVID comprehensive response plan as led by the Premier and the President National. The ANC 2019 manifesto tasked the department to do the following. One, improve patient experience, continue to focus on improving health promotions, achieve universal health care coverage through NHI, roll out, improve health infrastructure and capacity, improve clinical services, and reduce the quadruple burden of disease. Honorable Speaker and Honorable Chairs of Chairs, the department captures all this task in its mission statement, which says that the government will create an effective public health system in Gauteng by ensuring we have the right people, skills, systems, and equipment to provide the health services to our citizens need to live healthy and achieve quality lives. During this reporting year, although we achieved a great deal of progress, we have also suffered some setbacks in areas such as maternal, child and women's health, HIV, AIDS, STIs and TBK, disease prevention and control, forensic pathology services, particularly in the last quarter of the financial year, which saw the emergence of the pandemic leading to the disruption of many of the plans of the department. Effectively, the pandemic hit us at the crucial time when we were officially transitioning from the fifth and the sixth term of government. On the strategic goal number one, on improve, improving maternal and infant, infant and child health and well-being, the plan of the ANC-led government and the Department Recovery Program continue to show progress in the resilience of the department, under the, particularly in the year under the review. There's been a year-on-year -year continuous reduction in HIV transmission of mother to child, which has been kept below 1%. This good progress is realized because the department put 97% of all HIV-positive pregnant mothers on antiretroviral treatment and continue to encourage early antenatal uh, care, particularly the ANC bookings. Despite the emergence of the pandemic, which saw most healthcare services getting affected negatively, the case fatality due to severe acute malnutrition, diarrhea, and pneumonia amongst children under five were maintained below acceptable threshold of 7.4%, 2.2%, and 3.4% respectively. The neonatal mortality rate declined by 5% in 2019-2020, 
compared to 2018-2019, and it was maintained below 13 per 100 per 1,000 live births. At the time, at the same time, the, the maternal mortality rate was reduced by 16% in 2019-2020. However, it remains out of reach for the province. We must urge the department to focus and address some of these areas concerned through the work of the clinical governance teams of neonatologists, district clinical specialist teams, and obstetric gynecology specialists to ensure that the maternal child health goals are attained. Strategic goal number two, reducing rate of new infections and burden of HIV and AIDS and TB. There's no doubt that there's good progress has been made in this area in the prevention of mother to child. However, there are areas of concern which HIV programs will still require to pay, to pay special attention to in order to ensure that we are attain 1990-90 goals. During the year under review, the department significantly exceeded the target's number of clients to be tested for HIV as a result of additional over 1 million patients were tested for HIV as compared to the previous financial year. The department managed to retain over 1 million patients on ART and additional 97,000 patients were retained in 2019-2020. On TB, approximately 4.9 million people were screened for TB as a driving factor for finding missing TB cases in order to achieve the first 90 of, ni of the TB 1990 strategy. The percentage of TB clients five, five years and older started on treatment was 95.2%, exceeding 90% annual target. However, more still needs to be done by the department to ensure that all TB clients started on treatment are successfully treated towards the realization of the last 90 of the strategy. The TB HIV co-infection rate still remains considerably high we, as we experience a decline of 27% in ART initiation amongst TB HIV co-infection clients as compared to 2018-2019. The proportion of high loss to follow up and difficulty in tracing and retaining patients on, treat, on treatment continues to be a risk factor affecting the treatment success amongst drug-resistant TB and is being addressed by, among other things, intensifying the implementation of the short-term regimen. Reducing the burden of disease health lifestyle promotion, the strategy goal number three. To reduce rising patterns of non-communicable diseases, the department conducted a health promotion and health lifestyle outreach activities on health education about physical activities. Good nutrition, safe sexual behavior, avoiding tobacco use and substance use, effective stress management in a wide range of settings, including schools, clinics, churches, churches, taverns, and workplaces, in, addi in addition to health promotion activities, we are able to get over 2 million uh, clients aged over, 40, aged over uh, 40 years and older who are screened for diabetes and hypertension, respectively. In increasing the equality, equal and timely access to efficient quality healthcare services and NHI readiness, the department platforms remain resilient and committed to serving the people of Gauteng. During 2019-20, the department was able to provide health care services to approximately 28.2 million people who visited our facilities seeking primary health care and those who were assisted in emergency and outpatient departments. There's about 520,000 additional patients we have visited were catered for during the year under review. More patient visits were seen in primary health care services which is a good proxy in the, of indication of success of the realization of the primary health care reengineering goal. Access to good quality health care services is a cornerstone of successful health care system. The department maintains its commitment in providing quality health care services to communities through the increased access care, and they've been able to create 781 functional, fully fleshed, ward based outreach teams were established and supported to provide community-based healthcare service in the province. 
The department has further increased access to healthcare services through its integrated school health program and a total of 198,000 learners were screened for various health-related conditions which have a potential to impact negatively. More work has to be done to improve the quality of care through the implementation and monitoring of the national norms and standards. The department ensured the, that we adhered, that our facilities adhere to these standards. We need to manage to obtain ideal clinic status in 334 facilities and this is a good outcome that we were expecting. The annual patient experience care survey conducted for the year 2019-2020 maintained that 82% performance, uh, performance that did not differ significantly from the year before the year in review. It's important that we continue the strategic goal number five, that excellence in clinical and and support functions. The collection of revenue by hospital has been intensified, and this is demonstrated by a significant excess of 134 million collected in 2019-2020. The department states that the excess is attributed to the fact that Mpumalanga province fulfilled its commitment to pay nine million towards its outstanding medical uh, accounts. We, re we remain alive to the various challenges that continue to confront the department in their endeavor to, to deliver quality health care service to the people of Gauteng. The filling of critical vacant senior management position within this financial year needs to remain a priority. This includes the filling positions such as the chief executive officer, the chief executive officers of, uh, officers of the emergency medical services, and all the other six hospitals which have, have got uh, vacancies at the CEO level. This also includes the appointment, a speedy appointment of the head of department. In conclusion, the reality is that at the end of 2019-2020 financial year, the country was hit by the emergence of COVID-19 pandemic, which impacted negatively on the implementation of the strategic intervention remains. Despite the major disruption that COVID-19 had on various health programs, the Department of Health have displayed much dedication, resilience, and commitment to ensuring that the essential health care services are delivered to the people. To the start of the rollout of the COVID vaccine has certainly brought about great sense of relief, hope, and encouragement for thousands of the healthcare workers that have actually sacrificed their lives and their families to be in the forefront. In conclusion, uh, Madam Chairs of Chairs, we want to say that the Gauteng Health Department is too big to fail. It is an engine of the healthcare services in the SADC region, as different political parties we have a lot to disagree about. But I believe that we are all agree that this is a national and public interest to ensure that Gauteng Health succeeds. We're probably going to enter the third wave of the pandemic now in winter. It will still be incredibly difficult, but not impossible to achieve our strategic goals we will continue to forge a national front of unity amongst our people. We'll continue to protect and advance the interest of our frontline workers. We'll continue with our comprehensive health response. Once more, we thank our frontline healthcare workers who continue to inspire our nation. We also bow our heads in honor of those who have died in the line of duty. Let us succeed at all costs so that the lives and contributions are not in vain. We are also thankful of the people of Gauteng for their support, criticism, and encouragement in the financial year. Finally, we convey our gratitude to the ANC-led government for its inspirational and visionary leadership in the past year. More work still needs to be done to achieve better much. health outcomes. We dare not fail. Let us not continue to grow Gauteng together. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much, Honorable Masuku. I'll now call uh, Honorable Jay Bloom to present his debate. Thank you, uh, Madam, Madam Acting Chair, Chair of Chairs. Uh, this is the 27th time that I'm speaking on the annual report of the Gauteng Health Department. Uh, so I, I know what to compare it with. Uh, but this report covers the period. I mean, it's actually a, a history. I don't want to say ancient history, but it is quite a long time ago, and it seems to be 
a very long time ago. It covers a period from April 2019 to March 2020, so it is virtually all this terrible calamity of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, what we had is a health system that was already under strain with huge backlogs, and I'm afraid I think it was ill-prepared in many ways for the new health threat. We will see the outcome in the next annual report, but in this report, 103 out of 159 targets were achieved. This is 65%, which is a marginal increase from 63% the year before. Uh, unfortunately, there are distressing failures in key areas. This department used to boast 100% immunization coverage. I thought it was marvelous. In fact, they, they used to say it was 105% because there were extra from, from out the country. But the immunization coverage under one years old was 87% compared to the target of 98%, and the measles second dose coverage was only 80%. It, it really makes me worry how the mass antivirus vaccinations for adults that we need uh, will proceed when we are falling behind with ordinary child vaccinations. Now, another worry is that the biggest disease killer in South Africa is still tuberculosis. But the TB treatment success rate went down from 82%, uh, went down to 82% from 84% of the previous year. It should be going up, not down, and who knows what's happened over this last period. We've got huge backlogs to make up here. And uh, the target was 80% for TB patients co-infected with HIV AIDS to get a ARV treatment and instead of 80%, instead of 90%, sorry, I can't read, instead of the target of 90%, uh, only 62% uh, got ARV treatment. Uh, another, another bad statistic is 9.4% of TB patients were lost to follow up compared to the target of 5.5%, and the TB multi-drug resistant treatment success rate was 55% compared to the target of 60%. So uh, TB, we were, not doing so well before, and uh, I can't see that it's improved over this period. We're going to have a lot to do to catch up there. But I'm also distressed at the continuing failure to provide 100% vital and essential medicines, as there was only 95.5% availability. They're called vital and essential medicines because they actually are vital and essential. Uh, really, it should be as close to 100% as possible. And, and the people who suffer really hard is psychiatric patients because they can't just readily be switched to another medication. Uh, they, they got used to one and, and now you know, they might have to be switched to another one. And uh, an important indicator that is missing from the annual report is the number of patients on the waiting list for surgery and the average length of time they wait for operations. The former MEC for Health promised that this indicator would be included in the future, so I hope it is in the next report. I'm very concerned that the surgery backlogs have surged because of the cancellation of much elective surgery during this pandemic. It was unavoidable. You had to clear the beds for, for the COVID-19 patients, but we were already starting from a situation where you could wait three to five years for a, for a hip operation at Chris Harney Barragan Hospital. I, I don't even want to think what the waiting time will be now. Uh, so I, I think we need to know the extent of the backlogs and what special measures are taken to reduce them. Uh, I get heart-rending appeals, I'm sure other people in this field get as well, for people who can't see because of cataracts, they need a hip operation to walk, or even a cancer operation that's been delayed. I know they've tried to keep cancer, oper cancer uh, treatment going, but sometimes it's unavoidable. They, they don't have the beds to do, to do an immediate uh, uh, surgery. Uh, so, you know, surgery lists were already unacceptably long. I hate to think what they are now. The extra staff that have been hired because of the epidemic will hopefully assist in speedily reducing these backlogs. But I think they need to bring in the private health sector uh, on a contract basis. Uh, Netcare actually does a contract work for the National Health Service in, in uh, the United Kingdom. Why can't they and other companies here be contracted to do the same here? Just because we're going to have horrendous backlogs that we've got to cut in the shortest time possible. Now, the root of the problem in this department is poor management leads to gross inefficiencies and allows corruption to flourish, as we have seen with the PPE scandal. Uh, Madam Chair of Chairs, 
It is nearly seven years since the Honorable Premier promised in his, inaug in his inaugural address that there would be, quote, an urgent turnaround in the Gauteng Health Department. You know, I'd like to see this urgent turnaround, but every year the Auditor General identifies a lack of controls and every year nothing much is done to fix it. And I, I really want to say that it's absolutely vital that a health information system is finally implemented. I was in this house more than 20 years ago when the very first health MEC, Amos Masondo, promised uh, that we would have a health information system. And every subsequent MEC promised it as well. And there's now a court case about a 1.2 billion rand contract awarded to former health MEC Brian Klongwa's tenure for a health information system that should have been up and running 10 years ago. Honestly, if it wasn't for corruption, we could have had this health information system. Now, in the last five years, this department has had four health MECs, two heads of department, and now a plethora of senior acting positions waiting to be filled. I want to say that the Honourable Health MEC has inherited a real mess. My advice to her is to try and get at least this one thing right. None of your predecessors could do it, but can you get a functioning health system so that you can properly assess where money is being spent Otherwise, you're largely flying blind. You need to know what, what, what's costing you, and we need computers. We're in the 21st century now. Uh, from the patient point of view, the paper files that lead to long queues and often get lost should finally, finally become history. But unfortunately, according to this annual report, zero hospitals have implemented the integrated health information system compared to the target of 100%. That was the target, 100%, zero. Zero hospitals had electronic health records linked to the Provincial Health Clinical Data Repository instead of the targeted 37 hospitals, another zero. And zero primary health care facilities had electronic health records linked to the Provincial Health Clinical Data Repository instead of the targeted 48% of facilities. So we have, it's a zero, a zero, and a zero in a vitally important area. And, and, you know, the tragedy is that there's lots of budget to spend, but the spending is inefficient and it's often directed to the wrong areas. The Auditor General identifies irregular expenditure of 2.3 billion rand for the year under review, and fruitless and wasteful expenditure was to 9.3 million, largely due to interest accrued from litigation. Now, can you believe it? There was a total underspend of 905 million. 905 million is, is real money. Uh, of which 698 million was surrendered back to the revenue fund. Can you believe it? Nearly 700 million rand was actually sent back to Treasury. The needs are so great, but a sizable amount of money is not spent. Now, every year the audit, uh, the audit committee identifies the same 22 key strategic risks. These risks include the following. Inadequate access to quality health services for mental health patients. Can you imagine? We're still saying this... Uh, years after the life of Sedimeni disaster. Increase in maternal, newborn, infant and child morbidity, mortality. High death rate due to increase in the number of HIV and TB infections. Financial losses due to litigation. Listen to this one, fraud and corruption. Every year it's a risk. Aging infrastructure and health technology. Shortages in pharmaceutical supplies. Inadequate human capital management. Serious adverse events. Now there's the others, I'm not reading out the full 22, but these risks really need to be minimized as soon as possible. The Honorable Masuku talked about uh, the opportunities for an NHR. Well, I really think that, frankly, unless the state gets uh, its act together, an NHR a functioning national health system is as far away as ever. Um, it really uh, needs to do far better before we can get uh, anything like uh, what is needed for a national health system. Um, and uh, I do agree with the Honourable Suku, the Gauteng Health Department needs to succeed, uh, it has been observed. This is the largest health system in Africa, we've got to get it right. Now, the Honourable new MEC, I think, has the opportunity of filling all these senior vacant posts with top class incorruptible people. I'm going to repeat it. This time round, you must get top class incorruptible people, no more cadre deployment. That must be history. People mustn't be there because they're friend of a friend. Uh, they must be there because they can do the job. And uh, whoever's best to do it, they must be appointed. Now, the Honourable Premier 
appointed a high-level intervention team in November 2017, look how long ago that is, to fix the deep-rooted problems in the department. It had very good people, this intervention team. It had Professor Craig Howson, the former head of the Western Cape Health Department, and many other good people. A and they actually made good recommendations, but they were not implemented. What did we hear last year in December? Another intervention team uh, was appointed by the Honorable Premier. Now, I'm sure this latest intervention team will make very good in, uh, uh, recommendations, but they will fail again unless you have the right people in the right jobs and they, need to, and they are able to do what needs to be done without fear of favour. So, Madam NEC, I've, I really felt for you when you were appointed in December in the middle of an epidemic, apart from all the other problems. You have a huge job on your hands and uh, we do need the department to succeed. So I, I want to say to you today that I hope you're prepared to be tough and you must take on all the entrenched interests in your department. There are some very entrenched interests there and you're going to have to take them on. If you do this, Madam MEC, I think that future annual reports will look a lot better than this one. Thank you. Uh, I now call Honourable Mobala to join the debate. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair of Chairs, the findings of the Auditor General indicates that the Houghton Department of Health has underspent by 905 million and 156,000 of the total appropriation for the fin financial year under review. Considering that the department has been facing many challenges over the years, underspending by almost 1 billion is a disservice to the people of Houghton more especially the poor and marginalized, who utilize public health care on a daily basis. Goods and services with a transaction value below 500,000 were procured without obtaining the required price quotations as required by Treasury regulations. Furthermore, goods and services with a transaction of above 500,000 were procured again without inviting competitive bids as required by Treasury regulations. Madam Chair of Chairs, this similar non-compliance has been reported over the years by the Office of the AG, yet there is no consequence management. This clearly shows that the ANC government has institutionalized corruption over the years. For them, corruption is business as usual. Irregular expenditure for the year under review amounted to 2 billion 318 million and 994,000. This was mainly as a result of month-to-month -month security contracts and lack of a contract for cardio and nuclear consignment stock items. When the EFF provided superior logic and say in-source security guards, you rejected our superior logic. And now 2.3 billion has been paid to the elite tenderpreneurs. This 2.3 billion could have, con could have created full-time jobs for thousands of security guards. Once again, uh, Madam Chair, Chair of Chess, fruitless and wasteful, wasteful expenditure amounted to 9,353,000 for the year under review, largely due to interest accrued from litigations. Chair of Chess, the AG's office was unable to perform information verification on district health services program due to insufficient appropriate evidence being provided by the department in order to support the reported information. Now, one will ask, what is it that the department is hiding from the AG and the people of Haute? The EFF uh, seventh cardinal pillar advocates for accountability and transparency at all times in order to achieve clean governance. Maybe the MEC should also, once again, we are providing superior logic. Maybe you should consider our superior logic so that your, 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 your department can have clean governance. A number of women occupying senior management positions declined by 2.2% in the year under review. The department has once again failed the women of Gauteng, Madam Chair of Chess by not going out there to headhunt these women, more especially 
black women who are qualified for these senior positions. If these senior positions were tenders, they would have been long filled because the ANC specialized in corruption left, right, and center. The decline in male and female condom distribution due to irregular supply is a typical example of an uncaring government. I mean, are you saying that our people now should not use protection when they, 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 they indulge in uh, the deeds? The EFF calls on the department to fix this problem of condom distribution, ASAP. And whilst there, they must also provide free sanitary towels. The department pride itself that there are 32 CHCs providing a 24-hour service. Madam Chair of Chess, this number is not adequate enough for the population of Gauté. Why is it so difficult, MEC, that your department, like your department to have ward-based ward clinics operating 24 hours to service our people? Once again, superior logic, the EFF calls on your department to build ward-based clinic and open them 24 hours, seven days a week. And MEC, it is not true that 90% of the hospitals in Gauteng complies with the provincial waiting times benchmark of 120 minutes for their outpatients from point of entry. Our people, they wait hours and hours to get medical help, which signi signifies underperformance in the department that remains addressed. I thank you, Madam Chair of Chess. The remaining minutes, can you please uh, carry them over? We're going to utilize them and teach this side of the uh, thank house you very much, how to member. run a clean government. Thank you. King, can you thank you very much? This department has always been important in relation to human rights and the protection of the infirm. But during COVID-19, this department's importance has increased manifold. Therefore, it is the utmost importance that all aspects of the Department of Health run smoothly. It is therefore a positive sign that the department received an, un, an unqualified audit report for the year under review. However, it is disconcerting that 2% of the allocated budget was not spent. Given the importance of this department and the effect it has on human lives, every cent not spent correctly impacts on a life. It is also unfortunate that the achievement of an unqualified report will most certainly not be repeated in 2020-2021 financial year due to the impossible, irresponsible COVID-19 tender irregularities and fraud. We are hopeful that the SIU will soon finalize its investigation so that one can understand the true scale of this brazen act of selfishness in a time of great crisis and need. It is noteworthy that the Auditor General imposed a note of special emphasis on the 2019-2020 report in regards to deviations from the procurement process. The committee itself noted that these problems were already evident in the 2018-19 financial year, and thus even less remedial actions were used in 2019-20 to stem the, this tide of irregularity. This can only lead one to conclude that the, that the seeds of large-scale plundering that took place during the COVID-19 pandemic was already planted during the preceding years. If the system is not corrected early on, the irregular and illegal conduct will simply continue and escalate. Given the fact that so much work still needs to be done in this department to ensure that the health system can deliver humane and effective services to the public, against the background of poor service delivery in hospitals and clinics, this department must ensure that it is now getting its house in order. People's lives are at stake. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Member Dilang, uh, Honorable Fuchs. Uh, 
uh, Chair of Chairs, thank you very much. Uh, when one reads the annual report of the Department of Health, you will find yourself drowning in statistics. Now, the frustrating aspect of this is that from these statistics, one does not get a clear sense of the quality of health care dispensed to the citizens of Gauteng. It was this frustration, Chair, that motivated me to ask the former MEC, MEC for Health in a portfolio meeting as to how he could be satisfied with the quality of care provided by the department that he then led. His response, which was rather cynical, was that at least people are not dying in the streets. Now, this is something that I've thought about quite a lot since then. Despite a cover-up and a whitewash of the true state of the health department by this administration, surely those individuals responsible for oversight, both politicians and officials, know the true state of affairs. I don't think that the Premier is present, but if he was, I would ask him whether he ever wonders how far we are from a situation where people die on the streets. Or will he once again claim, as he did in the case of S.E. Imani, that he didn't know? Besides the actual quality of medical care, there are continuous complaints about the contemptuous and arrogant treatment of patients at our public health facilities. The attitude of the staff was something that the former MEC took seriously. And I appeal to the newly appointed MEC to put a mechanism in place to test this issue on an ongoing basis and to take steps to ensure that sick people are treated with dignity. I'm disappointed to say, Chair, that when it comes to health infrastructure, the department is hit by a double whammy. Not only is the health department's infrastructure budget put under pressure by a dysfunctional infrastructure development department that struggles to complete projects within time and budget, but in addition, the infrastructure officials in the health department do not hold DID to account. Whether this comes about as a result of honour amongst comrades, or it is because the officials don't give a damn about the wastage, since they are spending public money and not their own, is not clear. Either way, this must be remedied. The Department of Health is a large enterprise, and its scope of management control is such that it cannot be managed from the centre, that is, from head office. One is therefore aligned on the management at each of the facilities to provide oversight over their own facility and to resolve the day-to-day -day problems that arise. This is unfortunately not the case. Oversight visits to health facilities highlight many problems which beset hospitals and clinics. As a committee, we often wonder why the staff on site does not identify these issues and resolve them. We wonder whether this comes about as a result of a poor attitude, a lack of expertise, or a lack of consequence management by the department. By the way, this matter must be resolved or heads must roll. It is unconscionable, Chair, that we continue to expose our citizens to third-rate service delivery, especially where lives are at risk. To the Premier, I say that we are sick and tired of listening to the propaganda that you spew our turnaround strategies. The time has come to fix the rot, but we seriously doubt that you and your administration possess the expertise and skill to do so. And I say again, universal health coverage, yes, NHI, no. Thank you, Chair. Um, Honorable Mukherjee, is there a chance to respond to the debate, ma'am? Yeah, I think so. Mabunda, Chair. Oh, sorry, sir. my apologies. Honorable Mabunda. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair of Chairs. We are meeting here today, two days after the country commemorated Human Rights Day, which was commemorated this year under the theme, uh, the year of Talos Mateke promoting human rights in the age of COVID-19. It was Monday, 21st March, 1960, when apartheid police opened fire without an order on protesters in Shabbi and Langa townships whose only crime was to embark on a peaceful protest march against past laws. The apartheid police shot and killed 69 of the protesters, including eight women and 10 children, and left over 108 wounded, including 31 women and 19 children. Many of them, Madam uh, Chair of Chairs, were shot at the back as they tended to flee. 
it is important to mention here that the system was not only designed to treat our people as subhuman, but also to maim them like flies while denying the proper health care, which could have saved some of those who succumbed to their wounds and maybe prevented the intense psychological trauma and mental scars that the community still suffers fr from uh, to this day. Honorable members, I have already mentioned that this is the year of Charlotte Makeke. The African National Con Congress is celebrating 150 years of the birth of this liberation heroine and human rights campaigner who came to be known as the mother of black freedom in South Africa. She was an unconventional woman who contributed at the time when it was exceptionally hard for women to rise to the fore in the liberation politics and many other aspects of life. Yet she managed to break through these barriers and was known for her moral consistency, independence of judgment, and the courage to express her views in a distinguished role as a nurse, a political leader, a clergy, and a human rights campaigner and a teacher amongst other roles in ensuring universal access to health care as our goal as the ANC, who can we better emulate than this selfless heron who was trained as a profession, health care professional. Between 1994 and 2020, contrary to what others before me have said, life expectancy, infant mortality rate, uh, maternal mortality rate and under five mortality rate have been reduced. The Department of Health has, the Department of Health has been the provider of ARVs program in the country and serviced 84 percent of the country's public health needs. We have also eliminated polio and death uh, by uh, malnutrition. This is the work of the ANC government, and our people know it. As I mentioned earlier, that sometimes plans change before because of circumstances. But for us, service delivery as the goal does not change. The annual report shows areas that still require improvement in the department, and we are working on those areas as part of the ANC resolutions. Patient waiting times at our facilities the number of people with TB, HIV in, uh, infections on ART, local procurement, maternal deaths, the extension of what based outreach teams to monitor patients, treatment of malaria, treatment of multidrug resistant TB, all require more focused attention. But it is equally true that we are making good progress with positive results on these areas. The number of community health centers operating 24 hours has increased. Uh, I wish they had this in the Sharpeville in 1961. The number of people testing for HIV and starting ARTs has increased through our efforts. ANC visits has increased and related neonatal deaths have also decreased. Pneumonia deaths of children under five have also decreased. Cataract surgery have increased and happening in communities. These are not fairy tale stories, Madam Chair of Chess. They are real life stories of the service delivered by the Gauteng Department of Health wow. in the 2019-2020 year, in the middle of a devastating pandemic. We welcome the phasing out of national cost standards and the promulgation of the regulated norms and standards that saw the introduction of the ideal old hospital realization and maintenance framework tool intended to align the quality standards in health institutions. Uh, more work has been done to improve the quality of health care uh, through the implementation and monitoring of national norms and standards to ensure that norms and standards are adhered to in our health facilities, such that the province managed to obtain ideal, ideal clinic status in 334 facilities out of the 359 facilities that we were assessed. The number of, fac of facilities that obtained the ideal status increased without, I mean, with about four additional facilities obtained the ideal status in 2019-2020. The annual patient's experience in care survey conducted for the year 2019-2020 
maintained the 82% performance. 100% of primary health care centers facilities with integrated mental health services remained same in the two financial years, 2018, 19, and 1920. We have expanded the capacity of the public health system with 4,265 new functional beds and 4,992 posts created and filled between April 2020 and January 2021. Another 1,425 beds are in the final, final stages of being made functional and operational with additional staffing from the start of the new financial year. This is a significant long-term investment that will outlive the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Madam Chair of Chess, in preparation for the implementation of the NHI, the next five years will place more emphasis on preventative care and strengthening primary health care services. The starting point will be to ensure that all 32 community health centers in the province provide more than just 24-hour emergency and accident services, but also outpatient radiology, pharmaceutical, and maternity services. We are pleased to report that during this reporting period, access to health care has significantly improved through interventions such as provision of services by the 781 ward based outreach teams and maintenance of 24-hour primary health care services at 30 of the community health care centers. By the end of the financial year, all 32 CHCs were operating for 24 hours. The two facilities such as Zola CHC and Ebony Park were activated. Additional services provided not only help to improve access to medicine, but to decongest facilities through the provision of chronic medi medicine packages to stable chronic patients. By end of financial year, 72,721,350 uh, patients were enrolled on the centralized chronic medicine dispensing and distribution program. However, availability of vital and essential medicines above the 98% remained a challenge despite performance being above the national average of 90%. During the reporting period, the department conducted over 5 million HIV tests. The number of new clients treat treatment naive patients started on ART increased from 185,000 uh, to in the 2018-19 financial year to 207,360 uh, in the 2019-2020 financial year. It is worth mentioning that this would not have been possible without the support of the Operation Putuma program. The department interventions to prevent mother-to-child infections amongst newborns saw the rate of transmission kept below 1% at 0.71% in the year under review whilst the distribution of female condoms improved compared to the previous uh, year. Despite this achievement, more still needs to be done to address poor performance on medical male circumcisions and distribution of condoms to support prevention strategies for HIV transmission. Contract management and procurement processes also still need improvement. TB remains the number one killer disease in the country, and plans to have and plans have been put in place to reduce the burden of disease related to TB epidemics. 2019-2020 saw great achievement as 95% of TB uh, patients aged five years and older were, sta were started on TB treatment. This was a significant improvement from 84% achieved in the 2018-2019 financial year. We are happy to report that the goal of a long and healthy life is on track as indicated by the overall improved health outcomes across the provincial population with life expectancy of 64.38 years in 2020 and the crude death rate on the decline. Madam Chair of Chairs, during the reporting period, the department provided integrated school health services to over 70,000 learners across the province. The services include, included the deworming, immunization, eye care, addressing hearing and speech problems, oral health, administering the uh, tetanus 
diphtheria, vaccine and weight checking. The Gauteng Department of Health Emergency Medical Services has successfully provincialized the city of Joburg Emergency Management Services as part of improving quality of services and patient safety. The GDOH EMS service continued to perform above expectations. 82% of urban responses for P1 patients were under 15 minutes. The P1 rural response under 40 minutes remained at 100% for two financial years. And as I conclude, uh, COVID-19 has sharply reminded us a uh, brain drain in the health sector. The former President Tawombe spoke on this issue in, in August 2015, stating that it will be impossible to achieve the African dream of the continent with this high level of brain drain in Africa, and I quote, the number of skilled people and professionals our continent has lost over the decade is truly frightening since 1990. Africa lost 20,000 academic professionals who left the countries and 10% of highly skilled uh, information technology and finance professionals have also left the continent in recent, recent years. The ANC in Gauteng is also more concerned that many medical practitioners and healthcare workers have to work in another countries. And those who remain often prefer to work in big cities and private sector. And this leads to huge skill shortage in the public health sector. So part of what needs to be done is to promote patriotism and service to the country. Lastly, and most importantly, uh, Madam Chair of Chairs, is that South Africa needs pharmaceutical companies uh, commitment to the country as this will help keep brain drain and improve efficiency and cut cost as a better system of controlling medicine distribution to reduce cost and improve accessibility of this medicine to our people. Our goal as the ANC-led government is to improve patient care, clinical outcomes, meet the ideal clinic standards and prepare the health care system for the NHI. We can proudly say we are on track to realizing that goal. Uh, I thank you, uh, Madam Chair of Chairs. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Mabunda. I now call upon uh, Honorable Lemis Simokreti to respond to the debate. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Chair of Chair, Madam Speaker and Deputy Speaker, Honorable Premier, members of the Executive yeah. Council, Honorable Chief Whip of the Majority Party, members of the Provincial Legislature, people of Gauteng, Good afternoon. Honorable Chair of Chairs, let me start by indicating that the Department of Health has openly acknowledged its shortfalls and challenges emanating from its 2018-2019 annual report that was tabled previously in this house. We have outlined our annual performance plans and highlighted areas we have performed exceptionally well and stated those we have not uh, performed so well. Henceforth, we have engaged on substantial remedial interventions to address the Auditor General's findings, and this led to significant improvement on numerous areas. Let me then take this opportunity to outline those areas and to highlight mitigating factors put in place to deal with those performance indicators we have regressed on. Regarding the non-compliance of the 30-day payment, as a department, we are fully aware that adherence to the 30-day payment is crucial for the survival of the small and medium enterprises. Their cash flow sustainability is highly reliant on their clients making timers payment to keep them afloat and operational. We have therefore taken a decision that our management should perform strength analysis of the spending patterns of prior years to ensure that their budgeting takes into account fluctuations in, in seasonal uh, spending. This will enhance effective cash flow management in the department. In light of this, the department has completed the three-year payment plans 
for big suppliers and most of old debt in the department has therefore been cleared. This will subsequently ensure that there is more cash available to pay the current year transactions, therefore improving the 30-day 30 30-day com compliance. In addition, the department has refunded budget for non-negotiable items to ensure that they are paid on time. Our management must um, our management must and will improve the effectiveness of control measures to monitor the payments such that suppliers are paid within 30 days or less of the receipt of the invoice. This is done to avoid unnecessary, unnecessary interest being charged uh, on the late payment. The interest paid in mainly <clears throat> on medical legal cases since the department does not budget uh, for this item. Engagement are currently underway with Treasury to make funds available for medical legal claims. Negotiations are held with other suppliers uh, who want to charge the department interest and the, they are mostly concluded successfully. On relation to uh, reducing the historical balance of irregular expenditure, Honorable Chair of Chairs, the department has appointed an irregular expenditure condonation committee comprising of uh, four directors. The mandate of the committee is to review all irregular expenditure disclosed in the annual financial statement uh, of the year under review and request approval for condonation from the Gauteng Provincial Treasury. Regarding the department's uh, plan to prevent future irregular expenditure, the department have taken a decision to terminate all contracts that were irregular concluded in the past. The healthcare waste contract has been extended on a month-to-month -month basis. The specifications in relating to the process has been completed and the department is currently awaiting final probity report from the Gauteng Provincial Treasury to advertise. Once the tender has been concluded, there will be no irregular expenditure relating to medical waste. The, the consignment stock on orthopedic implants has not been extended as the department wanted to participate in the Western Cape contract. However, the request was declined. The specification has been completed and awaiting property auditor appointment from the Gauteng Provincial Treasury. The process is underway to finalize the drafting of the specifications regarding the consignment stock on cardiac consumables. The consignment stock uh, on nuclear medicine, the specification is completed and awaiting property auditor appointment from Gauteng Provincial Treasury. Once the various items relating to consignment stock is on tender, regular expenditure in this area will be eventually addressed. With regard to the nursing service, the specification is also completed and awaiting property auditor appointment from Gauteng Provincial Treasury. However, the department asked for a deviation which was granted and a new contract has been awarded for six months whilst the main tender is awaiting property process. Similarly, the department has strengthened the contract management unit to ensure that contracts are timelessly renewed in preventing extension of contracts. The department is equally conducting training to all departmental officials on elimination of irregular expenditure and compliance on supply chain management regulations and policies. The first training on elimination of irregular expenditure was conducted in March 2020. All confirmed cases of irregular expenditure are reported to Provincial Treasury, the Auditor General, BAC, Internal Control and Risk Management for investigation and subsequent implementation of consequence management. Chair of Chairs, the reality is that without consequence management of those employees that have deliberately flouted due processes, it means we are creating a free-for-all environment and it can lead to unwarranted uh, chaos. We need to build and maintain a strong administrative cred credibility for this government and set acceptable behavioral standards for officials. There must be accountability and where a wrong has been committed, appropriate actions must be taken to set the precedence. 
on accruals exceeding the budget, uh, Honorable Chair of Chess, the department have identified a need to review policy decisions within the health sector, assess policy gaps, and recommend for necessary amendments. Some of the policy matters have been escalated to the National Department of Health, and requests for additional funds have been made to provincial treasury to try and reduce the amount of accruals. In relation to ethics and fraud management, the department is engaged uh, in various uh, initiatives to fight persistent challenges of fraud and, and, and ethical conduct in our ranks. A panel discussion was convened on the 3rd of March this year on ethics and fraud management with oral health and dentistry, where the Health Professional Council of South Africa also participated together with the ethics officer of the department. Similarly, several engagements have, have also been held with Houting Provincial Treasury for fraud risk assessment and updating of the fraud prevention plan. The department had further engagement with the Department of Public Service and Administration regarding ethics management uh, of sessional doctors, dual appointments, and employees uh, doing business with the state. The department has reduced the number of employees doing business with the state from 267 to only one case, which is also being attended to, and this was confirmed by the guest audit. The department analyzed officials who were flagged for doing business with the state. Various challenges were identified as some officials did business prior to their appointments with the state, and others were sessional doctors, as I've already indicated. Subsequently, a committee was then formed to deal with, with each um, matters based on its own merit, and this led to a significant decrease in the number of officials that were flagged. The department presented to the new uh, um, system to DPSA on the 19th of March 2021, and further discussions will, will be held in the upcoming months. In phase two, the department will, will be removing all officials from the central supply chain data database. And the good thing about this uh, process, uh, Honorable Chair of Chairs, is that some of the officials have applied to be removed. Regarding the creating effective and efficient operational system, as the department, we need to invest our energy more in reviewing and creating effective system. The overriding impact of a system is that they can result into effective provision of service rendered by the department. Some of the structural flaws that led to the reoccurrence of irregularities are as a result of lack or ineffectiveness of the system. Effective systems assist to proactively address hurdles and bottlenecks, correct systems, save time, they avert problems, putting systems in place, can successfully deal with both small and big scale challenges, thus avoiding looming future problems. Ultimately, systems improve productivity and provision of quality service delivery. Honorable Chair of Chairs, we must note that there was an overall improvement of 3% from 63.1% in 2018-2019 to 64.8% in the 2019-20 financial year. Major service delivery priorities have been addressed in spite of the fact that in some of the areas we did not meet the intended target. In conclusion, uh, Honorable Chair of Chairs, on Sunday, the 21st of March, 2021, we celebrated the Human Rights Day as a historic moment that underpins the value of our democracy. This democratic principle is the driving force behind the Department of Health commitment to provide quality health care to our citizens. Mindful of the fact that this is a basic human right enshrined in the Constitution. The overwhelming majority of people in, the, in, in this country and our province are highly dependent on public health care facilities to access their right to health. Therefore, the department remains unfazed on its mandate to deliver health care within the overall context of upholding fundamental ethics of human rights. Madam Speaker, as I conclude, I would like to thank Honorable Masuku and Honorable Mabunda for putting 
the performance of the Department of Health in Gauteng in, into perspective uh, to the people of Gauteng. I thank you very much, Honorable Chair. So we are, no, we are no longer members of the committee. Wow. Well done. We are no longer members. You will thank them all the wrong time. Perspective. You will thank them. You put a, you put a wrong perspective. Thank you. You have worked yourself to London. Thanks, Your Chair. Secretary, please read the next order. Secretary, please read the next order. Secretary, please read the next order. Oh, okay. Secretary, please read the next order. Oh, okay. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Consid uh, consideration of the Health Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the Annual Report of the Department of Health for the 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable De Camela. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Chairperson of the Health Portfolio Committee, Dr. Rebecca Paradigamela, tables the committee's oversight report on the Houghton Department of Health annual report for the 2019-2020 financial year. The Portfolio Committee on Health presents its annual oversight report on the performance of the Houghton Department of Health for the financial year mentioned. The committee assessed the performance of the department based on their strategic outcome-oriented goals. The Auditor General's report was instrumental in guiding whether the department is accountable to the resources that were allocated during the financial year in question. For the financial year under review, the department received a total appropriation of 51 billion and the actual expenditure was 50 billion, uh, re resulting in 98% expenditure by the department. Um, while noting the concern raised by the Auditor General, the committee notes the improved performance on the HIV, AIDS, STI, and TB programs by exceeding the target of retaining 1 million patients on ART treatment. In addition, as part of the preventative measure of HIV transmission, more than 135 million male condoms and more than 4 million female condoms were distributed in the year under review. The department also succeeded in the initiative of dispensing chronic medicine at locations convenient to chronic patients. Access to the much needed chronic medicines contributed to great achievements with 721, 350 enrollment of chronic stable patients requiring chronic medications to the CCMDD program in the financial year under review. On achievements, Honorable Deputy Speaker, the following are the achievements by the department for the year under review. The unqualified audit opinion, which should demonstrate a move towards addressing governance and ensuring improved financial management. Achieve targets on the employment of people with disabilities is a great achievement. Year-on-year -year continuous reduction in the HIV transmission from a mother to child's transmission has been kept below 1% a positive PCR test. 97.4% of all HIV-positive pregnant mothers were put on ARVs, and early antenatal care bookings are continuously encouraged. Severe acute malnutrition, diarrhea, and pneumonia amongst children under five years were maintained below acceptable thresholds of less than 7.4% and less than 2.2% and also less than 3.4% respectively. Exceeded the target number of clients to be tested for HIV. 
As a result, an additional 1,920,000 patients were tested for HIV as compared to the previous financial year. Retained over a 1 million patients on ART treatment, an additional 97,507 patients were retained in 2019-2020 financial year. Honorable Deputy uh, Speaker, let me also request that parts of the report that will not be read in this House be considered as read. A approximately 4 million people were screened for TB as a driving factor for finding missing TB cases in order to achieve the first TB 1990-90 strategy. Percentage of TB clients five years and older started on TB treatment was 95.2%, exceeding the 90% annual target. 721 enrollment I have already mentioned. The annual target was 600,000, but 721, 350 were enrolled. Access to care increased through the 781 functional fully fledged ward based outreach teams established to provide community based health services in the province were realized. The services rendered by these 781 teams amounts to 3 million individuals which were reached in our communities in the province. The province managed to obtain ideal clinic status in 334 facilities out of 359, making 93% facilities that were reached or accessed. The collection of revenue by hospitals was intensified, and this is demonstrated by a significant excess of 134 million collected during this financial year of 2019 and 2020. The number of community health centers that are providing 24-hour services increased from 30 in 2018 and 19 financial year to 32 CAC during this financial year under review. Cervical cancer screening coverage among 30 years and older improved by 11% in this financial year compared to 52% in the previous uh, financial year. The current cataract surgery performed increased from 957 to 12,000 in 2019-2020 financial year. Uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, uh, I just want to quickly scroll to another page so that I can inform this House uh, about the oversight work done by our committee, uh, which is having eight programs uh, that are, they are dealing with uh, throughout the year. Uh, I, I will be there just now. <laughs> yeah, the proposed committee recommendation. The committee recommends that the department should provide detailed progress report by the 30th of April 2021 on the following. Number one, plans to ensure proper spending in alignment with the set targets across all programs of the department. Strategies to ensure consequence management on the persons responsible for the non-adherence with uh, SCM policies and procedures when procuring goods as required by the Treasury regulations. Uh, strategies to be implemented in order to ensure compliance of contractual obligations and money owed being settled within 30 days. Strategies to be implemented in order to avoid irregular expenditure and management and the sourcing of proper approval from provincial Treasury. Uh, the reasons why appropriate evidence could not be provided to the AG for information verification on district health services. The action plan on the implementation of the health information system on health facilities with targeted timelines. These are imperative for the committee. Strategies to be put in place to ensure the appointment of women in senior management position as per the set target. The remedial actions that will ensure the contractual performance of the service provider responsible for the supply of condom. 
and strategies to strengthen partnership with the National Department of Health and private providers for an improved delivery of the vaccine supply. Lastly, the strategies to strengthen partnership with the Department of National Department of Health on the medicines delivery and availability. Honorable Deputy Speaker, uh, the chairperson wishes to thank the Honorable MEC for Health, Dr. Mukherjee, and the team led by acting HOD, Mr. Lisiba Malotana, for the preparation of the annual report and the efforts made in taking the committee through the details of the report and responding to questions raised by the honorable members of the committee. The chairperson standing here presenting this report appreciate the role of the committee members of health a portfolio committee for their dedication and commitment. Those members are El Lasindwa, B. Mabunda, B. Masuku, J. Bloom, A. Fuchs, C. Mabala, A. Tival, Alberts, and M. Ghana. I would like also to acknowledge the support staff uh, with the lead, led by Group Committee Coordinator Z. Panchwambalo, Senior Researcher S. Ninueli, Senior Committee Coordinator N. Gidi, Researcher Dr. M. D. Mukonoto, the Committee Coordinator Ms. N. August, Committee Administrator Ms. C. Dibie, and Mr. I. Ngobo, Service Officer, Mr. Sibande, Information Officer, Mr. Butelezi, Public Participation Officer, and Mr. Mukoka, Communications Officer, and Hansard Staff, Mr. M. Makwela. On adoption, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, in accordance with Rule 117, Section 2, Subsection C, read with the Rule 164, the Health Portfolio Committee recommends that the annual oversight report on the Department of Health in Gauteng for the 2019-2020 financial year be adopted by this August House, taking into account committee's concerns and the proposed recommendations made in this report. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. You're on mute. Unmute, Deputy thank Speaker. You, thank you, Honorable Member. Is there a seconder? I ask to second Acting Speaker. Thank you, Honorable uh, Bloom. I now put a question to the House. All those in favor must say yes. All yes. those that are not in favor must say no. Yes. Yes. Thank you. The yes have there it. Secretary, the report is adopted. Thank you, Secretary. Can we move on to the next order? Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Debate on the annual report of the Department of Social Development for the 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Makakula. Honorable Makakula. Thank you, Deputy, Adam, Deputy Speaker. Um, Deputy Speaker, Honorable Crimen Absentia, Honorable MSCs present, uh, Chief Whip of the Majority Party in Absentia, Honorable Members, Invited Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, today we debate the annual report of the Department of Social Development a year after the closing of the 2019-2020 financial year. This debate also takes place in the year of celebrating the life of Ume Charlotte McGregor. Mayor Charlotte McGregor was a religious, social, political, and academic activist who devoted her life to the struggle to fight for women's rights. Her life continues to be an inspiration to us and many other women around the world. Women like Ume Charlotte McGregor are a testimony of the role played by women in the development of society and that of women 
having always fought along with men and contributed a lot in fighting against infer inferiority laws that affected Africans in, uh, in particular. Madam Deputy Speaker, please allow me to borrow her words when she said, and I quote, the work is not for oneself, kill the spirit of self, and do not live above your people, but with them. If you rise above, take somebody with you, close quote. Deputy Speaker, in, in a time where our society is ravaged by COVID-19, when families are broken, children orphaned, parents bearing their children, and some families wiped out at, in a short space of time. Our society is calling for leaders like Mayor Charlotte McGregor's uh, caliber. What better way to honor Mayor Charlotte McGregor than being true to what she stood for? Protecting the rights of women, serving our people, and ensuring that we are with them, not above them or against them. A, a, a study done by University of Stellenbosch Law Clinic indicated that 30% of girl learners ensure their well-being. We still live in a patriarchal, patriarchal society where women are abused and still mistreated, not only because, not only behind closed doors, but also in boardrooms where their gender is used to oppress them and their skills not taken into consideration when decisions are made. The Department of Employment and Labor Employment Equity report of the 2019-2020 indicated that the percentage of males in top management positions is nearly three times than of females. This must change. We want to have a society where women will be judged based on merit and not on gender. Statistics South Africa indicates that as, as of 2018, 41.6% of households in South Africa were female-headed, uh, were female-headed, which amounted to about 6.1 million uh, population. Add to this the burden of COVID-19, which has dwindled our economy and left many families destitute. We can easily see the seriousness of the plight of women. We as the ANC believe that the department's interventions through these various programs can go a long way to ease the burden carried by women. We particularly note the Women Empowerment Program that provided different skills to allow women to access opportunities and improve their skills, especially child grant beneficiaries. When the late MEC Tulinka Binde Kawe, May Hesol Rasimkist, took over the hems of the Department of Social Development in 2019, she had a vision and she clearly understood the mandate of the department in, and its significant role in building our society. Her vision was to steer the department to a direction that would help alleviate poverty in Gauteng. She was a champion of the poor and committed herself to ensuring that no child ever goes to sleep hungry in the province of Gauteng. Admittedly, her untimely departure left a huge void which to a large extent knocked the department off balance. Madam Speaker, we would be the first to acknowledge that the department could have done better. <coughs> we note the unqualified audit outcome. We also note progress, particularly on youth employment and women empowerment. The work opportunities created for youth through the Youth Structures Program, EPWP and Job Center Program, and the skills development programs is a step in the right direction to benefiting the lives of young people, to bettering the lives of young people. The department did well in this regard. Madam Speaker, as we acknowledge some of the targets that the department had set for itself in 2019-20 financial year were not met, we have seen 
we have seen some improvements in the quarters that followed the end of the financial year. Distribution of school uniforms was prioritized and early childhood centers were paid as such they were able to sustain themselves during the COVID-19 pandemic difficult stages. This is evidence that the department took note of its weaknesses and is working on remedying them. As the ANC government, you want to carry the legacy of Mayor MEC Nkabinde Kawe by ensuring that her vision is realized. In honor of the late MEC and ensuring her continuity legacy, the ANC government launched the Tulinkabinde Kawe Marivale Agro Village at Marivale Military Base in Danota in November 2020. The Agro Village supports small scale farmers and women owned cooperatives at, at large. Our society is ravaged by drugs and alcohol abuse, and these have huge negative impact on the increase of crime in our communities. The ANC government has over the years paid attention in finding solutions to drug abuse through substance abuse, prevention and rehabilitation programs. We equally know that the elderly are among the vulnerable groups in the society. The interventions undertaken by the ANC government through the Department of Social Development, including the building of various centers in different regions, have made it possible for the elderly and people with disability to have access to services in their communities. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, we commit ourselves in guiding the department to better perform and to ensure that indeed no child goes to bed in an empty stomach in this, in this Gauteng province. As the ANC, we do support and appreciate the good work the department is doing. Asna Mona, Asna Nzondo, say to Missy ANC, I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Makakula. Uh, Honorable Nzege. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Understanding of this magnitude is a real disgrace for such an important department like social development. Let me show you a trend. 2020-21, 409.9 million underspent. 2018-2019, 419.1 million underspent. 2017-2018, 104 million. 2016-2017, 19 million underspent. This year, program one and two underspent by 17.3 million and 11.7 million respectively. The department failed to fill crucial posts. How can a department not f recruit social services professionals, social workers, psychologists, to name but a few? There is no will in this department because if there was a will, graduates would not be sitting at home unemployed while the department fails to fill vacant posts. Monitoring and evaluation vacancies make me believe there is another malicious reason for not filling these posts. Is it deliberate? Because if filled, they would expose the fact that the department is simply unable to comply and Houting is not getting value for money? Program three, the underspending is 182.1 million. Cooperatives were not appointed for school uniforms were not made. Imagine those poor learners who needed those uniforms. So poor children are subjected to going to school without uniform or with old tattered uniform, yet the department that is meant to assist them simply fails to not, by not spending the money. Program four, the underspending amounts to 48.9 million. Much needed Sidimeng and Ranfontein treatment centers were not completed. Whilst our communities are ravaged by drugs, two centers that were desperately needed by our communities were simply not completed. Program five, the underspending amounts to 141.7 million. Food parcels and dignity packs were not distributed. This, this department should truly hang itself in shame. 
People were struggling with hunger, hunger during the lockdown. Lists were submitted for many, many requests. There are people who applied in March 2020 and got nothing from the department. Girl learners were not accessing sanitary pads during the holidays. 401 million sent back to Treasury. With regards to risks and emerging risks, note page 158 of the department's own annual report. These risks, which have been, which, which have been my warning since 2014, have fallen on deaf ears. Insufficient social work staff ex to execute the department's mandate. The department has 5,408 filled posts and has filled 4,662, leaving 746 vacant positions. That's 14%. Non-compliance, particularly in state-run institutions specifically. Unsafe working conditions, outdated IT systems, foster care backlogs, inadequate monitoring and evaluation, lack of required management structures. This is in the annual report, this is not me. In closing, I wish to quote the Auditor General. Effective internal controls were not in place for approval and processing of payments as required by Treasury Regulation 8.1.1. The Auditor General further says the monitoring and evaluation unit was not adequately capacitated. I'm sure I've said that a lot in this house. Why is it important to have monitoring and evaluation? Let me explain. Maybe we are missing a gap here. To assess the performance of projects, institutions, and programs set up by governments and NGOs. Its goal is to improve current and future management of outputs, outcomes, and impact yet we have staff not filled in these departments where it is so key. The ANC-led Gauteng Social Development has no interest in these, and so vulnerable people of Gauteng under the ANC government, the struggle continues. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Nseche. Honorable Parenos. Honorable Parinos. That's all. Oh. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this department is critical in providing essential social development services for many of our people who come to this province to be closer to economic opportunities. With a budget allocation of over 5.4 billion, for the 2019-20 financial year, this department has proved once again that it's failing its mandate to change the lives of the vulnerable members of society, namely the elderly women, youth, children, and people living with disabilities who are, poor African, who are the poor African majority in this province. As a result of poor leadership, the department underspent the allocated budget by 401 Point nine million rent in the 2019-20 financial year. This under, spend, this under expenditure is drawn from and present across programs one to five, which is a clear indication of this department's failure in adequately spending the allocated budget because of an incompetent leadership. Considering that the department derives its core mandate from the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, Section 27, Point one subsection C of the Constitution, which provides for the rights of access to appropriate social assistance for those unable to support themselves in their dependence. Thus, continued and blatant disregard for social protection and necess necessary support during COVID-19 must be seen as a contempt for our fundamental human rights. In the 2019-20 financial year, 15 open tenders to the value of 193 million, oops, sorry, sorry, Chair, did not go right. Yeah, 193 million were awarded whilst the department experienced delays in the finalization of open tenders, delayed appointments of property auditors and the finalization of property audit reports. This is evidenced by the department's failure to properly plan, execute, and implement essential supply chain management policies and systems. 
understanding that Gauteng and compromises of the larger share of the South African population, but approximately over 14.7 million people, 25.5% living in the province, one would expect that the department understands that this translates to government services being in high demand as population numbers continue to increase. The department was the defendant in various lawsuits amounting to 68, 68 billion, 2019, 90, no, 68 million, 2019, 90, that resulted on over 80, Ah, you can laugh, you can laugh, you can laugh. You're only laughing at yourself because you know that those figures are the, the, the proper ah, figures. Wow. The result of over 80% of those matters not being determined and there being no provision by any liability that may result. Moreover, the accounting officer failed to exercise adequate oversight of compliance with applicable legislation. Speaker, this department has irregular expenditure amounting to 2.1 million fruitless and wasteful expenditure amounting to 3.4 million and fail to comply with accruals and payables amounting to 1.1 million. It has failed to even make payments for contingent liabilities amounting to 68,000, which had a negative impact on the budget and service delivery since these liabilities were not budgeted for. MEC, you must be made aware now and today that your department and your, your department's embarkment on an operation to search, trace, and place the homeless across the province during the COVID-19 lockdown failed dismally, resulting in over 200,000 people unable to access social protection and necessary support during the lockdown period. You can never be a homeless person in your own country of birth and origin. Majority of our people, black Africans, have been displaced and left to sleep in the streets under bridges begging for food because of the landlessness and the ANC-led government's lack of polit political will for economic freedom for all in our lifetime. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Badenos. Honorable Engelbrecht. My Speaker. Honorable Engelbrecht. Deputy Speaker, every child has the right to the best possible start in life, right? Is that what we truly believe, or is that just what this government says to the unsuspecting public? Deputy Speaker, nobody can argue against the true fact about the budget and the story of what this province has really done for our people. Program number three concerning children and families has underspent by 182.1 million. Looking at the provision of ECD, environment, Environmental Child Development Centers, 30% of this grant has not been spent. And let me tell you why. There was a reduction of spending on ECDs at municipalities. There were delays in the appointment of officials to administer the grant. Then there was a lack of officials to verify the ECD sites. And then in Tswane, three of the main offices were closed. ECDs were not registered due to this department not assisting them with the registration process. Added to the above, we have the Sharpeville ECD that five years later has still not been completed. When it comes to the maintenance grant, 11% of this budget has not been spent. And the excuse for non-performance is, wait for it, wait for it. The ECD centers needed more repairs than can be provided. So we don't spend it. Service providers. Banking details changed, and this department never updated it. The period between early childhood and nine years of age is considered the most important where skills and attitudes that lay the foundation for lifelong learning and problem solving are cultivated. If there is to be hope for this country, then we must identify and support children at risk at the early stages of their lives. 
This is where the values of respect, tolerance, and justice are imprinted into our psyche, making it possible for children to develop and fulfill their potential and reducing social problems later in life. It is our responsibility and duty to spend taxpayers' money wisely by giving our children the best possible start what has in life. Been in your psyche? Yet, the failure by this government to do this shows a complete lack of care for growing and developing our future leaders. We need a provincial government that cares about the future of this country, where the budget is spent wisely on empowering our children of tomorrow. We need a different provincial government. We need a DA government. You are failing in Deputy right. Speaker, Order. the Victim Empowerment Programme plays a crucial role in providing counselling and support services to those who are affected by various social and economic issues, including the LGBTQIA community. It is concerning that a department with allocated budget and resources continuously falls short in delivering this much-needed service. According to this report, only 146 out of 2,000 people uh, targeted uh, benefited from psychosocial support services. A dismal failure, while the com community continues to suffer violations and stigmatizations from their own families as well as their communities. Many are solely dependent on this program to help them cope with life challenges. Instead of underspending its budget, the department can use money more wisely by training health and social workers about transgender issues instead of further victimizing them. The department must prioritize meeting its targets and spend budgets meant for the LGBTQ uh, communities by giving them access to victim empowerment programs and continue building more inclusive South Africa. South Africa belongs to all who live in it. Let us promote and protect the rights of the LGBTQIA plus community. Thank you. Hold on. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable MEC, Mazupia. MEC? Yeah, um, switching the mic on. Um, Honorable Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, let me just... The department's re annual report should be understood in context of the COVID-19 pandemic that was declared by the World Health Organization in March 2020. In response to this COVID-19 pandemic, the President of the Republic of South Africa declared a national state of disaster. This declaration of the state of disaster necessitated the implementation of measures to mitigate the spread of the virus. Throughout this unprecedented period, we continued to deliver essential social development services. The department rose to the, um, to the occasion. The department commenced on an operation to search, trace, and place the homeless across the province to ensure their social protection. The adherence to safety compliance measures in responding to the pandemic resulted, resulted in limited contact with service recipients. Service providers unable to deliver on their targets on dignity packs and school uniforms, as well as closing of ECD centers. In particular response to what happened in Swane, Madam, I would refer you to your own the F um, coalition there, you know why the ECDs in Swane are in the situation that they're in. You changed, you changed all of the laws that were in place, you changed all the laws that were in place to support the ECDs. And as a result of that, oh yes, go and check them, go and check them, I will provide you with evidence, find it. If, if you're going to talk about honesty, you lead by example, start by doing that. This period of the lockdown had a serious impact on the department's ability to deliver. 
but we did the best that we could under the trying circumstances. Madam Deputy Speaker, the department delivers services from five regional offices with service points across the province and 13 state-run institutions. The institutions are categorized as follows. Five places of safety for children, two children's homes, two schools of industry, one in one inpatient treatment center, one residential facility for older persons, two residential facilities for persons with disabilities, two secure cent um, care centers. I think what we need to um, take note, note of is the point that was raised by Honorable Diakar, I hope I pronounced your surname properly, Honorable Member, that we need to pay more attention to um, the transgender community, and there is a plan for, for that in this um, current financial, the new financial year. In pursuing the vision of a caring and self-reliant society, we have partnered with non-profit organizations, other departments, municipalities, the private sector, and civil society. Partnerships with NPOs remain an integral part of service delivery, in line with the mandate of the department. In all our endeavors, we do not function in isolation and maintain a close relationship with stakeholders, particularly the NPO sector. Our milestones in the Department of Social Development are found in early childhood development and protection. The protection of older persons and persons with disabilities, combating substance abuse, crime prevention, and victim support. Of course, the department experienced some challenges. However, these were tackled through combined efforts with our stakeholders. Our partnerships with cooperatives yielded positive results in communities. Women are becoming empowered through economic activities such as manufacturing toilet paper and packaging um, dignity packs. During the 2019-2020 financial year, the department empowered 230 cooperatives. We managed to pay 98.96% of suppliers within 30 days. We also contributed to the empowerment of the most vulnerable and marginalized in society through procurement that supports the promotion of gender parity. Youth development and initiatives by persons with, dis with disabilities were also um, supported. We made a positive contribution in our communities through our welfare to work program. Even though we have committed to, to wage a war on poverty and managed to reach 3,000, uh, just over 317,000 beneficiaries through our food security program, we we do need to put in place programs that will yield more sustainable, transformative solutions. To reduce dependency on social grants, we are empowering child support recipients through the Welfare to Work program, the EPWP, and the Development Center program. The Welfare to Work program contributes to the achievement of the Gauteng Tsepo 1 million target, thereby contributing to improving the quality of life for young people. In the 2019-2020 financial year, the Welfare to Work program benefited 13,800 beneficiaries, while 54,841 people participated in income-generating programs. The empowerment of women remains an integral objective in realizing tra the transformation of our society. As social development, we play a critical role in ensuring our government achieves this. We established partnerships with various training institutions, development agencies, the private sector, and other government agencies to train women in skills such as financial management, marketing, business development, and procurement processes. We have made significant progress in our efforts to empower women in the province through ensuring their participation to various initiatives, while concurrently providing opportunities for them to build their competence and skills. Our victim empowerment program plays a critical role in our struggle to fully emancipate women. The scourge of gender-based violence and femicide is, ter is tearing our communities apart. It's destroying the family structure and perpetuating the abnormality of child-headed households. That is why our victim empowerment program is very crucial. As the Department of Social Development, we have provided supportive services to in individuals affected by domestic violence and abuse of all forms and advocate for community efforts to end violence. Um, Deputy Speaker, in advancing, in advancing towards an accelerated social transformation, 
we have continued to invest in children through the Banapili program, contributing to their physical, nutritional, cognitive, and emotional growth. Ma'am, you and, are muted. And we remain committed to expanding access to all children eligible for ECB services. Honorable members, this crisis of substance abuse needs our rigorous attention. The youth and school children are faced with this hear. monster and all, of, and, and all efforts are required no, to, to defeat this demon. Um, Deputy In partnership you are with muted. Soul we City, cannot hear you. we managed to wage a vigorous campaign against substance abuse in communities and will continue to intensify efforts to, uh, to combat okay. the abuse of alcohol and drugs. Partnerships with the Gauteng Liquor Board, a provincial government entity and other relevant industries and societal um, stakeholders to promote responsible drinking are critical in this regard. Care and support services for older persons remain a focus, of, a focus area of intervention when, with emphasis on community-based services to protect and promote the rights of elderly persons. The provision of community-based social infrastructure for elderly persons has contributed immensely to reduce incidents of abuse and, and neglect for the elderly. We are also entrusted with the responsibility on ensuring that, of ensuring that the constitutional rights of persons with disability are provided for. As the department, we continue to enhance their independence and advance their integration into mainstream society through provisions of, re of residential care and assisted living services. We, al we also ensured we prioritize services to children with disability. This is an area of great priority for us as provincial government, as, as can be seen by initiatives such as preferential procurement for persons with disability and even in our application of employment equity, where we look to set aside employment opportunities for persons with disability. We are a progressive government of, level, of revolutionary Democrats that practices what it preaches in terms of empowerment and mainstreaming of those who are most vulnerable and marginalized in society. We continue to contribute positively to keeping the sketch of HIV and AIDS. During the 2019-2020 financial year, a comprehensive package of essential services that included nutritional support, counseling, skills development, home and school visits, psychosocial support, educational support, medical support, food supplements, and referrals were provided to 41,592 vulnerable households, not individual persons. Though we made inroads in servicing our communities, we were, we were met with some challenges that hindered our services. These are areas that we are working on as a department in partnership with our stakeholders. We, we insourced certain services that were previously outsourced to service providers with a fin financial implication of insourcing a total of 1,304 non-core staff um, being um, 151 million cost. The department had a shortfall of 43 million in this regard. Insourcing services unfortunately affected the targeted performance of the department on the empowerment of cooperatives that were used for laundry, cleaning, and gardening. So before I close, um, Honorable Deputy Speaker, I think I need to reiterate what Honorable Magagula spoke to in regards to the vision of um, the former MEC um, Nkabim Dekawe and the vision that she had. Um, we, 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 we have committed ourselves to all the two, um, should I call it, the, the two services that were put in place by the Premier to honor to honor her and may her soul rest in peace. But we are also continuing um, around the, the developmental agenda that she set for the Honorable department. MC, Saima. Uh, oh, oh, thank you, you very much. Well. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, MC. Oh, um, uh, the next order, please. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Consideration of the Social Development Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the annual report of the Department of Social Development for the 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Egan. Oh, my. Thank you. Very few people have I ever come across that don't smoke. Thank you, uh, Honourable Deputy Speaker. 
Deputy Speaker, I would request that the House, ta uh, the House take other parts of the report as contained, uh, as read. Um, Madam Speaker, I, the Chairperson of uh, Portfolio Committee on Social Development, here by tables the Committee Oversight Report on the Annual Performance Report of the Department of Social Development for the 2019-20 financial year as follows. The department has been allocated an amount of 5,442,951,000 and spent 5,041,000,000, which represents 93% of the allocated budget by the end of the year under review. On program one, which is administration, the department spent 98% of the allocated budget. On program two, social welfare services, the department spent 99%. On program three, children and families, they spent 92%. And on program four, restorative services, they spent 93%. And program five, which is development and research, they spent 80% of the allocated budget by the end of the year under review. The committee noted with concern that the department has underspent by 401,949. According to the department, the underspending of 17,323,000 under program one was due to delays in the filling of vacant posts and the implementation of the subsystem upgrade. On program two, the underspending of 11,724,000 was due to delays in the filling of vacant posts and unspent funds on outsourced services. On program three, the underspending of 182.1 million was due to delays in finalization of supply chain management to appoint cooperatives who will manufacture school uniform. And then on program four, the underspending of um, 48 million 978 uh, is due to the allocation for the CDBN and the Ranfontein treatment centers, which were not spent uh, by the end of the year under review. While on program five, the underspending amounts to 141,782,000. And it's attributed to unspent funds for food parcels and dignity packs and the allocation of budget to NPOs. The committee acknowledged that during the year under review, 120,692 children were reached through ECD partial care sites, while 1,220 were also registered and 17 non-care based sites were established and funded and equally provided services to 1,050 children in Gauteng. The committee further acknowledged with appreciation that 40 social workers were trained on social work and graduated in June 2019, and they were empowered to render critical and integrated services in the school community. Uh, however, the portfolio committee raised some concerns, and these are uh, the department, uh, the concern uh, relates to the department having uh, underspent across all programs with a total of 401,949,000. And the bulk of it comes from the school uniform project, the dignity packs, and the filling of critical vacant posts. On the proposed recommendations, the portfolio uh, committee recommends as follows, that the department should provide the progress report on the filling of key vacant posts, especially those that are located within the monitoring and evaluation of the NPOs. And the report should be submitted by the 30th of April, 2021. The department should also provide the progress report on the distribution of dignity packs and school uniforms. The report should be submitted by the 30th of April, 2021. And on acknowledgements, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, I would like to thank the MSC, the MSC for Social Development, Honorable Murakani Musupie, the HOD and other officials in the department for their cooperation. I would also like to express my appreciation to members of the committee, uh, Member Tima Gagula, Aaron Seke, Ayn Rovana, D. Adams, D. Lidwaba, B. Engelbrecht, M. Mofama, and B. Badenhorst for their commitment to the oversight process. 
I commend them for their diligence during a deliberations on this annual report. And the committee would also like to thank officials that support the committee, uh, S. Nwala, Z. Pansambalo, S. Menueli, N. Gigolo, J. Muloy, T. Tinzuke, D. Nguenya, N. Ntlebi, K. Kulu, and uh, M. Makwela for their dedication in assisting the committee to achieve its mandate. And Madam Deputy Speaker, after extensive deliberations, the Social Development Committee adopted the annual performance report of the Department of Social Development for the 2019-20 financial year. And in accordance with Rule 117, subsection 2C, read together with Rule 164, the Social Development Portfolio Committee tables the report to the House for consideration and adoption, taking into account the concerns and the proposed recommendations made in the report. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Is there a seconder? Deputy Speaker, I rise to second the report. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Nseke. Now I put the question to the House. All those in favor of the adoption? Yes. 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 Those who are not in favor? Thank you very much. The meeting is, uh, the report is adopted. Thank you. The yes have it. Thank you, Honorable Deputy. I make a short announcement before the next order. Uh, you are kindly requested, honorable members, to collect your phones. Those who have not collected their phones, to so please do that uh, swiftly uh, before the office staff knocks off. Please collect that at the public forum. Please go to the public forum to collect your phones, those who have not collected them. The staff will knock off. Uh, in fact, uh, they should have long knocked off. Thank you very much. Secretary, we can proceed to the next order. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. A debate on the annual report of the Department of Community Safety for the 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, Member Shackleton, apologies. Member Shackleton, is Member Shackleton in the house? Oh, but I'm trying to... I'm Deputy Speaker. Member Shackleton um, just excused himself to the um, bathroom a few minutes ago. Can I perhaps go first and then just give him a chance to, um, to return? Okay, Honourable Member, you can go ahead. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Um, the annual report for the Gauteng Department of Community Safety for the 2019-2020 financial year reads like a crime novel. The only problem is that the crimes described in it are not fictional, but reality. The department has failed to meet 56% of its targets with very little to no evidence available to back up some of the targets that they claim to have achieved. This annual report is written the same way as how the department operates. They are very quick to react when something goes wrong while they fail to plan and implement measures to curb such occurrences. In its annual report, the department claims that they wanted to create a safer environment with continued initiatives intended to heighten community participation in crime prevention. They claimed that the department relaunched the Take Charge campaign where they also asserted to have conducted Reclaiming the Night campaigns because women must feel safe to walk even at night. 
It is, however, a pity that when you look at the annual report, you realize that this is all talk but no action. As a gender-based violence, GBV crime prevention detection targets are some of the targets which they fail to meet. The explanation for this is even more shocking, as they state that since the victim could not identify perpetrator due to the influence of a date rape drug, these cases could not be solved. Madam Deputy Speaker, this brings about a further question as to why a victim needs to identify a perpetrator. If a rape test kit and a medical legal test could do that for us by means of DNA testing. Is this perhaps because there are not sufficient rape kits available? Or because the DNA testing are done too slow, up to the point where the test expires? We do not know the answers to these questions as there is no mention of any facts relating to this in the report. All we know is that the department failed to create a safe environment and could not proactively work towards curbing GBV at all as they did not meet their targets or implement their programs. The department has apparently succumbed to the DA's pressure by reviving six green doors across the corridors, corridors in Sharpville, Flakfontein, Dube, Itwatwa, Randfontein and Crystal Park to address immediate trauma containment for GBV victims while awaiting police response. However, we are concerned whether these green doors are adequately resourced and we will be conducting oversight inspections to assess the state of them. The department is also apparently assisting GBV victims with skills development. But Madam Deputy Speaker, while we are teaching skills to victims to cope with their emotions, the perpetrators are still freely roaming the streets. The scourge of GBV is on the rise and it's the department's responsibility to ensure that they protect the victims and support the survivors. There's a great need to review all current programs within the department, and it is time for the department to stop talking and do the actual work for the benefit of the residents of Gauteng. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Posh. Honorable Ratebe. Madam Deputy Speaker. Oh, you back? Okay. Huh? You're going to speak when it's... Okay. No, no, sorry. I was... I, I... It's fine. I got messages from people to speak. Sorry. You decided to go out. Sit down. Your time will come. Madam Deputy Speaker, the latest third quarter of 2020-21 uh, crime statistics are by far a clear demonstration that the Department of Community Safety is not doing well. How the murder has risen above the national average compared to the same period last year. 63 more people were killed in Gauteng between October to December 2020. This is a 7.5 increase and above the national increase of 6.6%. Rape and sexual, sexual assault increased by 4.6% attempted murder by 3.8%, robbery with <coughs> aggravating circumstance by 4.1%, and sexual offenses reporting increased by 6%. According to the same stats, there were 7,860 uh, 7, offenses related to domestic violence, 1,781 assault with a severe bodily harm and 138 rapes in the same period. <clears throat> the deterioration in crime prevention is a direct consequence of the state of the department itself. The lack of supply chain management, compliance evidence in irregular expenditure amounting to 79,238 and over 8, 8, thousand in fruitless and wasteful expenditure. The vacancy rate in the department is real concern, especially in supply chain. And direct consequence is the failure to pay suppliers within the prescribed 30 days and achieving a decimal 24% against the target, targeted 40%. It is therefore unsurprising that there is a general lack of compliance in relation to financial management and under expenditure of 7.8 million in funds tied up in the working capital debtors 
and 5.6 million under expenditure in relation to GFLEADS. Despite the recommendation by the Auditor General of South Africa, in terms of which area the department needs to improve, there seem to be no improvement in the insights. Based on the annual report, it is no wonder South Africa and Houghton residents baluze uktemba amapolisa. Take program there, for instance, a program whose <coughs> Take program three, for instance, a program whose sole purpose is to integrate and, uh, and coordinate traffic law enforcement to reduce pedestrian fatalities accounting for 49%. The department has not even met its own target under this program. All of these issues <coughs> permit into how law, how law enforcement function in the province from premature closure of docket investigating officers not complying with issued instruction, witness statement not being obtained, and many other issues that weaken the confidence of the communities. Uh, as a, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the increase in sexual, in se sexual assault and gender-based violence should be a priority for the Department of Community Safety, not only in terms of prevention, but also in terms of psychosocial and medical legal service for victims. The department must prioritize a victim center approach in the offenses, approach in these offenses. There is no reason why all police station in Gauteng can have a competent domestic and sexual violence subdivision in very station particularly tasked with such crime and afford, uh, affording victims a victim center just this is sensitive to victims when they seek or report such crime. Finally, the, uh, finally, the department must, as a matter of agents, prioritize digitalizing the work done in police stations. It is a shame that almost all police stations still use paper to write witness statement, affidavits, and dockets are stored manually, hence they get m missing and, and the confidence in the law enforcement diminishes. Digital docket will ensure that evidence such as witness statement, fingerprint are stored digitally and become a lot easier for law enforcement uh, in the province. Madam Deputy Speaker, EFF, Community safety. Hi, to Sibatu, Lisapsi, Joala Runa Retrobea, Obani, Emissi, Wabana, Mema Mazibuk, Haike Misasalo, Araba di Putosa Runa Catilla, Etranesi, Udi Araba Catilla, Hai Habat. And the higher amuya leya, obani runa relem khatwa economic freedom fight. Rungwe kesi chabasa Africa re retoba sebelet. I thank you. Man Africa ye ki madhata man my my sister. Thank you, thank you, Honourable Ratebe, Honourable Bosch. Sorry, Honourable Shackleton. Madam Deputy Speaker, the core mandate of the Karting Department of Community Safety is to ensure a safer environment for all Karting citizens through crime prevention and safety promotion initiatives. However, according to the department's 2019-20 annual report, the department failed to mobilize and partner with communities to raise awareness and fight crime in three municipalities, namely Chwane, Johannesburg, and Mudval. This is extremely concerning as the two big cities, Chwane and Johannesburg, are ranked amongst the top five most dangerous cities in the world as per Numbio's 2021 Crime Index. Furthermore, according to the 2020-2021 crime statistics, Chwane and Johannesburg police stations are dominating the top 30 in terms of serious community reported crimes per police station in the country. This clearly indicates that there is a greater need for this department to engage and partner with communities on crime and safety challenges 
especially in these cities, in order to contribute towards the solution of the challenges faced by these communities on a daily basis. Had the department engaged with the residents of Mamalodi, they would have been able to proactively assist the residents in tackling and ensuring the arrest of the Boko Haram gang that had been terrorizing residents. Had the DA not intervened, we would not have seen good progress from the SAPs with regards to tackling and arresting members of this gang. We will be closely monitoring the mitigating measures being put in place by the SAPs to address the Boko Haram gang, such as whether the Chwane District Intervention Plan for Mamalodi is going to yield any positive results. Madam Deputy Speaker, this department has also underspent by 13.4 million rand on traffic management. It is concerning that this program has been underspent while we do not have a 24-hour Gauteng traffic police service to monitor our freeways. This money could have been used for additional shifts to ensure the safety of motorists on our roads during the night, as the current service only has traffic police working until 10 p.m. For far too long, the DA has been calling for the Gauteng traffic police to, do, to be declared an essential service to ensure a 24-hour patrol on our roads. By so doing, it will reduce the excessive expenditure on overtime, improve the working conditions, and increase benefits for the traffic police. This will also have a positive impact on reducing crime and increasing road safety. The annual report further reveals that the department is the defendant in various lawsuits and labor disputes amounting to 93,499,000 rand. What is surprising is that the Auditor General states that the ultimate outcome of these matters cannot presently be determined, and no provision for any liability that may result has been made in the statements. The reasons as to why the department is having labor disputes and lawsuits are not stated, and the public deserves to know what is happening within the department. Furthermore, the AG states that there are movable, tangible assets of 3,335,000 rand that are under investigation, which include machinery and equipment that could not be located during the asset verification process. This clearly indicates a lack of adequate and regular monitoring of the department's asset register. Looking at the track record of this department, it has consistently failed to use its allocated budget wisely and to achieve its own targets for the benefit of the residents of Gauteng. Safety and security remains a big challenge for the people of this province, yet there is a department that has allocated millions and millions of rands to conduct oversight on police and to ensure the safety of our people. As the nation, we mourn the passing of Imtoko Zizi in Tumba, who was shot and killed in a crossfire, allegedly by the police, during a protest by a group of VIT students in the Bramfontein CVD over university fees. The police are supposed to protect and prevent crime, not to kill innocent people. This annual report presented by this department is a clear indication that this department is failing on its core mandate. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable uh, Gobas Hoffman. Geachte voorzitter, adjunct voorzitter, baie dankie. Ek denk is belangrik as ons kyk na die verslag wat die departement aanbied, dat daar gegewe is moendlik te veel probleme om op te noem. Ek denk dit is belangrik dat ons vir mekaar sê vandag dat Veiligheid in Gauteng ongelooflik onderdruk is en dat mense se levens in levensgevaar is. Hierdie gevaar, adjunct voorzitter, is as gevolg van onbevoegde en onopgeleide en ondertoegeriste politielede. Ons kan die voete of die blaam by die voete van, van die leiers of die generaals of die opdraggevende bestuurslede plaas. En is het belangrijk voor die, um, die LER om verantwoording te doen aan hierdie huis, om vir hulle te sê waarom is die oorsig of is al gebreek in oorsig. En wil ek graag noem dat ons die hele tijd praat oor um, die opleiding van politielede, maar toch sit ons met een onderspandering in fondse en kon hierdie fondse dan nou ons nou aangewend gewees het 
om dan nou hierdie tekorte of in opleiding dan nou aan te spreek. So adjank voorzitter, um, ons sien die verslag, daar is positieve goed in die verslag, maar opleiding en die ondersteuning van die SAVD in hulle gevecht teen misdaad, um, word ondermijn door die wanbesteding of die niespandering van fondse uh, door die departement. Ek dankie. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, Honorable Sox, so, so, can you do so, so, Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, let me just say that uh, I think that it's important that when we engage in debates, we engage on matters that we will all uh, at, are at par with. It is clear that some of the debates we'll have to verify later. I think the debates were focused on, on a different report. Some of the targets that are raised here being targets that have either been achieved or not achieved by the department, we don't remember seeing them in the, in the report, in the annual report, maybe in the third quarter report. But Chair, uh, can I just say, just say that from today until Friday, this August House will be seized with assessing the work of the African National Congress, led Gauteng Provincial Government and the Gauteng Provincial Legislature. This is based on the annual report of the legislature and the departments and entities of Gauteng Provincial Government. These reports are for the period of the 1st of April 2019 to the end of March last year, which is almost 12 months later. It is important to note that the period of these annual reports is the beginning of the sixth term of the ANC administration. What we are assessing, especially as we debate the annual report of the Department of Community Safety, is whether the ANC and the government it leads has started on the right footing to ensure the realization of community, which is and shall continue to feel safe. We shall be missing the point if we are not acknowledging that this is not a new beginning, but a continuity of the safety programs of the previous ANC administrations. This time, using the experience and foundation built by these previous administrations, we are set to pick up the baiting and hit the ground running, albeit with improved focus on achieving the goal. The report we are debating reflects this, de this, de this determination. Madam Speaker, the political program of the sixth ANC-led administration of Gauteng is directed by the Growing Gauteng Together 2030 strategy, known as GGT 2030. It is through this strategy that the ANC refocuses the implementation of the National Development Plan Vision 2020 in the province. The commitment of the ANC in the NTP and GGT 2030 is based on our convic conviction that our vision for a province and South Africa that is united, democratic, non-racial, non-sexist, and prosperous depends on us reducing unemployment, eradicating poverty, and closing the inequality gap. This is the vision that the people of the province have re-endorsed on the 8th of May 2019, which led to the ANC continuing to govern the Gauteng province. Like all developmental programs and strategies, the GGT 2030 and NTP Vision 2030 are dependent on and strive where two key areas are strengthened. These are an, ethic, an ethical government, which is on the side of the people, and also on focusing towards ensuring that there are safe conditions for communities to live, and, and for, the, for GGT 2030 and NTP Vision 2030 to strive. It is this understanding that has driven the ANC-led government of Gauteng to focus on building the capacity of Gauteng Department of Community Safety to ensure the effectiveness of its programs. Madam Speaker, one of the contributory factors in the success of GGT 2030 and NTP Vision 2030 is the ability for us to ensure the free movement of goods and people. The Gauteng Road Safety Strategy and the Department has proven to be resilient in this regard, in the midst of the huge influx of cars on the street in, the, in our roads in the province. The safety, and pedest the safety of pedestrians has been prioritized through road safety awareness programs which have been implemented by the Department. 
The improvement we need is to ensure effective coordination with the relevant departments in the province. These are like in departments like the Gauteng Department of Roads and Transport and with national and municipal traffic law enforcement agencies to ensure improvement in this regard. It will also assist the department to achieve its objectives of reduction of road fatalities, which member, member Hatebe referred to. Madam Speaker, three days before the end of the financial year under review, South Africa went on a lockdown to curb the spread of coronavirus and to build the capacity of the health system to cope with what would turn out to be a pandemic. It could thus be safely said that the reports of the financial year under review were not impacted by lockdown. In the case of Gauteng Community Safety and the various law enforcement agencies in the province, they were required to, active, to be active from these last days of the financial year. As it has happened in various fields, the period of lockdown taught us invaluable lessons related to how we undertake community safety. At this time, Operation Mulao, which had been initiated more than a year before, became very relevant to ensure compliance by citizens to the regulations. Improvements to community policing, which were at the conceptual stages, had to be accelerated. This in included the effective coordination of law enforcement agencies and changes in the way policing was done. Police found themselves being more effective when they were off their vehicles, walking on foot, mingling and interacting with communities. This is a lesson which the Provincial Police Commissioner Ntate Elias Mawela considered was more effective. Premier David Makura had instructed the MECs to be activists in their approach to their responsibilities by, by spending more time in communities than in offices. It is during this, the period of lockdown that the Department of Community Safety under the leadership of MEC Mazibugo was more visible and active in, among, in and amongst communities. Through this approach, it unearthed acts of illegalities taking place in communities. These included sales of illegal and expired goods, illegal manufacturing of goods and other goods which, when, uh, which are not, which, or which were not approved for consumption of, or were poisonous. <coughs> Madam Speaker, democracies fail in instances where they put participation of their citizens in the periphery. Over the years, the NC-led government prioritized working with the people to ensure that they govern. The foundation of community safety are the people. It is in this regard that efforts have been put to continue to build the capacity of community police forums to be the true representatives of the people in ensuring their safety. We still need to ensure that there is effective collaboration, cooperation, and support with CPFs by the members of the various law enforcement agencies. This relationship should be based on the understanding that CPFs, for them to be effective eyes of the people, they will have to be respected when playing their oversight role. The CPFs are being capacitated to strengthen this oversight role by the department. As we celebrate the year of Charlotte McClake, we are called upon to prioritize our fight against gender-based violence, femicide, and violence perpetrated against children. We must be determined to work for the realization of the vision of women and children walking and playing freely in the streets as envisaged in the NTP Vision 2030. We acknowledge that efforts are on track to build the economic empowerment and independence of women so, for their vulnerability, so that their vulnerability cannot be abused by, 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 by men. The Gauteng Department of Community Safety has always prioritized the safety of women through its various programs, including the establishment of structures like women as safety promoters. In the same breath, and as efforts to ensure the activism of men in this regard, the department has also established men as safety promoters. We need to accelerate our determination to see the safety of women and children by, amongst others, ensuring that our efforts in the Gauteng legislature like the men's forum led by Honorable Makubela, collaborate with the initiatives of the department and society in general. Madam Speaker, the national government has adopted the district development model to ensure focused and coordinated development with the emphasis of service delivery at the level where it matters most the municipalities. It is incumbent upon the Department of Community Safety to ensure that municipalities also prioritize coordination of local community safety initiatives for their respective citizens. Community safety forums are such vehicles. These are structures which must be coordinated by the political head of safety in municipality. 
included are relevant political heads of departments whose focus is the infrastructure like street lighting, maintenance of open spaces, etc., which contribute to conditions of safety at that level. It is at this level also that the various structures on safety which have communities as participants and other law enforcement agencies are involved. These community safety forums have the capacity to direct planning and budget of, of municipalities towards prioritizing community safety, which is one of the command, which is one of the mandates of local government. It is a pity that in, prov in providing support to community safety forums in the, in the period of the report, municipalities responded in the interest of their political parties rather than of their communities, especially in the city of Chuan. Is it Chuan or Chuan? Chuan. Member, 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 uh, is it Chuan or Chuan? Yeah. And therefore, the government of local unity in the city of Chobek. I'm stressing this, Honorable, Honorable Deputy Speaker, because <laughs> an insinuation has been made here that there's been work that has not been done with the city of, 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 of Twane and city of Chobek. What Member Shackleton didn't indicate is the fact that at that time of the report, the report, remember, it was for 2019, 2020. At that time of the report, who was governing those cities? They were against working together with, with the ANC in implementing those programs. Effective community safety can be realized when policing is focused on operating at local level and amongst communities. The decision by the Premier that there must be, award, there must be award based patrollers and the initiatives which were taken by the city of Chobek years ago on 10 plus approach to deployment of Metro Police will have to be revitalized for effective implementation if we were to ensure effective community safety. The Houghton Department of Community Safety must be commended for the effort it has put in coordination of the various law enforcement agencies. Working with the Houghton Provincial Police Commissioner, joint operations have been taken to support the various development corridors in their law enforcement initiatives. This continues to be more effective in supporting CDBank and Westland, which do not qualify to have Metro Police Department and the subsequent resources. One of the joint operations which continue to be effective in Operation Ukayomulao, besides its capacity to bring all relevant departments like Home Affairs, etc., it has also been successful in, arrest, in arresting of wanted suspects. The operation is always projected as provincial wherever, wherever the Premier and MEC join the operations. Whilst in actual fact, Operation Ukai Mulawe also happens on a continuous basis at various levels. The success of such operations do not lie on the number, on the number of arrests made, but on the success pro successful prosecution and ultimate conviction achieved. This has been the strong pillar of Operation Ukai Mulawe. Madam Speaker, it is said that Doug Armstrong is known for the Adage. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. This could be applicable to a variety of situations, including athletics and sports. Applying the same in the field of governance could be tantamount to, to betraying the very essence of government, which is to better the lives of the people. The insulated government believes that how we begin a new term must be about getting down to business on the first day and doing what we committed to voters in our election campaign. Through its annual report of 2019-2020 financial year, which we are debating today, the Houghton Department of Community Safety has demonstrated that by improving its performance and ensuring that it achieves a clean audit. The point that was not made earlier. The, positives, the positive beginning is a demonstration of the seriousness with which, with which the ANC-led government of Houghton understands the importance and strategies and the strategic role the safety, safety plays in the community or on people of the province. The achievement of the clean audit, Madam Speaker, by the Houghton Department of Community Safety in 2019-20 financially reflects three things. Firstly, it is an indication of the competence and professionalism demonstrated by the officials of the department. Their determination and ability to focus on eliminating all areas of deficiencies in the management and accountability of the department and set the department the path to prioritizing effective delivery of, of of service on areas of safety of the community of the province. This must be commended. Over years, we had called for the department to focus on building its capacity of its provincial secretariat, which had been underperforming for some time and affecting its audit outcomes. It is in its annual report, the department acknowledged that, I quote, provincial secretariat has spent 100% of its budget against the annual performance plans target under the sub-program community police relation. The program has overachieved on several indicators, especially on the promotion of safety, close quote. 
That's why I want, to, I want us to check some of, the, some of the figures we provided earlier. This achievement is attributed to the dedication of Mr. Tumsani Ngemi, who at the time was appointed as the, as the acting, as the acting uh, head of department. So in this case, may his soul rest in peace. The role played by our oversight committee in driving the department towards achieving the clean audit must also not be overlooked. In the period of the report, this house will remember that we were led by Honorable Mapiti David Matsena. His approach and innovation to oversight has refocused the committee to working to get the department to perform better. The audit accounts must also be in the honor of, Mr. Ma of, of Honorable Matsena. May his soul continue to rest in peace. Political leadership demonstrated by MEC Mazibugo to get the department to focus on improving its systems and management to achieve the main objective of ensuring prioritization of the safety of community of Gauteng is the other contributory factor to this audit result. It is, under, it is the understanding of all ANC employees that for the departmental, for the developmental state to succeed, we all need to ensure that in our areas of deployment, we prioritize serving the people, making their lives better. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Lissox. Uh, Honorable MEC Gamazibugo. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, let me acknowledge all the members of the House present uh, this afternoon. And let me also acknowledge uh, all stakeholders in the safety and security uh, arena. Uh, communities of Gauteng, ladies and gentlemen. Mbing elelin huyongana kanyena malunga wesham chetu. Isi zulu siya asho siti. Uma imoto imile izinja ziya ikamela. Uma ihamba ziya ikonkota. Siya zika jasi umnyangu wezo pepa umpagati lapi Gauteng. Uwe tula umbigo onyaga. Or Julia at 2019 2020. Setula Lombi Gong and Yang Ayogo Cooper, Nogukumbula Labo Abe, Lula Lapa in Sabin, Beluela Wutina Sonke, Singer Party Amapas. This is a Camego Senza Galang Yaga 1960. Forty Sipindes Cooper in Yanga, Jang and Yang Ayamalung Hello Abant. Naso Sonke Scatti Masina Cosra e Casa, Ella Bandra, his Kakaizum Zavalazo, Belela Malungelo Etu. Jenga bantu futi belola na malunga le lao esina ona mshaje. Honorable Deputy Speaker, we are extremely aware about the challenges that our people face here in Gauteng. It is our assertion that for as long as women and children cannot walk the streets freely without fear of being raped and murdered. We cannot fully claim that their rights as enshrined in the Constitution are protected. It is against this backdrop that we have set out the following departmental priorities during this term of office in our relentless, relentless effort to create a safe, secure, and prosperous Gauteng city region. Number one, we have committed that we will make sure that there's adequate training of police officers. Number two, that there will be increased police visibility. Number three, strengthening of community police forums and community safety forums. Number four, targeting gang violence and drugs. Lastly, implementing the National Plan of Action to address issues of gender-based violence in the province. Madam Deputy Speaker, the annual report reflects our commitment to, vigorous, to vigorously pursue our constitutional mandate of playing an oversight role over the work of the law enforcement agencies in the province. We continue to monitor the performance at police stations and we have six Gauteng information and police performance systems, which is known as Jeep sessions, where 40 priority police stations were under our radar. These are police stations that are, are, are contributing highly to crime in our province. The annual report also reflects our efforts to fight the sketch of gender-based violence and femicide. That continues to rear its ugly head amongst our communities. As part of our commitment to eradicate gender-based violence and femicide, 
The department has handed over 11 motor vehicles for the prioritized victim empowerment centers during the month of December in 2020, during the 16 days of, of no violence against women and children. In addition, the Gauteng Provincial Government has launched the Gender-Based Violence Brigade Program under review. Theirs is to help facilitate and strengthen and give support to survivors of gender-based violence. Gender-based violence and femicide remains a challenge for the province and the country at large. And it, it is for that reason that more support services were provided to the survivors and the victims. And a total of 1,693 closed dockets were analyzed and they were resent back for them to be prosecuted. This is 193 more than the set annual target of 1,500. GPVF occurred in all the sectors of our society, and as such, we are intensifying our efforts, even at institutions of higher learning. We intensified our efforts to ensure a safer environment for Gauteng citizens, and also ensure that internal controls and governance in general improved. We continued with initiatives intended to heighten community participation in crime prevention. To this end, we have managed to relaunch the Take Charge campaign, and we also conducted many campaigns in ensuring that our communities are able to walk freely at night, including environmental design, because if communities are very dark at night, there are no street lights, then our communities do not feel safe to walk even at night. Importantly, to ensure that our crime prevention and safety promotion initiatives are relevant and grounded on actual data, we conducted safety summits in all the corridors. These summits provided a platform for communities to engage on safety challenges and contributed towards the solution to these challenges. Acknowledging the increase in violent incidences at school, more initiatives were undertaken in the school safety program, resulting in the department exceeding its target. Whilst we endeavor to reach all schools in the province, efforts were more biased towards the problematic schools. A total of 794 of these school interventions were conducted, which is almost 219 more than the set target of 575. In the Correctional Services Program, 433 schools participated, which is, more than 600, which, which is 63 more than the set target. Through the Youth Desk, we continue to mobilize young people to become active participants in the fight against drug abuse, gender-based violence, and thus becoming a force to ensure crime prevention. Honorable members, fatalities on our roads is a major concern to law enforcement authorities, and this therefore calls for the continued strengthening of road safety education. A significant decrease was recorded with fatalities reduced by 5%. The department strives to embark on recruitment drive to ensure that the vacancy rate is below 10% threshold and more additional traffic officers have been recruited to ensure that our target of 400 is actually reached by 2022. Madam Deputy Speaker, we remain committed to serve with diligence the people of Gauté. I'm thrilled by the sound financial performance of the department. The department spent 98% of its appropriated budget in the 2019-2020 financial year, and the department also achieved its target and further received a clean audit, which is a significant improvement compared to the previous year's audit outcome. I'm further, pleased. I'm further pleased to announce that we remain committed to empower the previously disadvantaged communities. On our township spending, the department realized 56%, which is 16% more than the set target of 40%. Furthermore, about 115% of estimated value revenue sorry, was collected, which is partly because of deployment of mobile ARTO buses. The department has planned to collect 35.8 million in the 2019-2020 financial year and a 4% projected increase from, from the prior year. The actual collection was 41.3 million as opposed to 43.2 million in the prior year, representing a 4% decrease in revenue collection. This is attributable to potential revenue related to Sunral also tied in receivables. However, overall, the department overcollected by 16% as a result of strategic interventions and internal measures put in place to improve revenue collection. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker and Honorable Members, we owe it to the people of Gauteng 
to ensure that they see real tangible in our effort to create a safe and secure environment in the province. Good governance and adequate financial accounting remains non-negotiable in this time of our democracy, and the fight against crime requires an integrated approach from both government and our communities. It is thus our commitment to continue to engage and work with everyone who has an interest in safety of the province. I will continuously remind the members of this House the mandate of this department. It is taken from the Constitution, Section 206, Subsection 3, which clearly stipulates the role of the department. A, to monitor police conduct. B, to oversee the effectiveness and efficiency of police service. C, to promote good relations between the police and the community. D, to assess the effectiveness of visible policy. E, to liaise with the cabinet member responsible for, cri for, for crime in order to make Gauteng to be a better place. Let me take this opportunity to thank Honorable Premier and members of the Executive Council for their unwavering support and members and leadership, the, the portfolio committee for their oversight role they carried out with excellence to all our stakeholders, the management of the department, and all the communities at large. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, MEC. Moving on, uh, Secretary, please take us to the next order. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Consideration of the Community Safety Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the Annual Report of the Department of Community Safety uh, for the 2019-2020 financial year. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Aid Zafani. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Let me request the House that the part of the report which I'm not going to read be considered as being read. The chairperson of the co committee, Safety Portfolio Committee, Honorable Alfina Andravana, tables the committee oversight report on the 2019-20 annual report of the Department of Community Safety as follows. The committee assessed the performance of the department to establish the level of implementation of its priorities. The assessment was also aimed at assessing the level of effectiveness in delivering services which were intended to achieve a reduction in crime in the period under review. Moreover, the department's financial performance was assessed to determine its expenditure trend and the level of compliance with Treasury regulation and other financial management legislation. The committee commends the department in obtaining an unqualified audit opinion on its financial performance. The department achieved 84% of the 69 targets which were planned for the financial year. A total of 764.6 million was spent out of the budget appropriation of 778 million, which was allocated for the fiscal year under review. The overall annual expenditure of the department allocation was, 98, was at 98%. The budget expenditure per program was as follows. Program one, administration spent 100% of its total allocation of 150.9 million. Program two, provincial secretariat, spent 153.3 million out of, sorry, spent 155.3 million out of the total allocation of 155.4 million, which represent 99.98 expenditure. And program three, traffic management, spent 458.4 million of the allocation budget of 471.8 million, representing 97 percent expenditure. The committee noted that the department continued to monitor and assess the, pe the performance of the law enforcement agency. The department reported that numerous oversight visits were conducted at 142 police stations. The visits were aimed at monitoring service delivery, assessment on resourcing on, 
of police station and customer care. The committee's concern about the under-resourcing of police station, which affect policing efforts and the realization of the 50% target in crime reduction. The committee is concerned by the increase in the number of gender-based violence and femicide incidents, which were recorded during the period under review. The committee welcome, welcomes the various subs operation Okai Malau, which were conducted throughout the financial year under review, which were reported to have yielded positive results in crime preve prevention. Furthermore, the committee noted that several raids were conducted to address the prevalence of illegal mining. The department needs to deepen its intervention measures to ensure that illegal mining is eradicated. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, findings and concerns and recommendation of the committee. The committee finding, committee raised concern in relation to the following. The under-resourcing of police station which adversely affect police, pol policing efforts in crime reduction, the increase in gender-based violence and low conviction rate on, on these cases, the lack of adequate office space and furniture for victim-friendly rooms at some police stations such as Rotunda, Valmarin, and Brongor Spray, the increasing act of violence behavior in school, that the establishment of community safety forum remain challenge in some of the municipalities, that not all CPF had review and aligned their mandate with the key priorities of the current administration, that the higher number of the road crashes and fatalities. Committee recommendations. The department must report on the findings of the police station profile. It had conducted an intervention to improve under-resourcing of police in ensuring effective policing towards the achievement of the 50% target on the crime reduction. Num recommendation number two, the department must intensify its intervention measures to deepen support for victims of gender-based violence with the intention to improve the conviction rate and achieve, achieve justice for gender-based gender -based violence survivors. Recommendation number three, the department must make the necessary intervention to ensure that all police stations are located suitable office space for their victim empowerment centers, particularly Rotunda, Valmarin, and Bronger Spade Police Station by the end of April 2021. Recommendation number four, the department jointly with the relevant role players must investigate the possibility of increasing capacity in the implementation of the intervention measure aimed to prevent violent behavior in school to create safer learning environment in schools. Recommendation number five, the department must provide a status report on the rem remainder of the CPF that had not reviewed their mandate by the end of the financial year under review. Recommendation number six, the department must engage with the relevant authorities to ensure that the establishment of the community safety forums achieve in all achieve in all the municipality to achieve a better and improved service delivery to communities. Recommendation number seven, the department must deepen the efforts towards a more collaboration approach with municipalities and implement stricter measures to improve safety roads. Additionally, the department must submit a budget estimates of how much it will cost the department to, de to deploy traffic officers on a 24-hour basis. The department must submit a progress report on all the above state, stated recommendation by the 31st of May, 2021. On acknowledgement, I wish to thank the Honorable MEC of Community Safety, Honorable Faith Maz Mazibugo, Acting HOD, Mr. Sipo Tenjagwayo, and their team for their cooperation during the committee assessment of the department annual report of the 2019-2020 financial year. 
I further wish to thank the members of the committee, Honorable N. Sagaza Manamela, Honorable S. Nkosi Malobani, Honorable S. Kanyile, Honorable M. Shackleton, Honorable C. Bosch, Honorable N. Khadebe, and Honorable J. Hoffman for their inver invaluable contribution and ensuring vigorous oversight on the performance of the Department of Community Safety, ensuring that safer communities are achieved. My sincere gratitude to the Houghton Subs Provincial Commissioner, Le Lieutenant General Mawela and his senior management team for their cooperation during the consideration of the 2019-2020 annual report of the Houghton Subs. Moreover, thank you to the following support staff of the legislature, group committee coordinator Zoziwe, Pantua Mbalo, Senior Researcher, Sakina Nenule, Committee Researcher, Pabalo Malisebanda, Committee, committee Coordinator, Tabile, Malumani Committee Administrator, Tabise Mufukeng, Communication Officer, Tebe Kumalo, Hansat Recorder, Sylvester Baloy, Services Officer, Ms. Fezeka Royo, Information Officer, Ms. Azindueni, Azindueni, Nichivuo, and all support staff for the assistance given in the consideration of this report. On adoption, in, a, in, in accordance with Rule 117, subsection 2C, read together with Rule 164 of the GPL standing rules, the Portfolio Committee on Community Safety hereby tables this oversight report on the 2019-20 annual report of the Department of Community Safety to the House for adoption, taking into consideration the concern and the proposed recommendation made in this report. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Much thanks, Honorable Ndrovana. Uh, do we have a seconder for the adoption? I move for the adoption second. of the report. Oh, I second the, the, the adoption of the report. <laughs> Much thanks to Kanile to put the question to the House. All those in favor should say yes. 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 Those who are not in favor should say no. Thank you very much. The yes have it. The, the report is adopted. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues and honorable members. Secretary, the next order, please. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Public Accounts Standing Committee report on the annual report, including the Auditor General report on the financial statement and performance information of the following social transformation cluster report, Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Department of Human Settlement, Houting Housing Fund, Houting Partnership Fund, Department of Health, Medical Supplier Depot, Department of Social Development, Department of Community Safety for the, for the year ended 31st of March 2020. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Kanyile, take us through. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair of Committees. I <coughs> uh, Kaile Kanyile, the Chairperson of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, tabled the committee's oversight reports on the report of the Auditor General of South Africa on the annual financial statements of the departments as, as indicated and the entities for the end of 31 March 2020. Just chair, because there are a lot of reports, I won't read all of them, but I just, I just want to bring the following summary. I table these re reports collectively and thus request that their contents be taken as read. I, however, like to highlight the following with regard to these reports. Uh, it's important to know that cooperative governance has retained the clean audit. Uh, Department of Community Safety has improved to a clean audit. Department of Health has received an unqualified audit, uh, which there were some improvements as indicated by the Auditor General, but it has retained uh, the unqualified audit. 
medical last supply depot has a is unqualified audit with findings, Department of Social Development unqualified with findings, the Housing Partnership Fund unqualified findings and it's a regression. The main issues they were around procurement and contract management and irregular expenditure. Department of Human Settlement uh, qualified, which is an improvement from the previous year from disclaimer. Houghton Housing Fund has received a disclaimer. And it's important to know that it is in the process of winding up. The MEC has indicated that this process might be completed by the end of the 2022 financial year. Also, it's important to note, Chair, that the, some of the departments that are tabling today, Human Settlement and Health, were audited under the amended Public Audit Act, which emphasizes uh, focusing on material irregularity. Material regularity is, an, is any non-compliance with or contravention of legislation, fraud, theft, or a breach of a fiduciary duty identified during an audit performance under this act and, the, and under the act, Public Audit Act that result in or is likely to result in a material financial loss, the misuse or loss of a material public resource, or substantial harm to a public sector institution or the general public. Uh, the, the, also, it's important to indicate, Chair, that uh, the, there's an approach that has been taken by the Gauteng Department of Health when it comes to litigations or lawsuits, uh, where they've, they've established a system where they engage instead of sometimes taking the patients or, or, or you know, some of the patients to private institutions, then they bring them, help them, uh, what, assist them in their, own, in their own space. That some of the things that creative ways in which we, we, are, we are recommending that departments must look at in trying to reduce uh, lawsuits and litigations. We can't, we can't, there are departments that cannot prevent them. Community safety can't, uh, but they can reduce. That's what we're trying to push for change. One of the, the other point I want to raise is about the reporting period. Uh, you'll remember that the National Treasury gave a two months extension of all PFMA ODTs to submit their annual financial statements for the 2019-20 audit. This resulted in the delays by two months in the finalization of the audit of AXA and the subsequent submission of this report to the Houghton Provincial Legislature. That's why we're debating them today instead of last year. Our concern really is that uh, this, this has an impact in the recommendations that we have made and therefore we're proposing that there is a need, we'll see in our proposals generally, we're proposing that they must submit their, their audit action plans and that some of the recommendations that we have there are going to, uh, we are saying that they must be able to, to, to report even on what, how the implication of those recommendations in the current financial year. The last point I want to raise, Chair, in this regard is about the partnership fund recommendation. I'm trying to look for the rule the report on the partnership fund uh, recommendation 7.9, we request that it be revised. I'm trying to look for the rule, maybe the house, the table can help me, the rule where you, which you use to amend the, the, one the one resolution. Four. What is it? 1164. One one yes. One uh, one thank you very much, Honorable, uh, uh, Honorable Lutualo. Let that, that uh, we were asking that it reads, the entity, the entity that is, uh, 7.6, the entity must submit its audit action plan indicating each area of finding by the AXA in the 2019-20 financial year. Plans by the entity to address the areas of findings and the time frames for implementation. This must include a progress report of implementation as of 31st March 2021, which must be reported every court until 30 October 2021. Yeah, so I, the, uh, let me conclude, Chair, by indicating that um, we appreciate the the attendance of, I mean, the, the role that has been played by all the members, I won't mention them because of time, but also the role that is played by MEC Maile Mokheti Musupia and Mazibugo yeah, and their officials and the role that has been played by the chairpersons of various co the relevant committees, chairperson Dia, Lady Hamela, Kekan and Lovana. At the time it was uh, on a acting chair, Kosima Lobani. Uh, I also want to say, Chair, that uh, we assisted a lot by the office of the of the Auditor General in this process, but also the Office of the MEC for Finance, MEC Nkomo Ralehuko. We appreciate that. The staff of the, of the committee has been very helpful. In terms of the standing rule 1172C, read together with 164, the committee presents to this house the above mentioned reports for consideration and adoption. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much. Let me get a second to the report. Honorable uh, Kekana. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chair of Chess. I rise to second the report. Thank you very much. And now I put a question. All those in favor say yes. yes. And all those yes. who are not in favor say no. The yes have it. So we now adopt this report. Uh, Secretary, the next order. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs. Finance Portfolio Committee Oversight Report on the Principle of the Houghton Provincial Appropriation Bill G001 of 2021 for the year 2021-2022 financial year. Thank you. Uh, Honorable MPC. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chairperson of Committees. Uh, Chairperson, I take the areas that I'm not going to read that the House will take it as read. Chairperson, the Provincial Appropriation Bill provides for the appropriation of money from Provincial Revenue Fund for the requirement of the, pro of the province of Gauteng in respect of the financial year ending 31st March 2022. The Provincial Fiscal Framework, the total budget allocation for the, for the province is $142.5 billion. Uh, in 2021-22 financial year, which grows steady, in which grows steady to 148.9 billion in the outer year of the MTF. The portfolio committee urges the GPG departments to to be to continue supplementing its own revenue in the face of uh, of the declining uh, provincial allocation due to subdued economy. On the capital expenditure framework, the Portfolio Committee welcomes the infrastructure allocation in, in view of the President's uh, commitment uh, to a recovery plan that is based largely on using infrastructure as a catalyst. On the conditional grants chaired, the total amount allocated to, of, for conditional grants in 2021-22 financial year amounts to $24.9 billion and is expected to grow steadily to uh, 25.19 billion in 2022-23 financial year before picking up at uh, 25.5 billion in the outer year of the MTEF. On the budget allocations per vote, let's start with the Premier's Office, uh, Honorable De Deputy Chair. The total budget allocation for the Office of the Premier is 714 million for 2021 a 22 financial year. The vote two, which is the Gauteng Provincial Legislature, the Gauteng Provincial Legislature is allocated an amount of 791 million for the 2021 financial year. The allocation is, proje is projected to increase to 812 million and 828 million in the 2022-23 financial year and 2023-24 financial year respectively. Vote three, which is the Department of Economic Development. The, the department seeks to radically transform, modernize, and reindustrialize the economy in Gauteng, manifesting decent work, economic inclusion, and equity. The 2021-22 main budget amount is 1.561 billion. On vote four, which is the Department of Health Chair, the department received the bulk of the budget at 56.5 billion in the 2021-22 financial year and 169.6 billion over the over the 21 uh, 20, over the over the 2020 sorry 2021 MTF to fund provision for quality health service on education which is vote 5 uh, the total budget allo allocation for the 2021 financial year is amount to 53.4 billion. On the De Department of Social Development, for the 2021 MTEF, the total budget for the departments increases from 5.8 billion in the 2021-22 financial year to 5.9 uh, in the in billion in 2023-24 financial year. On human settlement vote eight chair, the Department of Human Settlement received a total allocation of 5.9 billion 
the roads and transport, uh, the department is allocated 8.6 billion in the 2021-22 financial year, which picks up at uh, 9.3 billion in 2023-24 uh, financial year. Department of Community Safety is allocated an amount of 962 million in the 2021 financial year, 22 financial year, increasing to 1.036 billion in the outer year. The Department of Agriculture and, uh, and Rural uh, Development, the Department of Agriculture received the total allocation of 1.016 billion in the 2021-22 in the, in the financial year. The Department of uh, Sports, Arts, Culture and Recreation, to ensure that the department achieves its mandate, a total budget of 1.066 billion is allocated for the 2021-22 financial year, and, then, and the amount increases to 1.062 a billion in the outer year. On vote 13, the, Depart the Department of E-Government the department's allocation for 2021-22 financial year amounts to 1.4 billion, which accumulates over the MGEF uh, to work towards uh, modernizing the provincial ICT infrastructure with connectivity and modernizing government services. The Gauteng Provincial Treasury is allocated an amount of 755 million for the financial year under review the allocation is projected to increase to 770 million in the next financial year. The allocation will further increase to 809 million in the outer year of the MTEF. On vote 15, which is the infrastru infrastructure development, the total budget allocation amounts to 3.2 billion for the 2021-22 financial year, and the budget allocation is projected to decrease uh, to 3.2 billion in the 2022-23 financial year and to uh, and 3.205 uh, billion in the 2023-24 financial year on the recommendations chair the gpt should continue to monitor to monitor value for money and cost containment uh, measures in all, in all expenditure incurred by the gp by the GPG departments, that the GPT should ensure that the GPG departments spend their allocation in line with, the, with their APPs. And notwithstanding the aforementioned recommendation, uh, Chair, the Portfolio Committee recommends that the departments be allowed to spend until such time that the budget is approved. On acknowledgement, I want to acknowledge the following, Chair, and extend our gratitude to Honorable MEC Nko Morale Hoko, the Acting Head of Department, Ms. Mr. Vilagazi, and officials of the Gauteng Provincial Treasury for their cooperation during this uh, consideration of the budget. On appre uh, appreciating the for diligent uh, dedication and commitment shown during the process of the Gauteng Provincial Appropriation Bill goes to all members of the Financial Portfolio Committee Honorable Malema, Honorable Dr. Paladi de Hamela, Honorable Macheke, Honorable Moriati, Honorable Randall, Honorable Dr. Masuku, Honorable uh, Mazui, and Honorable uh, Mukwebo. The committee's gratitude is extended to the following support staff, group committee coordinator, Mr. Budibe, senior committee coordinators, Mr. Nzane and Ms. Mojapilu, researchers, Mr. Tsetla and uh, Ms. Chilwani, legal advisor, Ms. Ngubani, a senior information officer, Mr. Nzibande, media officer, uh, Mr. Dikola, committee administrators, Ms. C. Dibier, and Mr. Um, Mabuza, service officer, uh, Ms. Arm Simanga, catering assistant, Ms. In Tene, and answered recorder, Ms. R. Singh. On the adoption, after due consideration for after due consideration, the, the Finance Portfolio Committee unanimously adopts the report on the principles of the Provincial Appropriation Bill G001-2021 in terms of Rule 1172C, read with Rule 164, the Finance Committee presents to the House and recommends 
the adoption of the committee's oversight report on the housing provincial appropriation bill E001-2021. I thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Let me get a second to the report. Yes. Chair, Hello. I second the report. Chair. Can I get the second? Yes, uh, Honorable Kamel. I stand to second the report, Chair, Deputy Chair of Chairs. Let me put a question. All those who are in favor say yes. yes. And those who are not in yes. favor say no. Yes. yes. So the yes have it. So the report is adopted by this House. That's Secretary. Secretary, can we move uh, to the next uh, item? Can you read uh, the next order? Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs. Petition Standing Committee Third Quarterly Performance Report for the 2020-2021 financial year. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Letualo. Uh, unmute, uh, Honorable Letsualo. Unmute. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Deputy Chair of Chairs. Well, uh, I have the esteemed pleasure as the chairperson of the Petition Standing Committee to table the third quarterly performance report for the 2020-2021 financial year as follows. But as to our constraints, I would like to request that part of the reports that I will not reach be considered as having been met. On introduction, political scientist uh, Professor Stephen Friedman in his 2018 book, Power in Action, contends that open code access to power determines how broad and a deep democracy is, close quote. The petition standing committee is such a conduit for the people of Houding offering itself as a platform for them to access power in the form of the executive and directly hold them accountable for state delivery shortcomings. Executive summary, Premier Honorable David Makura Primas this year saw our address on fraud authorities in lieu of COVID-19 pandemic. And two of these resonate with the work of uh, the petition standing committee. That is firstly, greater need to take care of the most vulnerable in our communities and secondly, improve governance across the health and security, because this will help me improve the quality of life of the people of the health. The first priority is to the heart of the work of the petitions committee, as the petitions process is a unique way for citizens to bring their concerns and service delivery issues to the attention of the responsible authority to obtain responses from them. This means that a petition can defend individual rights or interests challenge the legislature a matter of a general interest in its area of legislative competence, government uh, oversight. The more significant incentive of petitioning is the potential for the matter to be considered and have an opportunity for a response. The second priority also as articulated by Premier Makura is that one that speaks to uh, governance, which uh, in our sense uh, truly elates the petitions committee as from the third quarter, in that the Houghton Provincial Government, uh, in respect of uh, its departments now, report quarterly on their work on petitions to their respective portfolio committees. And this will indeed uh, aid the work of uh, the Petition Standing Committee through cross committee collaborations as portfolio committees play an oversight role on referred petitions. Petitions considered during the third quarter, uh, and there were seven newly adopted petitions during the third quarter, the issues were related mainly to housing, crime and service delivery. Because of challenges of the resources within the GPL committee, we only adjudicate 11 petitions during the quarter and review, and it adopted only seven. The petitions adopted during this period were referred to the relevant authorities for consideration and reporting. You will see that there's a body, there's a, there's a table in the body of the report which indicates that the authorities which were engaged per the adopted uh, petitions during the quarter under the petitions analysis through graphic presentation contained in the report as well. There is an illustration of the distribution of the seven petitions in accordance with the authorities to which the petitions were issued. The Department of Cogta and Human Settlement had the most the petitions. Most of the petitions had to do with the RTP misallocations. Unfortunately, during the first two quarters, COVID-19 regulations 
and part the committee's modus operandi of conducting uh, hearings, that is uh, both external as well as uh, internal hearings, which ordinarily yield positive results after the closure of a petition. But an internal hearing and an oversight visit were conducted during the third quarter, which bore positive results, but their success failed false within the fourth quarter uh, voting period. Committee activities, activities for the quarter will inform the committee's annual performance plan of the following committee meetings during the reporting period. The committee conducted virtual meetings which focused on tabling and adoption of reports and adoption of a new petition. Oversight visit, members of the committee conducted one side visit in Orlando East in front of hostel in the quarter under review. In the petition, the petitioners complained about the incomplete a project of housing units in Orlando Women's Hostel that started in 2016. This was a follow-up after the petition was discussed at the internal hearing held on the 12th of November 2020. During the visit, the committee asked several questions regarding the project and acknowledged that most of the challenges caused by poor planning uh, on the part of uh, uh, the department. Participants uh, agreed on the process that will be followed uh, moving forward. On public engagement activities during the period under review, two public engagements were held with petitioners and authorities. It was an internal hearing held on the 12th of November 2020, in which seven petitions were discussed. Out of the seven petitions, one was a close. The committee also held a feedback session in Orlando at Mzimsoto Hostel on the 8th of uh, December 2020. Evaluation on uh, responsiveness. Of the seven referred petitions, none of the responding authorities adhered to the 20-day turnaround time as per the Southern Petitions Regulations of 2016, nor the additional 10 days extension. Furthermore, there has been no report on either one of the referred petitions. This is of a grave concern as the petition standing committee relies on the responsiveness of departments and municipalities to what the closure of adopted and referred petitions. In trying to address uh, the non responsiveness thereof, starting from quarter three, GPG departments also report on referred petitions to their respective portfolio committees. They report on three uh, aspects. The first one, number of referred petitions during the quarter, number two, the number of two responses, and lastly, the number of petitions responded to during that respective quarter. Unfortunately, having gone through all the uh, quarterly reports, the departments uh, with referred petitions did not report on them. Some populated the section with petitions from previous quarters, whilst the reporting questionnaire categorically asked for them to report on petitions referred to them during the quarter under review. The committee finds that the lack of responses to petitions intolerably and unsatisfactorily undermines the important role of petitions and the legislature's accountability to the petitioners. Moreover, the committee hopes that the de departments follow the adopted reporting and templates and report accurately. Committee concerns. The committee noted that authorities do not meet the time frame set out on the referrals uh, in, and that uh, to get responses, the committee has to conduct hearings and meetings. Uh, the committee could not hold the hearings in which it exposed the non response from authorities and in turn help us uh, progress. Number two, departments reported inaccurately on their quarterly reports and thus portfolios and uh, committees will not be able to play oversight on referred petitions. Number three, the parliamentary licensing officers are quite crucial. Uh, have uh, come short in so far as a collection of uh, responses from uh, respective uh, units within their uh, department, and thus uh, their, their assistance uh, was not so much uh, satisfactory. Uh, on recommendation, in an effort to address uh, the non responsiveness by authorities to petitions, and based on the concerns raised above, the committee recommends that the Department of Culture and Human Settlement must develop a standardized reporting template that is aimed at strengthening collaboration and functionality of intergovernmental relations with uh, municipalities. Progress reports should be submitted to the committee by no later than the 31st of May 2021. Number two, the Department of Common Settlement should consider establishing regional service centers to deal with related issues. That's uh, those are supposed to the out the petitions that we receive. A report on the report on the matter should be submitted to the committee again. No later on the 31st of May 2021. And then lastly, the leader of the government business must uh, submit quarterly updates on oversight work with departments in respect of management of petitions and develop a petitions management system. An update on this matter should be submitted to the committee on a quarterly basis starting from the 31st of June 2021. So on acknowledgement 
I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the following committee members that they drove, that this demand, that they made that media, that they chavana, that they teach, memo farmer, that they tuaba. Well, we could ever thank the member of man, but unfortunately, he has not been in attendance of our meeting. So therefore, it would be a travesty to acknowledge. We further wish to acknowledge the contributions and support provided by the committee. Uh, by the good committee coordinator, Mevas, committee coordinator, Messi Banyone, committee administrator, and Fuku committee researcher, and the one petitions officers, delicate petitions administrators, Meshawala, and Meshawangu, legal advisors, uh, advocate, and Ramoho, and Megagana, data information officer, and the Delutual Ankara Report, and the Tulu, and service officer, Me Babaso. On adoption in accordance with the rule. 164 at 20 with 1164 and the petition standing committee hereby presents the report to the house for adoption and i think thank you very much uh, any second to the report uh, i second the report uh, the report is seconded let me now raise a question all those in favor say yes and those who are not in favor say no. The yes have it. The report for this standing committee is adopted by this house. Secretary, read the last but one item. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair of Chairs. Infrastructure Development Committee focus intervention study report on the provincial infrastructure development and municipal service for the enhanced project management of 2018-2019 financial year. Thank you. Uh, let me call upon Honorable Mudise. Thank you so much, Deputy Chair of Chairs. A request is made that parts of the report not read be considered as read. The focus will be on executive summary, committee findings, public involvement, committee concerns, and committee recommendations. On the executive summary, Deputy Chair of Chairs, focus intervention study emanated from the 2018-2019 financial year budget vote process. The Department of Infrastructure Development and Property Management, referred to as department, implements projects on behalf of its plan departments, namely Department of Education, Health, Sports, Arts and Culture, Roads and Transport, Agriculture and Rural Development. The purpose of this study was to engage the department and stakeholders on the method that may be applied to circumvent delays in the implementation of projects in all the Gauteng municipalities. The committee was of the view that municipalities were the main cause of the challenges experienced by the department. However, after engaging with the city of Johannesburg and Midvale municipalities and other stakeholders, the committee noted with concern that mainly the cause of delays in the, in the project was the Department of Infrastructure Development and Property Management by not following the national building standards when implementing these projects. On this focus intervention study, the committee focused on Noctula, Ellison, North Khesek Primary, Maibuya Primary, and Bantu Bonke Early Childhood Development Center. The committee will continuously conduct oversight to all other projects and monitor progress with the department. Noted with concern was the project's word handed over to the Department of Education without issuing the, the permanent occupational certificate. The affected projects were the Noctula Ellison and North Khesek Primary. Reasons provided by both the department and the city of Johannesburg was that the municipality could not issue the department permanent occupational certificate due to the fact that both schools were constructed in contravention to the national building regulations. However, the department has submitted all the documentation and currently awaiting approval by the city of Johannesburg municipality. Whilst noting the challenges, the committee noted and commended the department for completing the North Hesek primary within estimated time frame. The committee will continue to monitor progress in these schools. Maibuye Primary School project was noted with consent by committee since it has been unoccupied for the past three years. It was also alleged that the school was built on a waterlogged area and there was a sewer leak running from outside the facility through the school. The city of Johannesburg municipality reported to the committee that the occupation, occupancy certificate cannot be issued since the building plans were not submitted and approved by the department. It was also reported that the school was constructed in contravention of the National Building Regulations and Building Standard Act 103 of 1997 as amended. The committee concluded to evoke Committee Inquiries Act with a view to conduct an inquiry on the project. 
with regards to Bantu Bonke Early Childhood Development Center, the committee noted with concerns that the Department of Infrastructure Development started to build a development center without following section 7 subsection 6 in terms of national building regulations as confirmed by both the department and the municipal municipality the center was built on a land that belongs to the department of rural development and land reform which must be donated to the municipality and then to the Gauteng uh, department of infrastructure development however the committee noted and acknowledged that the department has submitted document documentation and waiting for approval of the transfer of the land. The committee will continuously be engaged, be engaging the department on the progress on the project. On the committee findings, the committee noted with concerns that although the Noctula, Ellison, North Hesek, and Maibuya schools were completed, permanent occupational certificates were not issued due to national building regulations standard not adhered to by the Department of Infrastructure Development and Property Management. It was alleged that the Maibuya was built on a waterlogged area it was further concerning to the committee that over six million was spent on the Bantu Bonke ECD center and yet nothing has been built on site. On public involvement, the committee meetings are open to the media and public where stakeholders are provided an opportunity to engage the department on its performance. During the process, stakeholders residing around projects that were visited form part of the committee engagement with the department. The committee concerns, the committee was concerned that Noctula Ellison School, as of 20 March 2020, the school was still operating on a temporary occupational certificate when the school was handed over to the Department on, of Education in 2017. There were infrastructure deficiencies which were caused by poor workmanship by the contractor. On North Hesek Primary School, as of 9 October 2020, the school was still operating on a temporary occupancy certificate, and yet the school was handed over in January 2020. On Maibuya Primary School, that the Maibuya Primary School had been unoccupied for the past three years. It is also alleged that the school was built on waterlogged Sorry. land. Bantu Bonke a Childhood Development Center, yeah, the Department of Infrastructure what's Development. What is her name? The petition, someone is disturbing me. Uh, you are protected, so, continue. Bantu Bonke Early Childhood Development, the yeah, Department the of Infrastructure. The Department of Infrastructure Development started to build a development center without following sub Section 7, Subsection 6 in terms of national building regulation. The project started during November 2018 and was stopped during March 2019, and yet the committee was not informed about the reasons why the project was stopped. Submission to date for the CLO positions was closed before the set closing date. Six million was spent on an empty land. Committee recommendations. The portfolio committee recommends the following and requests for the department to report by Friday, 9th April 2021, on one, measurements in place to ensure that the Noctula Ellison School permanent occupational certificate is issued without any further delays and progress thereof. Two, measures in ensuring that workmanship deficiencies at Noctula Ellison schools are adjusted. Three, measures in place to ensure that the North Hesek Primary School permanent occupational certificate is issued without any further delays and progress thereof. Four, measures ensuring that the Maibuya Primary School is occupied and progress thereof. Five, measures in ensuring that sewer leaks running from outside Maibuya School throughout the school is attended and to fix the cracking walls and sagging ceilings and tiles. Six measures in ensuring that Bantu Bonke project is completed without any further delays and the progress to be to date on the land donation. Seven, department should ensure that there is proper communication with communities when they implement projects. Eight, progress on the appointment of the Bantu Bonke ECD Center's CLO. Nine, detailed breakdown on the Bantu Bonke ECD budget spent to date and the anticipated overall budget upon completion of the project including anticipated completion date. 10, mechanisms that are going to be implemented to investigate negligent officials and a way forward in terms of above, the, above recommendations. In acknowledge, acknowledgement, the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Infrastructure Development and Property Management, uh, Member Honorable Mudise, would like to thank MEC, Motara, HOD, and the entire department executive for their efforts in consideration of this report. Further appreciates the diligent liberation of all members of the committee, including the committee support staff. In adoption, 
in accordance with Rule 165, the Infrastructure Development and Property Management Portfolio Committee chairperson hereby recommends that the report of the Houghton Department of Infrastructure Development first FIS report on the 2018-2019 financial year on the municipal services for enhanced project management be adopted by the House considering the committee concerns and proposed recommendation made in this report. I thank you, Deputy Chair of Chairs. Thank you. Do you have any seconda to the report? Any seconda to the report? Second, Chair. Member Zouvoy, second. Uh, Honorable Magagula. Okay, seconded. I'm now calling a question. All those in favor say yes. 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 And those yes. who are not in favor say no. So the yes have it. This report is adopted by this house. We have now concluded our business for the day. So the next sitting is this coming Thursday on the 25th of March, 2021. Uh, the house is now adjourned. Can you rise up so that we can really bow to the deputy chair? Uh, exactly.